on the vessels um, as Marines, as able-bodied seamen, ordinary seamen, uh, stewards, cooks, um, and so on. So filling a variety of roles. Um, and this is an opportunity to mention too that Native men, uh, the, maritime labor was very much uh, a meritocracy. So you could elevate yourself through hard work and skill. And we occasionally see uh, indigenous men um, climbing the ranks um, to mate, to captain, and occasionally ship owner. Um, and there's some very famous um, indigenous ship owners. Um, and I think this is an important part of the story that we don't often hear about. What we also are, are looking at is the increasing presence and the increasing community dynamic um, of indigenous men in this sort of port and maritime context. And along with that goes the increasing uh, depiction of disappearance. As Indian men are leaving the land, we start to have white overseers going to the reservations and making comments like, the only people here are old women, crippled men, and children. The young men go to sea and die, or all of the able and smart men are gone. And that gives us this sense that they're simply uh, not there. But if we think about these descriptions of elders and children, we have to understand that there's a generation that's simply missing. And if they're not at sea, uh, women are often on farms as um, domestics or servants of sorts. Um, and um, their, 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 um, their presence is becoming increasingly invisible um, if they're not on the reservations. Um, <clears throat> The customs houses across New England become important sites for documenting um, mariners and especially indigenous mariners. Um, and I'll just talk very briefly about a couple of um, documents here, the Seamen's Protection Certificates and Surrendered Crew Lists. Um, and this is where we begin to see a constellation of um, terms being applied to, racial terms being applied to people of color and Indians. Um, but we also get a sense of uh, community. Um, these men are going to the customs houses in groups um, um, from across the region. Let's see, I don't have that slide. Um, and they're getting on vessels and they're going um, out to sea um, together. And this is important because they're, they're forming new kinds of groups. In, in ways, they're extending the land to the sea. And then they're expanding those social networks to include people from all over the world. Um, you know, we have this, this classic um, description uh, of the street um, in Melville's Moby Dick. Um, but, you know, we can translate that to the local customs districts as well. And in every one of these ports, um, we have some of the most diverse places on the planet in the 19th century. Um, these people are interacting on vessels with these Indian men, but they're also staying here in many cases uh, and marrying into the indigenous communities. So we start to see um, new kinds of labels being applied to Indians, um, colored, yellow, uh, black, um, 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 dark, darkish, um, a range of labels being applied. Now, I, I, I can come back to that and talk a little bit about how, how these race labels um, begin to um, also erase indigenous presence because it is very deliberate. Um, the, the decoupling of Indian people from the, from the label Indian um, has deep political and legal resonance. Um, so I want to make sure that I come back to that. But for the purposes of this, we can begin to see um, where Native people are actually traveling beyond the ports um, and how their social world is expanding uh, well beyond um, um, these, you know, to some writers, they would call them children of the forest, these remote places on reservations. Um, in fact, Indian people are some of the most cosmopolitan people um, in the world when we look at where they've been and what they're doing. Um, and we have here an example, just one example um, from the New London Customs Records of a crew list. And on this list are um, a number of uh, Pequots. Um, right here we have uh, Charles Brayton, who's Pequot. 
Benjamin Uncas, I'm sure you recognize that name, uh, Joseph Fagans, and Alicia Apes, um, all Pequot men uh, traveling on the ship Connecticut uh, in 1832 and 1833. Uh, and they're on a whaling voyage bound to the South Atlantic Ocean. Um, and this is a logbook de uh, detailing and documenting that voyage. And some of the most important parts of this is not just the, you know, how the wind is blowing and how many sheets are um, um, down and where they're, where they're being tied, um, but it is, uh, in fact, right here where you can see latitude and longitude in each entry each day. And what that does is allow us to give us global positioning. So we can begin to map where Native people are going. Um, where they're going into ports around the world, where they're uh, meeting new people, um, whether it's Hawaii, New Zealand, Alaska, um, um, in the middle of this um, little um, cluster of dots is a, a small vo volcanic island called Tristan da Cunha, which becomes a whaling uh, center here, the Falkland Islands. Everywhere around the world, indigenous people are showing up. Um, and they're bringing back, um, some of them are coming back with new people, and some of them are staying in the places where um, they, they just decide they want to leave port. Um, so we have examples of Pequots in New Zealand and Pequots in Hawaii and Mohegans in Alaska uh, and so on. So I want to shift back to the land here. Um, in the interest of time, um, <clears throat> I have a bit more to say. Um, but these opportunities, these economies um, that Native people are engaging, that people of color broadly are engaging. Um, I shared with you um, the, the three sisters and um, the, co the, the hunting and trapping and fishing and fowling. Um, those types of subsistence patterns continued, but they were no longer, um, they were no longer sustainable. Um, in, the, in the way that um, had been done by their ancestors. And so we start to see Native people both on the reservation and increasingly off of the reservation, um, finding new ways to um, uh, what, what's called in documents, living in the English manner, which means not only are they, they maintaining aspects of their traditional subsistence, but they are uh, beginning to um, adopt uh, European animals, um, animal husbandry, uh, for farming practices, and living on smaller plots of land that is fenced in uh, with framed houses. Um, and what this requires is um, cash. And that cash is being, um, that cash is possible because of um, military labor, maritime labor, and what we start to see is an increase in private land ownership. So there's a presence on the reservation, but as I said before, 75% of the population of Indian people are living off of the reservation, and many of those people are buying land privately. Um, and importantly, they're forming new kinds of community in old places, um, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. But you can see here on this graph um, the number of uh, land acquisitions here um, in, the, in the blue color and the number of land sales in the, in the maroon color. And that increases, um, the, the acquisitions increase through the 18th century and then you can start to see um, the sales. And that's really what we start to see is this marginalization of indigenous people from the landscape, from the rural landscape into an urban landscape. <clears throat> And that's an important shift. Um, so while, I just want to sort of put um, uh, perspective to this. So while we see um, some Native people acquiring land adjacent to reservations, and here we have uh, the Eastern Pequot Reservation in North Stonington. Um, these are two of the smallest reservations in the state, uh, about 300 acres each here. And in Niantic with the uh, um, um, the Nahantic tribe, uh, in East Lyme rather. Um, in both of these places, you had indigenous men who were mariners or veterans of wars acquiring land adjacent to the reservations where there were uh, political fights with their white neighbors, encroachments on their land, so they acquired this land privately. And they lived in homes like this. Off of the reservations, we start to see um, the same type of land acquisition happening 
Um, in Patch Hog, which is in Griswold, the Patch Hog Indians, um, the scale of this is different, um, but this is a cluster of how, uh, properties up here. It's probably 100 acres, um, another large parcel here, and in Groton, a place called Pohegonet, um, where several parcels of 20 to 30 acres are being acquired. Um, and, and please note that these are indigenous place names, um, and they're, they've been maintained uh, for long periods of time. Um, so we have communities that are connected to um, their ancestral homelands um, in, in new and different ways. Um, and oftentimes what we see here are, is the men are away, either at war or at sea, women are uh, creating boarding houses and renting space to other people, um, generating revenue. And these are the types of properties that are being maintained over generations. Um, which is an important shift. So, you know, Native people, <clears throat> we tend to, in, we've inherited this history of Native people always losing land, losing the reservations, um, land being stolen, which is absolutely true. What we never hear is that Native people are creating new kinds of communities in spaces off of the reservations in their uh, ancient homelands and in places that have, um, that have uh, been maintained in familiar ways. So I, I want to step into uh, southwestern Connecticut a little bit, although the indigenous presence has been um, much more minim minimal there during the settler colonial period. Um, and this is something Chris can certainly touch on, um, but just uh, borrowing this uh, 1911 map, um, you can see some of the names that show up on here that are familiar, um, that reflect indigenous landscapes, that 13,000 year history um, through place names and community memory. Um, Chris, I don't know if you want to say anything about this or continue to the next slide. You can continue. Uh, I can actually no, wait here for just a second. Um, so uh, before we go to the next slide, where uh, we'll show you some of the ones you, you're uh, probably a little more familiar with, um, I just want to say that what's also happening during this period of erasure is that uh, the land is being occupied by English language speakers and is being renamed. Um, with English land names. And uh, that, that process is, is also part of the erasure. Um, you know, if you can uh, be the first to, to own uh, a piece of property, uh, then uh, that land was yours. And these are, you know, the differences between the English language and Algonquin dialects. Uh, in English, uh, language is a blueprint of a culture. And in the English language, you can own land as property. You can even own people as property. There's terminology for those in the English language. Yet, in the Algonquin dialects, they do not have uh, terminology for ownership of land as personal property. Um, it just does not exist. And, and I'll give you a term that's not from these dialects, but from my, my own tribe. I borrow this from our tribal, one of our tribal linguists, uh, linguists uh, Roger Paul, um, you know, who uh, you know tells everybody you know, that uh, you know in Passamaquoddy, uh, our word for what would be dirt, you know, in the English language, dirt, right, is is something that can be thrown away. Uh, you know, it's it's essentially you don't want to be dirty, uh, and, and to call some somebody dirty is actually an insult, uh, you know, but uh, in our language, the word is dutguan, and we translate it for English speakers oftentimes as, as the dirt, but what it really translates to uh, literally is the molecules of our ancestors, and it shows that within our language, we understand the land as a living being in and of itself, the, the a cycle of life uh, that exists within the dirt or the land. Um, and oftentimes, uh, you know, Algonquin dialects are also relational. Uh, in other words, the way uh, a word is translated depends upon oftentimes the, what uh, the context of, of the sentence is, uh, you know, what words are before, what words are after it. And, um, and that goes into uh, the state of Connecticut. Uh, that word Connecticut has different meanings amongst different tribes. Uh, so you can go to the next slide. Jay. Um, so some of the places uh, in, in, the, in the larger picture of the Northeast, uh, the places that you know, uh, Connecticut, of course, is now what we call the state of Connecticut. Uh, but in, in a few different uh, Algonquin dialects here, in my language, in Passamaquoddy, uh, it's uh, Connecticut. 
which is something long and straight. And uh, if you remember the map uh, that I showed of the Connecticut River, it's a really straight north-south flow. Um, uh, once again, uh, Native people were able to document uh, through song uh, and oral history uh, journeys of over a thousand miles. And the understanding of that river as being very long and straight uh, was well known throughout tribes throughout the region. Even though Passamaquoddy people are all the way over on what is now the border of the U.S. and Canada, uh, the, uh, what we call Scudig or what is now known as the St. Croix River. So we were uh, finding our way even all the way over here uh, to be able to get to that super highway to find uh, the wampum that was needed. And as Jason was mentioning in the trade, uh, we were using it as uh, a lot of the, uh, the Southern Algonquin tribes were uh, as ways uh, of uh, signifying truth or, or preserving history. Um, and so they had a very deep spiritual meaning, yet we did not have Kohog uh, clams up in our territory. Uh, so therefore we uh, made our way down here. So, um, you know, that gives us some familiarity. Um, but uh, other tribes, Abenaki, uh, which would have lived, uh, which do live at the uh, the northern end of the Connecticut River, um, it's uh, Quinitec, and that uh, suffix on the end, tec, that signifies something as a river. And, and so they're literally calling it the very long river. Um, and once again, an accurate description. So the, you know, since they actually live on the water itself, uh, they would use the identifier of the river. And then the Southern Algonquin dialects where the Connecticut empties out would have known it as Quinnetucket, uh, which tra translates or dialects, uh, translates as uh, generally the long tidal river. And uh, for those that know about the Connecticut river, the, the tides actually affect the water flow or the water level all the way up to the city of Hartford. Uh, in fact, it back in the 1930s during a hurricane, um, the uh, downtown area of Hartford flooded as a result of the storm surge. Um, so once again, an accurate description. And uh, even though uh, they're all slightly different, it's, it's literally where the name Connecticut comes from. And you can see the relationality of the way Algonquin dialects work. Uh, you know, uh, 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 observing things, you know, uh, based off of where e each individual uh, people had come from. And in fact, Pasmaquati is an anglicized version of Beskidamukati, which translates to the place uh, where we spear Pollock, which is uh, once again, a descriptor of the mouth of what is now the St. Croix River. Uh, Massachusetts, um, you know, I'm sure you're familiar with now the state of Massachusetts. Um, that is a Wampanoag term, uh, et, uh, uh, in uh, Wampanoag is a, uh, and, and even in uh, the Connecticut Algonquin dialects is a uh, signifier of a place uh, and was uh, uh, the name for a place of the foothills. And if you think about the area around Boston, um, when it was Shamit, before it was Boston, when it was a peninsula, uh, then they eventually, uh, you wonder where the hills are. Well, they, they ended up in uh, in the Bay and that that's how the, the city of Boston became Boston. Uh, was by filling in the bay with the hills that, that surrounded the area. But there's a few of, of the ones from uh, the uh, the Revolutionary War that they still remain. But uh, it, it's once again, you know, a, a pretty accurate description of the coastal areas around, um, you know, the eastern side of Massachusetts. Uh, Quebec City, which is at, uh, you know, kind of um, uh, where the St. Lawrence River be uh, finally becomes very, very small. Uh, in my language in Passamaquoddy and in a lot of other dialects, uh, Quebec, uh, it translates to where the river ends. And that is the location of where Quebec City is. So the province of Quebec uh, comes from an indigenous place name. Uh, Canada uh, is actually an Iroquoian term. Uh, Iroquois uh, is the French name for the Haudenosaunee or the people of the Longhouse uh, who live uh, in the uh, uh, upper part of the Great Lakes area, upper New York, Ontario. Uh, and that was, uh, you know, uh, it's kind of a, an anglicized version of a, a term for a village or a settlement. In other words, uh, uh, for a European settlement. Uh, so the word that they created for where Europeans were living. Um, so that's uh, a little bit of the indigenous history of some of those words. Uh, and you'll see all over the state of Connecticut uh, you know, still leftover examples. And oftentimes you'll see, uh, you know, the more than one place. Uh, so Poquanuck uh, is another common term. Uh, you, you might see uh, it's named, it's given to names of rivers and other things. Um, that was, uh, it's an anglicized version of a Southern Algonquin term that talks about 
land that has been cleared for farming. Um, and as you can imagine, during that erasure period, during that time of dispossession, as the English start to take over the land and cut down all the trees, uh, a whole lot of that territory was being opened up and it would have been a very common term to hear. Uh, Pequot um, is the name of the, you know, the people we call, uh, the tribes that we call Pequot, and that translates to themselves uh, as the people of the shallow water. Uh, and that is in reference to uh, the fact that they live uh, at the mouths of rivers, estuaries, uh, Mystic uh, being one of them, another uh, great estuary, which is uh, where the uh, origin of that word comes from. Um, and uh, but to other tribes, and, and this is what 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 sometimes happens with history is uh, if you ask another tribe uh, the translation of the word Pequot, you might get a different answer. And so uh, before the Pequot Museum was, uh, you know, uh, born and able to uh, counteract, uh, there was a lot of English documentation that would translate the word Pequot as the de destroyers. Uh, and that was partially because they were asking other tribes uh, about, about the Pequots post Pequot War uh, during the time when the Pequots were placed on reservations or were enslaved. Um, so that'll end uh, my part right there, Jay, and I'll let you finish up. Thanks, Chris. So um, it, as we begin to see, you know, what I'm showing is the sort of presence of Native people across the landscape. Um, and that, that, um, that possession, dispossession, land ownership curve um, during the 19th century begins to shift. Um, and it shifts in part because of social and um, racial pressures uh, on communities of color. Um, but we also see a shift based on economies. Um, and one of the big, I, I mentioned whaling um, through the 19th century, it was pretty significant. Um, <clears throat> you couldn't find, uh, there are actually descriptions of, and I have records for, um, so many of the, the reservation communities and, and these other off-reservation communities being devoid of men because every single male uh, was at sea. Um, <clears throat> and when the whaling economy uh, collapsed in the later part of the 19th century, 1870 or so, um, it, 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 it devastated New London. And so when, by the time we have the first uh, census in 1870 that actually includes Indians, there are only two Indians in New London, which is pretty astonishing uh, given the documented presence of hundreds and hundreds of Indians there in the prior decades. Um, so it, it sort of precipitated a bit of confusion for me as a scholar, um, but also sort of re, really, re, really beginning to rethink how we understand boundaries. Um, and these colonial boundaries, Chris has pointed out earlier in the conversation, these colonial boundaries overlay uh, more, more significant and ancestral patterns. And if we can simply um, eliminate these boundaries and look for the mobility of people <clears throat> between place, uh, we can see some interesting changes. And the biggest change that I, I'll share on this slide with you is a shift from whaling to mining um, in the movement of people from New London just over the border uh, to westerly Rhode Island. Um, so if we're only looking in Connecticut for Indians um, and, and the, the tribes from Connecticut, we're looking in the wrong place because Westerly becomes an epicenter for Indian activity um, and political agency um, into the 19th and late 19th and 20th centuries. Um, at the center of these um, uh, urban communities, um, in these urban spaces is where native people uh, and, and broader populations of color are gravitating for the different types of opportunities that are emerging. Uh, at the center of these are often churches. And in the upper right-hand uh, corner here, uh, this is a church that was founded in 1874 as the uh, Advent Christian Colored Church, but it was founded by three Narragansett men um, and modeled after the, the church on the tribal reservation. And one of the early ministers was Leroy Perry, who was a Wampanoag Indian from um, Eastern Massachusetts, and he was the minister of this church in the 1920s. Um, and this is, it's now known as the Pleasant Street Baptist Church, and colloquially, it's known as the Indian Church to this day. 
Um, so I'm, I'm bringing this part of the conversation up because it's not the only example we have. Um, closer to Fairfield um, and just over the border in Bridgeport is a community uh, in the early 19th century uh, known as Little Liberia um, and also called Ethiopia. Um, this is a, a terrible image here, um, but um, between Broad Street and Main Street um, is a community, and along that main corridor, <clears throat> is a community of free people of color, including Pagasset Indians, um, who were at the center of this indigenous uh, and mixed community. Um, and the reason I'm showing you this is because it's very close to home, um, is Pagassets were pushed out of their homelands. Uh, they they uh, gravitated towards Bridgeport to Little Liberia. And the two um, houses um, that are um, behind barbed wire um, are, uh, they were built, owned, and occupied by Mary and Eliza Freeman, who were the sisters of Joel Freeman, who was a, um, a sachem of the Golden Hill Pagussets. Um, so these women of, of mixed ancestry and most certainly Pagusset ancestry um, became uh, fairly wealthy in Bridgeport. And these are the oldest surviving structures owned by people of color, built, owned, and occupied by people of color in the state of Connecticut. And um, there's some wonderful work happening now um, with the Freeman Center in Bridgeport. Um, it's under, these, these houses are gonna be um, refurbished um, and become the site of a new museum. But last, uh, two years ago, I'm sorry, this site was um, recognized by the National Trust for Historic Preservation as one of the 11 most endangered places in the country. Um, and it's, seen, it's since seen an infusion of funding. Um, so this story will be told, but this is exactly how hidden these stories are. Um, um, this, is, this is one of the most interesting and important stories in Connecticut that most of us have probably never heard. I know I'm running out of time and I wanna leave time for questions, um, but just wanna to touch very briefly on that issue of how people of color are um, being um, um, labeled um, in different types of, of documents. Um, this is one individual, Amasa Lawrence. Um, he was born in 1811. Um, he's, um, he's Mashantucket Pequot man. And during the course of his life, he was identified in different ways. Um, as, a, um, as a young man um, in 1832 in tribal records, he was listed as dark. Um, in other records, mixed Negro and white. Um, on and on, Indian, free colored person, Indian. On the back of this image, he's listed as the chief of the Pequots. This is a Civil War carte de visite. Um, he, this man was so, so significant. Um, he, he lived until uh, the eight, um, 1880. Um, he was so significant, though, that he was named in his grandson's obituary in 1934 as an Indian medicine man of significant importance um, to that community in Westerly, Rhode Island. This is all to point out to you that the, the, the nature of race is so um, subjective that white record keepers are, are systematically, in many ways, erasing indigenous identity. Um, meanwhile, this man always identified as Pequot, always shows up in tribal records as a Pequot, um, and is important to recognize what a what a, a, a significant figure he was to the indigenous community uh, throughout the course of his life. <clears throat> um, I won't um, um, draw this out too long, but you know, through the through the nineteenth and early twentieth century, there are a number of laws, um, documents that um, really. Uh, bring to bear and impact um, indigenous presence, um, legal rights, um, and, and broadly um, how people of color are defined and treated uh, in this nation. So just calling out the series of um, uh, white um, colonial documentation and record keeping and um, legal systems that um, prevent and prohibit indigenous people and people of color um, in many, many ways. Um, just a final note on that westerly community and more broadly, um, this becomes a political epicenter uh, for, political, for, for an organization called the American Indian Federation. And this um, was chartered in 1931 in the basement of that church I showed you. Um, and 
uh, it was so significant that this became uh, the model for uh, political action that led to uh, the national, uh, the Chicago Conference, the National Indian Conference in 1962, where that became the framework and template for the American Indian movement of the late 60s and early 70s, that then became the template for federal recognition in the 70s and 80s. Um, and you can see the ways in which Native people maintained community identity, um, social networks, um, and a connection to uh, place. And I will leave it there and invite your questions. Uh, you can probably stop your screen share, Jay, and then uh, people can see us. Um, I do see one question in there um, from Lisa. I'm hearing the term Indian a bit. I want to know if Native peoples refer to themselves as Indians. Is it acceptable to Native peoples to refer refer to them as Indians? And that's a great question. That's actually the most common question we at Agamount get. And that comes from uh, professors, from teachers, from children, you name it. Um, there's a lot of people that ask that question. Which one is right? American Indian, Indian, Native American, Native? Um, I'm not sure. And what I try to tell people is that, once again, we're speaking in the English language. And there's some failures of the English language. Um, the idea of generalizing the plurality of a thousand thousand plus different cultures under a singular term is a European invention. Uh, you know, so terms like Indians or savages, which were uh, some of the, the earliest terms um, that were being used by the English, um, <clears throat> Are, are European conceptions of the native cultures they were encountering. And part of it was part of uh, erasure. If we can call them something other than uh, a Christian human uh, as, as they saw themselves, uh, um, then it was easy to dispossess land, uh, you know, if they were not, if they were dehumanized in some way, shape or form. Um, and so, what I tell people is that, you know, there are generalized terms. We do have to use them, though. Uh, you know, every tribe would prefer to be referred to by their name. Uh, you know, Passamaquoddy. I am not Native American. I'm not American Indian. I am Passamaquoddy. That's how I self-identify. That is a, a tribe, a culture, and these days a nation of people uh, with, uh, you know, a, 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 a culture that's tied to our homelands. Um, and so I would not self-identify as any of those generalized terms, but occasionally when we're speaking in English, we do have to use that. And uh, what I tell people about it is which one's right? None of them are right. They're all equally wrong. Um, you know, that, that, so there's a problem there, right? Uh, but um, the word Indian is in the U United States Constitution. Um, it's in uh, a lot of state constitutions as well. So when it comes to laws that are created about about tribes, especially federal laws, they have to use that word Indian. That is a legal term uh, for the oh, the generalized term for the indigenous peoples of the United States. In the uh, in the United States, that is the legal term uh, that has to get used. Um, what is it changes over time, and it, it goes off of our, our uh, um, you know, the way our different generations understand it. You know, because my father's generation didn't speak English, uh, so he learned English at about ten years old. He started to learn, and as he learned these English language terms, the term of the time was Indian. So his generation, oftentimes when they speak in English, uh, will use when they have to use generalized terminology that word Indian. But I tend to tell people to shy away from that as that is really uh, kind of, uh, you know, we've, we've really kind of moved on be, uh, beyond that. Um, for a while, Native American was uh, very much in vogue, and now uh, nowadays it's Native with a capital N without the American, because a lot of tribes don't want to associate uh, the, just the last couple of hundred years that this land has been known as America. They want people to think along that longer line, as Jason was talking about, of 12,000 plus years of occupancy of the land. And therefore, uh, the, 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 uh, what's in vogue these days is native with a capital N. So if you do have to generalize, I would tend to use native, Native American, uh, indigenous, if it applies. Uh, indigenous can be a worldwide term. So just, you know, make sure you uh, look through that. And if you go to our website, uh, agamout.org, we actually created a, a downloadable free resource uh, for in, use indigenous terminology, English language, indig indigenous terminology and uh, use in the classroom. And it's just kind of a, a quick guide uh, to the different terms that have come up over the years and where 
where they came from and, and how to use them. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, is it acceptable uh, to refer, is it acceptable to, to Native peoples to refer to ourselves as Indians with, uh, within emic situations? In other words, within situations where we're all surrounded by other Native people, um, that term will get used a lot, um, but it's generally uh, better accepted if you're not part of a, a, a tribe uh, to use Native if you have to use it generalized term. So I just wanted to be clear about that, but you know, there is no right one. Um, that's the, uh, so don't get too hung up if you, uh, use the, you know, a different one. All right. From Jennifer Pratt, what steps do you think lay people can do to be more cognizant and to reconcile these place names with their origins? Thinking of Pequot, of course, and also that slide referenced the way the Montauk was stolen land, the people, uh, the way Montauk was stolen land that people now vacation on. Um, so yeah, uh, it, we got a question also about land acknowledgement. So, you know, that is something that you're starting to see a little bit more and more of these days is the idea of a land acknowledgement, an institution acknowledging the fact that uh, they are on colonized land that was previously, uh, you know, uh, the land of an in indigenous people. Um, and a good way to find out, you know, if uh, whose land your people, uh, uh, whose uh, people your land is on, if you're in a, a specific town, uh, there is a, a, a resource called uh, nativeland.ca. And uh, that gives an indigenous overlay of the different tribal groupings that were uh, in, in all over the area. It's a, 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 a group sourced uh, type of material and it shows how uh, in native landscapes kind of overlap each other and there's no uh, real sense of border. Um, you know, so one of the things you can do as an institution is acknowledge, you know, that the fact that, you know, uh, your institution uh, exists upon land which was previously indigenous land and in some way shape or form it was taken um, sometimes it was stolen now you know there was some of these land deals that are the beginnings of uh, Connecticut towns uh, were sometimes not exactly the, the the most fair way I mean the idea of signing a piece of paper and giving ownership of, of, of land or property um, once again, it didn't exist without, within an Algonquin dialect. So the sachems that were signing these land deals, did they really know what they were getting? Uh, oftentimes they were just getting trinkets in return, uh, jackets or, uh, you know, things in pots and things of that sort, and, you know, for entire tracts of land. Uh, you know, so, uh, and also there's a, another part in that uh, the tribes in the territory see the, uh, the land of the earth as a maternal force. Uh, and therefore uh, the women uh, of the tribes were oftentimes produced the food through agriculture uh, about 75 percent of the food was produced by women therefore women had a whole lot of power and when it comes to the you know the taking care of the land that life-giving force um, that was largely part of the women's duty so if, if a town has a, a history of a land deal with uh, a male sachem um, you know there's something to be questioned about uh, the le legitimacy of that particular deal um, you know, it, it might look on paper like it was a legitimate deal, uh, but yet to the parties and the way they understood uh, that document, it would have been something else. So perspective does matter when you look uh, at all of these things. And, and one of the ways uh, to be cognizant of, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the effects of colonization is to start with a land acknowledgement. And I say start. Uh, because that's going only got that's got to be the first step. Um, that's that's where you start, uh, and then it's about building relationships, equitable relationships, where you are not extracting from the native communities, but native communities are invited, and there's a, a share and exchange of knowledge uh, that goes on uh, that benefits all parties. You know, because we all do better uh, once we understand indigenous ways of knowing uh, of this landscape here, uh, because uh, in the tribes that live uh, that live here have existed here for 12,000 years without, uh, you know, commodifying and overusing all the resources. And the way we currently live as Americans, um, we are not going to sustain uh, our, our way of life. And so it's going to be uh, cognizant. Uh, we, we all got to be cognizant of that. And we got to start paying attention uh, to the uh, people who have the owner's manual of this landscape. Uh, and that would be the indigenous tribes uh, and, uh, and learn, uh, you know, how uh, you, you could 
could use the entire landscape uh, to provide all of your needs uh, without having, uh, you know, the, the things that we have done uh, to the landscape these days. Hey, so Chris, I'm just going to ask this question real quick. So, you know, you, you've alluded to a lot of things that I want to actually have addressed. You know, erasure is, that, is, is the precipice. Is, it, it's the thing right now that we're trying to address, right? Um, given, given the circumstances at hand. And I wanted to ask you what you would say to, you know, I think white supremacists who talk about our country, you know, um, how would you address that idea that it's, you know, part of me thinks that it's an illusion. It's a delusion that it's your country, right? It's a miseducation if you believe it's your country, right? And, but, right, you can't blame him when erasure is at play, when there is no evidence, so to speak, as I talk to my students all the time, of the presence of Native American heritage and culture and so on in our towns. How would you solve that or how do you, how does one address that? Um, well, uh, you know, as, as someone who grew up in the state of Maine where um, native place names and there's a, there's a lot less of, uh, you know, the, the, the monuments to colonization that we see down here in Connecticut. Um, honestly, when I, the first time I got down here to Connecticut, I was really shocked at a lot of things. Um, you know, number one, uh, John Mason, uh, you know, had a, a statue in North Stonington, which is now in Windsor. Um, but he's also got a statue on uh, the, the, the facade, the uh, over the stairs of uh, the state building, uh, the state capitol building in Hartford. Uh, John Mason led the Pequot massacre uh, that killed 600 of my, uh, my wife and children's ancestors. Um, so in, from perspective of Pequots, uh, John Mason is a genocide heir, and uh, yet he is uh, you know, uh, lionized with, with statues on, on the state capitol building, uh, not to mention the massacre. Um, and so looking in around the state of Connecticut, there is a whole lot of uh, you know, kind of praying to the, the gods of colonization in the monuments that are created. Uh, and even in the town of Fairfield, there are two monuments that uh, you know, uh, remember the uh, Fairfield Swamp Fight. One of them just remembers the place. The other one was placed by uh, the Daughters of the Re uh, Rebel American Revolution in 1904 and is a fountain and actually uh, you know, pays credence to the bravery of the colonists um, at the end of the Pequot War, which was a genocide against the Pequots. Um, so once again, you know, as a Native person, seeing all of that, it, it, it tends to feel as if, uh, you know, there's an intentional, you know, uh, want to get rid of Native histories altogether. And so it, it feels like I'm, you know, pushing up a, a, a rock up a hill at times because there is so much of it overlaid here. And I think what we can do together is just kind of understand once again, as Jason was saying, that the time clock does not begin at 400 years ago uh, when it comes to, you know, people occupying this land. We're, we're talking well over 12,000 years that people have occupied this land and that colonization is is at the very end of the story uh, when it comes to the telling of the history of this land. And it is a very quick, violent disruption of that 12,000 years of, of continual history. Um, and so, you know, uh, starting to reframe the way we think about history, uh, you know, the, the school system still continuously, you know, tends to start with European exploration, uh, you know, as the beginning of the time clock. And one thing that you can do with your school is to encourage them to begin with that glacial time period and start talking about native people, you know, following the herds of caribou up into this territory and then eventually the changing landscape and start talking about that instead and reset the time clock for, for all students um, so that native people are not erased from our history anymore and uh, we can start to, uh, you know, have, you know, intelligent conversations about the monuments that we have up now and whether they're still appropriate. Um, you know, what purpose do they serve? You know, do they uh, serve to glorify a colonized history? Uh, is it uh, part of the erasure that we were just talking about for the last hour? Uh, and if it is, you know, as people, as we learn better, we do better. And hopefully, you know, maybe we start to reconsider, uh, you know, what those monuments mean uh, and, and how to uh, you know, properly uh, interpret them or maybe uh, put them in another place. Thank you, Chris. And I, I would suggest too, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, informing, informing our communities of, uh, you know, through education, these, these deep histories. I think 
you know, in the, in the content that I shared with all of you, you know, becomes a place where we can rethink how we engage contemporary tribal communities. You know, there's an opportunity there, you know, there, there are tribal museums in the state. Um, there are tribal members in this state um, and, and opportunities in, in public uh, spaces, powwows and socials that, um, that we all have an opportunity to go and, ga- and engage and learn um, and support tribal communities now, um, you know, and, and provide those, uh, that type of support network um, as communities are building and rebuilding their economies as well. Would part of addressing ratio also be to have Native American educators being part of like museums, schools, and all that? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we definitely got to diversify our education uh, field. Um, museums, which I work in, is one of the least diverse places, uh, you know, uh, in the education field. Uh, and when it comes to Native people, actually, we're, uh, we're the only demographic that in the last five years went down. Uh, in the art museum world uh, versus going up, uh, you know. So as mu- the museum world has slowly diversified, Native people have become less present. And what I tell people about it, uh, about that is that there's an issue with that, that no matter what is happening, you know, we, we have a historical reason why. My father's generation wouldn't go into historical museums because of human remains that were inside or, or other reasons. And so we have a troubled history with museums because of the extractive nature of, uh, you know, the creation of museums. So Native people have largely been not present in the creation of museums. But what I tell people is that it does us no good as Native peoples, as Passamaquoddy peoples, you know, or any any tribe uh, to be absent from these spaces that are interpreting our cultures and histories with us, with us or without us. It would be much better if we're there because it changes the conversation 100% from interpretation to then first person perspective. And and uh, that is a much more impactful way for people to learn. And it gets rid of the, the old uh, thinking, you know, the 19th century American conservation movement thinking uh, that feeds implicit biases within the American populace, especially within the state of Connecticut. Uh, working at the Pequot Museum, it was not uncommon for children and adults to ask, if the Pequot tribe was still there, you know, and Jason, you know, uh, referred to the last of, right? The last of the Pequots has died. That was printed in multiple papers over and over during that period, um, you know, and in the, in 2020, uh, people will still walk into that museum thinking that the Pequots have vanished, that they are all gone. Meanwhile, they have a Pequot educator leading their tour. Um, that's how disconnected uh, that, uh, you know, the populace can be when this erasure is so complete as it is uh, within the state of Connecticut and it's something that we can undo. Um, There is still, uh, you know, still a lot of evidence and there's still tribes within the state uh, and uh, the state recognized tribes as well as the federally recognized tribes uh, grow beyond the casinos uh, when thinking about Connecticut's tribes and start thinking about the cultural history and their ties to the land and the fact that they were never removed. Most tribes were removed to Oklahoma. The tribes in Connecticut have been living on these spaces uh, ever since colon- uh, pr- prior to colonization and in, in, in the same spaces, even post-colonization, were never removed from it and are still part of this landscape and even part of the urban landscapes as they arose uh, with the Indian neighborhoods, such as the westerly Indian neighborhood that Jason was describing in his presentation. So, uh, you know, ways of survival as, as the world changed, Native people became dynamic with their cultures uh, and interestingly enough, you know, uh, uh, a part of that survival was spending time at sea and becoming cosmopolitan and learning about the world and bringing that knowledge back home to their communities. And so uh, another thing I always like to, you know, uh, remind people of is that Native cultures are dynamic. We are not static. We are not only um, uh, uh, um, we are not only authentic as we were 500 years ago. Our people have always adapted to change over time, uh, and uh, you know that's part of uh, uh, the existence of Native peoples of this day. Chris, we did have a question about uh, the word "unkawa," uh, which is certainly near 
or the, the Fairfield region. Do you have any insight into that particular Southern Algonquin lawyer? The, the best I could find for that particular one, um, there, there's no good um, uh, suffix, you know, there's, uh, in Algonquin dialects, uh, you know, in various regions, you can look at the suffixes and the prefixes and oftentimes get an idea. Um, and I wasn't able to, unfortunately, uh, uncover that one. I, all I was given, uh, I found a few references to the land and that was basically west of New Haven, um, called by uh, a sachem as Unqua, the entire area. Um, you know, so the um, and so it would have been a descriptor of a large tract of land. It probably would have been a broad, generalized description, um, and not necessarily one particular place uh, in this instance. And um, both Jason and I shared the um, Wampanoag Reclamation Language Project. Are there additional Native nations that are uh, working on language reclamation or teaching, especially in the Northeast? Yes, yeah, so the Pequots are, are beginning also their language reclamation project, and uh, their cultural resource department now has, uh, you know, weekly language classes. They, they're starting to, <laughs> excuse me, uh, incorporate new uh, pedagogies into, uh, you know, trying to teach it. Because one of the things <clears throat> that's difficult about teaching our languages in uh, this colonized world is that we have to learn it in a classroom oftentimes, and our languages were born on the land. Therefore, when you learn it in the classroom, the context is not there. It doesn't totally make sense. Um, so nowadays, a lot of times, a lot of uh, language teachers try to find a way to incorporate um, the, the natural world within the classroom. And we're starting to see that now with the Pequots, with the Mohegans, uh, using their language much, much more. Uh, you know, and these are languages that were forced to be taken away from them, whether it was by war, destruction, and then later on by slavery and indentured servitude and forced assimilation. Um, you know, children are basically taken from their, their parents and forced and, uh, and only taught one language, the English language, to make sure that their language would die out. And so the fact that they exist to this day is a political statement in and of, of itself. Um, but the fact that they're using their language once again uh, is, is another tremendous statement uh, against genocide, uh, you know, in the, in the process that it takes to, uh, you know, heal from the multiple generations of uh, the war and then the paper genocide that you, uh, you saw from uh, Jason's presentation um, to finally getting uh, on a path to self-determination. And what I tell people is that you have to be a patient in this process uh, for these tribes. Um, they, it took multiple generations for this erasure and for these results to happen. It's gonna take multiple generations to really undo it. Um, but the tribes are the constant. Uh, you know, People from Connecticut might move in and out of the state, but the tribes will always be here and they always have been. And um, they're the ones that uh, you know they're, are gonna be here in the future as well. Um, and so they, they, they think about it in the long term. They think about it in future generations, not just in the generation of today. Thank you so much, Chris, Jason, Lori, Trey. Um, it's a little after eight, so I do think we have to wrap up. I want to thank everybody who attended. Um, and I don't know, Lori, Trey, any, any final words? Oh, a special thank yeah, you to – oh, go ahead, Trey. No, you go ahead. It's all good. I was just going to say thank you to everyone for hanging out and learning um, and listening so well with Jason and Chris for, and for all the excellent questions. And to Jen at the Pequot Library and to Trey with Fairfield Ubuntu, thank you. Go for it, Trey. For sure, Lori, thank you. Thank you, Jen, for helping us putting this together. Thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you, Jason. And thank you. Um, oh, my God. I'm forgetting. Um, oh, my God. I forgot. Akumat. Every the whole Akumat team. Thank you so much. And I just wanted to tell everyone, you know, that there is a follow-up to this because, um, we, you know, as I tell my students, when you're presented with an opportunity, you must respond to it. And, you know, there is a way to respond to erasure, and we're going to work towards kind of responding to that at our next meeting. So look, look for the information for our next program, which will hopefully lead us to responding to some of the erasure of the indigenous people of our area. All right. So thank you all for joining us tonight.
Thank you, everyone from the Fairfield Museum. Take care. Bye. Good evening, everyone, uh, once again, and welcome. My name is Samantha Coolish Bargione. I am the executive director of the Weston Historical Society in Weston, Connecticut. And I hope everyone has their uh, their cocktail or their mocktail tonight. Don't worry, mine is just water. Um, and because we're going to be diving into the history of prohibition. Uh, before we begin, just a few important reminders. Uh, like I had mentioned, we will be recording this program tonight. We will be making it available on the Western Historical Society's YouTube page, as well as our Facebook page. And we will also email all of you a recording uh, by the end of this week. So keep your eyes out uh, on your email for that. Uh, we kindly ask that you keep your microphones and your cameras muted. Uh, we want to make sure that everyone is focused on our presenters this evening. And I, like I had mentioned earlier, we are going to be using the chat feature to run the question and answer session, which will take place at the end of the program. Uh, so if you're on a desktop or laptop, the chat feature is located at the bottom of your screen. If you're on an iPad or a tablet, it's located at the top right of your screen. Uh, you'll tap on the three dots and you'll click on the word chat and you'll be able to type in your question. And at the end, I will read the questions out uh, to our presenters to answer. If you'd like to help the Western Historical Society continue our programming, exhibits, um, please consider making a donation at the end of the lecture tonight. We are a 501c3 nonprofit, and you can visit our website, westernhistoricalsociety.org, to donate or to become a member. Now, as a lead-in to the Weston Historical Society's upcoming exhibit, Weston Slept While the Nation Roared, Life in the 20s, which will open later this year, we've organized a series of virtual lectures that explore events that influenced and shaped the Roaring Twenties. Um, our first lecture of the series was on World War I. Our second lecture, which was only a few weeks ago, was on the Great Migration. And tonight's lecture, which is the third in our series, will explore the 18th Amendment, Prohibition. And uh, we have guest presenters tonight. Uh, we have Dr. Francis Cohn, and we will hopefully have Mr. Stephen McGrath with us this evening. Um, so I am going to uh, stop my screen share and Dr. Cohn is going to take over the room. Uh, but before he starts, I'd like to share a little bit of information on our presenters this evening. Uh, so Dr. Uh, Francis Cohn, Professor of History at Tunxis Community College, has taught history and geography for 30 years. From 2007 until 2019, he served as Chairman of the Social Studies and History Department at Tunxis. He holds a bachelor in, Bachelor's in Geography and a Master's in History from Central Connecticut State University, and a PhD in History from the University of Connecticut. Um, 
Stephen McGrath recently retired from teaching at Central Connecticut State University, where he taught American history and European revolutions. He earned a master's in history at Trinity College, where his advisor was Glenn Weaver. He taught in Ridgefield, New Milford, and the West Hartford school system, and was a district history supervisor for 23 years. He has taught at the university level for 20 years. He is co-author with Sarah Griswold of the First Congregational Church of Woodbury, Connecticut, 350 Years of Faith, Fellowship, and Service, uh, which was published in 2020. He also has written articles and book reviews for the Connecticut History Review. So without further ado, I am going to turn the talk over to Dr. Cohn, who's gonna start us off tonight. Thank you, Samantha. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for making some time out of your schedule to be with us tonight. I'd like to also thank the Weston Historical Society for sponsoring the event. So. Professor McGrath and I have only done this once before. It's been a while, so we'll see how it goes. I might be a little rusty, but I have been looking through my notes and my slides, so hopefully it all comes back to me. And the way we have arranged this is to sort of divide it into two halves. It sort of naturally fell out that way. So what I'm going to discuss is the backstory to prohibition. So you're going to be getting kind of bonus footage here, so to speak. Um, Professor McGrath will cover national prohibition of the 20s, which is sort of the main event. But what many people don't know is there's a long history of prohibition attempts um, in the United States that dates back at least to the early 19th century. And that's what I'm going to cover. So let's jump in. Hopefully the slides will work OK. And certainly I welcome your questions. As Samantha said, please, please use that chat function. The best part of these presentations for me is always the Q&A at the end um, with the patrons or with the audience. All right, so there we have our clever um, title for the presentation. We thought it was clever anyway. If we go back to the origins of the country, and there have been a lot of studies done on this, alcohol use was ubiquitous. And in fact, you see that nation of drunkards, this is actually a title of a chapter in a work by an historian, W.J. Rorabaugh, who in 1979 wrote The Alcoholic Republic, an American tradition, in which he illustrates this and documents it, that everybody drank not everybody, but the vast majority drank, and they drank a lot, and they drank in all sorts of settings. And there were reasons for this. Um, one, water was often contaminated and dangerous. They didn't understand uh, the germ theory of disease yet, but they did understand that it could be dangerous to drink water. Um, two, alcohol was touted as having all sorts of medicinal and health benefits. And keep in mind the state of medicine at this time where most diseases or ailments really couldn't be treated. So alcohol was sort of the cure-all for everything. And of course that would persist, you know, even in the 20th century to some extent. It was a source of calories. If you think of a lot of alcoholic drinks, they are caloric. So this was a significant um, number of calories for a lot of these people too. And maybe first and foremost, it was a social lubricant. Um, and that really hasn't changed entirely. Um, if you've been to weddings, if you've been to birthday parties, if you've been to retirements, often you know, people drink. And certainly in the colonial area, era into the early national period, people drank at every possible occasion. What was discouraged and controlled to some extent was public drunkenness. Uh, to get drunk in private with your comrades in arms, as you see in this painting, was pretty common. But public drunkenness was certainly frowned upon, and there were various social controls in an America where most people knew each other, where they lived in small communities, um, often you know ethnically connected, and so forth. So that's the first point that. 
people drank and they drank an astonishing amount um, in the colonial period, certainly into the early national period. And let's illustrate that a little bit. And this is from the Rohrabach, um, actually not from his book, from, but from an article he did on this. So he, he did meticulous research and tried to estimate alcohol consumption per annum per American over 15 in 1810. And again, you'd have to look at the study, but it, what he came up with is incredible. One point he makes is one can't simply look at alcohol production and then divide by the number of people per year because actually a large amount of that alcohol was not consumed. It was used for industrial purposes. So one really has to separate out those two things. But here's what he came up with. And again, this is per year, per American over 15. This is how much they drank. By far, the most popular alcoholic drink at this time was cider. Distilled spirits, next, beer, and then wine. And wine would typically be more the middling to upper classes, obviously. But the working classes, the poorer, it was more cider. Distilled spirits in 1810, that probably still would have been rum, but it was transitioning towards whiskey. That would soon become the predominant distilled spirit. So if you total all this up, this is gallons. <laughs> it's over 40 gallons per person per year. And again, this is a mean also. So there were people who drank perhaps far more than this uh, to compensate for those who didn't drink as much. So it's pretty astonishing. And then if you want to do ounces per day, uh, it, that, I just did the math, it comes out to that. It's, it's really a staggering figure one comes up with. Well, was drunkenness a problem? One would expect so. Um, was alcoholism a problem? Sure, absolutely. But it wasn't really until the early 19th century that there were systematic, widespread movements that emerged to do something about that. And much of the do something would revolve around two approaches, which we're going to come back to repeatedly here. One was to persuade people to stop. And the second was when that didn't work, because often it didn't, was to get rid of the source of their temptation, which was the alcohol itself. So the temperance movement would really arise in the early 19th century, and it's very much connected to the Second Great Awakening, this great religious revival that would sweep the United States roughly in this period. And without getting into that whole history, that's certainly um, an important part of the temperance movement is this religious element. So the idea of demon rum, drunkenness leads to what in the Christian sense? Sin, all sorts of sin in that people who are drunk are giving up their free will and now are more prone to sin. And we could list the sins, but I think we probably don't have to here. So certainly many of these evangelical churches began to view uh, certainly drunkenness, but even alcohol use as um, unchristian and sinful, or at least leading to sin. So something that had to be combated. I think connected with that was to avoid public drunkenness increasingly was viewed as being engaged in respectable behavior. It was a way of separating yourself out from the masses and kind of a striving for middling class, as I call it, respectability. Middling class people, respectable gentlemen and ladies too, perhaps, were not publicly drunk. That became anathema. Uh, certainly part of this was social control, too. It was one group trying to impose their will on the others, and that would be a repeated theme of temperance and prohibition also, the sense that certain people can't control themselves, so we're going to, if we can't persuade them to control themselves, again, we're going to get rid of the source of their problem. And then a fourth aspect of the temperance movement definitely is nativism, and Professor McGrath will definitely talk about that a little bit, at least, when it comes to prohibition. 
you've got this battle between native-born Americans on the one hand, immigrant groups on the other. And in this period, the two immigrant groups that were massively discriminated against were the Irish and the Germans, who were arriving in very large numbers by the 1840s. To some extent, the split also breaks down Protestant Americans versus Catholic, but in a sense, I'm saying the same thing, because most of the Irish coming over were Catholic, and so were many of the Germans. The Protestant churches tended to be the ones that drove this temperance movement, and they'd be very much involved in prohibition. And it was the Catholic church that um, was certainly more supportive of drinking, not drunkenness, but certainly more in support of the use of alcohol. So this is an interesting print from Nathaniel Courier, and you probably know Courier and Ives, many, many prints. And this is a famous one that's reprinted in history textbooks, for example, The Drunkard's Progress, from, if we look on the extreme left, a glass with a friend, to the extreme right, death by suicide. And you see what's happening to this figure all in between. He's losing his health, he's losing his friends, he's losing his wealth. And then if you look under the arch of this um, bridge, this is important too. The temperance movement, the prohibition movement are very much connected to the role of women in American society. And I dare say it's probably the same overseas too, but certainly in America, women have a central role in both temperance and prohibition for two reasons. One, the idea of Republican motherhood emerged in early national America, where the role of mothers, among other things, was to be the, the moral guardians of the family. It was to pass on morality to their children. And part of that would be, and also to take care of their, their husbands, assuming they were married, and most would be. So part of this was to steer the husband away from this destructive behavior, if possible, and certainly to protect the children. So again, it's a very traditional um, view of womanhood, that a woman is meant to be a wife, a mother, and hence a nurturer, a caretaker of her family. And part of that would be, again, to try to keep the husband on the straight and narrow and to try to protect the children, too. But obviously, the, the darker side of that was women were, in many senses, and children, too, the biggest victims of alcoholism. You know, think of what alcoholic husbands do, unfortunately, to uh, their families because of their addiction. Violence, obviously, um, squandering money perhaps they don't have, particularly if they're a working class man, um, losing their job, etc. So again, one cannot talk about temperance and prohibition without um, understanding the central role of women in both of those movements. So I already have introduced these ideas, moral suasion, and then we're going to look at legal suasion. But moral suasion really grew out of the Second Great Awakening, the idea of using peer pressure and using churches primarily to persuade people to, first of all, not get publicly drunk, but really pretty quickly it became to give up the use of alcohol altogether so as to avoid that temptation. So this movement would sweep the United States in the 1820s and 30s. The American Temperance Society was founded in 1826 in Boston by a group of ministers, but within 10 years, I've seen different estimates. There were five to 8,000 temperance societies at the state and local level in, in the United States. So this very, very quickly swept the country. And I'm just going to see if I can pull up this document, because we have a local example here. And actually, we're going to look at the original. It's a local temperance society. Come on. Here we go. From East Avon. This is a temperance society book. It's a ledger book. It's not long, but we'll just glance at it. Don't try to figure out the cursive. 
course, in, as an historian, I'm also aware that cursive will be indecipherable probably within a generation unless people have special training. I mean, decreasingly do children even learn how to write cursive. So it's going to become a foreign language, unfortunately. But that was the Constitution. This is a record of minutes. Beautiful handwriting. Dr. Cohn, just so you know, it's not coming up on the screen for us. Uh, okay. That's okay. I <laughs> just wanted to let you know. All right. I'm going to read you. Thank you. I'm sorry. I wish, I don't know if there's anything I can do here. All right. I wish, I wish you could see it. What I'll do then is to simply read you the temperance pledge. So this is one way these societies operated was to get people to pledge not to use alcohol. So I'll simply read it to you. We whose names are hereunto annexed do hereby agree that we will not use intoxicating liquors nor traffic in them as a beverage, that we will not provide them as an article of entertainment or for persons in our employment, and that in all suitable ways we will discontinuance use throughout the community. So there are a lot of parts to that, but not only were people who signed this pledge, and I wish you could see the book because it has the list of signatures, which is extensive. Not only are they pledging not to use alcohol, they're really in pledging now to persuade others not to use alcohol. So it's the use of peer pressure to get people to sign these pledges and defeat the problem that way. I'm sorry you couldn't see that. Well, what's the problem with having people take pledges? Well, are they gonna be able to hold to the pledge or are they interested? And obviously we know alcoholism is, a, if not a disease, it's an addiction. Whatever term wants to you, we could debate that. But at some point, it really becomes immensely difficult for the person to be able to make any sort of decision in terms of controlling the addiction, maybe even impossible. So when moral suasion was proven to have its shortcomings, um, the temperance groups and others would turn to legal suasion, the law. They were simply going to try to pass laws that would reduce, restrict, eventually prohibit the manufacture, sale, and use of alcohol. The fellow you see there, Neil Bao, is an instrumental figure in this legal suasion movement. He was a native of Maine. He would actually serve as mayor of Portland, Maine in the 1850s, a member of the Maine legislature. And it very late in his life, 1880, he would run as the presidential nominee for the Prohibition Party. You might not be aware, but there was a third party, a national party, the Prohibition Party, which in 1888 and 1892 actually got over 2% of the popular vote nationally, which is not enough to win, obviously, but, but significant. He embraced temperance for at least three reasons. One, he was a Quaker. And Quakers tend to be temperate people. Maybe more importantly, he was an abolitionist. So he linked the um, manufacture of rum, particularly, with the slave trade. Rum being made from sugar, sugar being produced by slaves. But also he was a nativist. Uh, as a native of Maine, he despised the Irish who were coming to Maine, Portland particularly, in the 1840s and 50s. And of course, he wasn't alone in that. Um, fair warning, I'm Irish. I can say anything I want about the Irish. So if you're offended, don't be. So what he would do in Maine is lead this effort to pass a law to prohibit liquor. And it, it succeeded, actually. And by 1855, actually, 13 states, and you see them here, the little cups of coffee I had to add because this map isn't entirely accurate, but 13 states, all of them except Delaware, north of the Mason-Dixon line, in Indian territory, I guess, um, they had actually passed what they call a mean law, a prohibition law. And Connecticut was one of those states, believe it or not, we were. We had prohibition um, long before the national prohibition.
I stumbled on this in doing research for this presentation. It was a publication put out by a group that it's called the Maine Liquor Law Statistical Society. It was really an arm of the temperance movement. It was meant to publicize the wonderful results of the Maine Liquor Law in Connecticut in this case. And on the left-hand side, there's actually an interview with Governor Dutton, Henry Dutton, who was the governor at the time. He was a Whig. And I'll just read you a couple of his conclusions. So number 24, direct action of the Maine liquor law. Its beauty is its simplicity. And again, this is Governor Dutton responding to a, a survey, essentially. When you see a nuisance, you at once remove it. That is our principle. We take the abominable thing and put it away in some safe place. So when we see an individual unable to take care of himself, we simply take care of him, no matter who he may be, and put him where he cannot hurt himself or others. So it's very paternalistic to say the least. And then he's asked about legal suasion versus moral suasion. I love this response. We have found by practice that legal suasion is better than moral suasion. The latter is quite useless except with moral men. Interesting comment. When men are governed merely by appetite or love of gain, and by the way, that's aimed at the liquor lobby, the people producing the liquor, that latter part, love of gain. Moral suasion has no effect. Legal suasion saves breath and labor and accomplishes the object in the simplest manner possible. So just pass a law, problem solved. Now, all of you know what happened to the national prohibition and why. The problem with passing a law that prohibits a substance that many people still want is you do what? You turn people into lawbreakers. And that's precisely what happened in all of these states. Um, there was corruption, there was lack of enforcement because it was really impossible to enforce, and people simply found ways around the law. So again, 1855, sort of the, the height of this main liquor movement that took off very, very quickly. 13 of states have prohibition of some sort. By 1863, only five kept those laws. So the laws, for example, in Connecticut, were only in effect a, a very few years because they simply did not work. Obviously, the other part of it is you create a black market. You give people now an incentive to break the law because there's so much money to do so. And Professor McGrath, well, I'm sure mentioned that when it comes to national prohibition, the same thing would happen. I already mentioned the prohibition party. And again, you see two women here. Again, the idea of women being central to prohibition and temperance also. So the National Prohibition Party was formed in 1869, the WCTU five years later. And, and both certainly embraced temperance, or in the case of prohibition, it was literally prohibition. One of the debates that separated these two groups was what, what they called a broad gauge approach versus a narrow gauge approach. So the Prohibition Party was a narrow gauge group. The only issue they ran on, the only issue they cared about was prohibition. They focused on that like a laser beam. Uh, Francis Willard was actually the second president of the Prohibition Party, or actually, excuse me, the, uh, would be the WCTU. Uh, but they were more a broad gauge organization. So certainly the Women's Christian Temperance Union fought for temperance, and that was to protect families, what Willard called a home defense, families, women, children. But they also advocated for um, women's suffrage, for changes to labor laws, for child welfare. So again, they, they lobbied for a more extensive group of changes, whereas the Prohibition Party was focused on restricting, again, the sale and use of alcohol. And, and both had some successes without getting into the details. I put Carrie Nation up there because she was a member of the WCTU, maybe the most famous, in fact, and she was famous for the reason you see in the photo. In 1890, excuse me, in 1900, she began what she called her hatchetation campaign 
to uh, bring about prohibition kind of on her own. She said that God had told her to literally take this upon herself to end a prohibition or bring about prohibition by going into saloons in various places with a hatchet and destroy things. And that's what she did. I mean, she would literally break the liquor bottles, hack up the bar. And she was a little tiny woman, but men were terrified of her. Today, she'd probably be diagnosed with a mental illness, treated, but um, this was a long time ago. From 1900 to 1910, she was arrested about 30 times for doing this. And actually, she was disowned by most of the um, WCTU members, a little too radical for them. But again, these two groups are still pushing the issue. And one thing they're pushing for, um, ultimately, they're pushing certainly the Prohibition Party, but both for some sort of national prohibition. But they realized they could start at the local level and the state level. And one thing they push for is what was called the local option. And many states would pass these laws, which allowed counties to go dry to impose prohibition, or in some cases, cities. So where you'd have many states where some counties would be dry and some would be wet. So that was a way of working towards you know, eventually a statewide prohibition and then a national prohibition. So they had some success with the, the so-called local option. And if, if you look at the situation in 1890, you see the states in green have that local prohibition, meaning some counties would have been wet, some dry. The uh, states in blue are have total prohibition, just a few at that time, and the states in yellow have no prohibition. So it's sort of a mixed bag. So sort of the third try at a national prohibition is the Anti-Saloon League, which was more successful than any group that came before them. Now, obviously, they're building on the work of the Prohibition Party and the WCTU, but nonetheless, this was a group that emerged in Ohio. Actually, it was, they were, it was founded by, I won't name the names, a lawyer turned minister, it's an interesting combination, and an attorney, um, who became the organizer. And this was a group that was supremely organized. The grassroots organization that really was built around the churches, the Protestant churches, to mobilize people, to do protests, uh, to raise money. One thing they did extensively was to, um, to publicize their efforts. You see posters here, there were um, extensive pamphlets, writings, articles, this massive coordinated effort. And what they did is they concentrated on drying up liquor in, in the United States, as they said, one district and one county at a time. They would literally support any candidate who would support prohibition, and they would oppose any candidate who would not. And they were ruthless about that. They did not care about a candidate seeing on any other issue. So this is, again, that narrow gauge approach. They were well-funded, they gained a lot of support, and it worked. So by 1905, which is when they're really hitting their stride, you see now, particularly that local option is in most states in the United States. And by the time we get to the eve of the national prohibition, not only was the local option sweeping the country, now an increasing number of states, and part of this is also linked to World War I, which it, we can talk more about that. I, in the interest of time, I won't. But on the eve of the national prohibition, most states had already actually prohibited liquor. It already was on the books. Not all states, though. Um, the national prohibition, the 18th Amendment would finish the job, so to speak. That's enough. Um, I hope you do have questions. I'll look at the chat, but I would like to stop here and turn it over to my colleague, Professor McGrath.
Well, good evening. Thank you, Professor Cohen, um, for that that very uh, uh, able review of the uh, background of prohibition uh, and and the long history of it. Uh, now, what I'd like to focus on tonight, uh, in the decade of the 1920s, especially upon why prohibition proved so difficult to enforce, and ultimately why prohibition was repealed uh, in 1933. Well, number one, uh, in terms of problems, uh, there was a problem of enforcement on the federal level. Uh, the uh, federal government in the 1920s was basically Republican. And historically, uh, Republicans have been low tax people. And they have been very reluctant to spend the people's money. And this was true of enforcing prohibition, too. It was fine to have the law on the books, but it was only half-heartedly enforced because uh, there was so little money devoted to enforcement. Uh, in 1920, they only had 1,520 men nationwide as enforcement agents for prohibition. In 1930, that number was raised to 2,836, but that still meant one man for every 12 miles of United States border, and much of the illegal alcohol was coming in uh, through the borders, on the coastline and through the Canadian border especially. Uh, the salaries of these men, 1920, ranged between $1,200 and, and, and $2,000, and by 1930, these had been raised to uh, between $2,300 and $2,800. Now, that wasn't a lot of money. When you consider the risks that these men were taking, that wasn't a whole lot of money. And therefore, uh, it was hard to get agents uh, who were really capable enough of enforcement. So that was the, the first problem with prohibition in the 20s. Public opinion, particularly in urban areas, began to turn against prohibition very quickly after World War I. Many northern cities never supported it to begin with. Those cities were a real mix of Irish, Italians, Germans, Slavs, African Americans, and most of these groups strenuously opposed, po uh, opposed prohibition. And in these places, the laws were openly violated. Post-war disillusionment with the idealism of the war also played a role in eroding support for prohibition. Uh, Americans felt after World War I that they had been had. And many Americans were disillusioned with our attempt to create democracy, make the world safe for democracy, because uh, that's really not what we did at all. And so many Americans began to think, well, you know, here we've sacrificed so much for several years, it's time to have a party. And that's what the 1920s uh, was. It was a long party. It was the Roaring Twenties. And so uh, this was the era of bathtub gin, speakeasies, homemade wine, homemade beer. And in fact, most of uh, the alcohol consumed at that time was beer. Um, there was widespread evasion of the law on the domestic level to the point where federal authorities were totally unable to control it. Now, another factor that fed into this was the changes in manner, manners and morals that occurred during the 1920s. Americans were a whole lot more mobile in the 1920s. 
because the automobile brought mobility to Americans that they never quite had before. Um, what it meant was that uh, uh, couples could now date out of the purview of their parents. Uh, they were no longer chaperoned. And of course, this led to some changes in manners and morals as well. Uh, one also had the mobility to drink. And if one wanted to drink, one could go out of town and find drink. You could always, through your connections, find out where those places were. Uh, even if you went to a hotel, there was a code for ordering liquor. And you would call room service and say, please deliver me ginger ale and cracked ice. And what you're actually ordering was a highball, which was rye, ginger, and ice. Now, I don't know if anybody drinks a highball these days, but of my parents' and grandparents' generation, it was very, very common. Canadian club, ginger ale, and ice. Uh, I think most young people have probably never heard of it. But that was, the, that was a code word, ginger ale and cracked ice, and of course they put the Canadian club in there. Now, another factor here is that anti-German sentiment slowly began to subside. And one of the selling points for prohibition was the assertion on the part of the, of the dries, the foes who wanted prohibition, was that um, we had to make those Germans sober up. They were very concerned with the German beer gardens that were open on Sunday afternoon, of all things. And uh, even Teddy Roosevelt, now he wasn't alive in the 20s, he died in 1919, but if you follow the mindset here, um, when the Benjamin Harrison administration ended in 1893, uh, Teddy was out of a job. And so he went to New York City and was appointed police commissioner. His particular uh, obsession was closing down the beer gardens on Sunday afternoon. He didn't think it was right that the Sabbath ought to be profaned by a bunch of Germans sitting around drinking beer and singing German songs. Um, this obviously did not endear him to the German community in New York. And fortunately for Teddy Roosevelt, McKinley was elected in 1896 and he was appointed uh, under uh, 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 under Secretary of the uh, uh, of the Navy, and promptly went to Washington. Now, the nineteen twenty eight election was very much a struggle between wets and dries. The wets were represented by the Democratic Party, led by Al Smith, the happy warrior, who was an Irish Catholic from New York, the first Roman Catholic to really be nominated by a major political party. And of course, the Dries, uh, represented by the Republican Party and, and Herbert Hoover. Uh, we can't say that the uh, wet versus dry controversy was a major factor in the election. We can say it was one factor because uh, another major factor was Al Smith's Roman Catholicism that, that caused him to lose many southern states where anti-Catholicism ran very, very deep. Now, after Hoover was elected, uh, he really was sensitive to the fact that uh, there was widespread lawlessness over the issue of prohibition. And so he appointed a commission commission of a total of 12 men led by George Wickersham of uh, uh, Massachusetts. And this Wickersham commission was supposed to look at the issue of prohibition and see uh, what, what the problems were and recommend some solutions. Well, uh, they met for about 11 months and as it turned out, five of them wanted the status quo, keep prohibition. Four were for modification of some sort to allow wine, for example, lower alcohol content wine and, and lower alcohol content beer. 
and two were for a repeal out, outright. But the point I think you should, we should note is that it was six to five for modification or repeal, and uh, the five, of course, were in the minority, and they wanted to stay where it was. Um, so there was a, definitely a mixed uh, report from the Wickersham Commission. Now, there was a, <laughs> a, a satire of the Wickersham Commission, and it went something like this in the New York world. Prohibition is an awful flop. We like it. It can't stop what it's meant to stop. We like it. It's left a trail of grass, graft, and slime. It's filled our land with vice and crime. It don't prohibit worth a dime. But we like it. And that was uh, the confusing message that the Wickersham Commission sent to the nation. Now, I think we also have to consider the growth of organized crime during the 1920s. And there were uh, organized uh, crime outfits in many, many cities uh, that were, and they were, of course, marketing uh, illegal alcohol. The most infamous, of course, is Al Capone. He was brought by a Chicago gangster, uh, Johnny Torrio. Uh, he was brought from the Five Points Gang in New York City, and he became, in effect, Johnny Torrio's executive officer at 23. Within three years, he had 700 men working for him. What he set about to do was to eliminate the other gangs that provided the competition. So Dion O'Banion was killed in his floral shop. There was a war between the O'Banion gang and Capone in 1928 and 1929. And finally, on February 17th, 1929, St. Valentine's Day, uh, Al Capone's henchmen uh, massacred seven key O'Banion leaders in a garage in Chicago. This was known as the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. In those two years, 1928 and 1929, there were over 500 gang-related murders in Chicago. And this scene was replicated in many other major cities like New York City, San Francisco, Detroit, Philadelphia, wherever there were large numbers of people who wanted booze. Now, it has to be remembered, too, that these, um, these gangsters were notorious and they were admired at the same time. At 32, Al Capone was the unchallenged master of the distribution of illegal liquor in the United States. For his sister's wedding, his subordinates put together a 17-foot tall wedding cake. Al Capone also had a huge estate in Miami. And for the first time in the American vocabulary, the term racket became used for organized crime. This was a great matter of concern for the federal government and for state and local governments. So if you look at all the reasons why prohibition was not terribly effective and why public support was eroding it, perhaps we should not ask why was it repealed, we should ask the question, why did it last as long as it did? And I think there are a number of reasons for it. Number one, prohibition was supported by a large majority of what we call low church Protestants. These were the Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterians, Congregationalist, Disciples of Christ, all the denominations, incidentally, that used grape juice in communion. That had started, grape juice, by the way, was invented by a fellow named Welch in the 1830s, specifically for the Methodist Church. 
grape juice didn't really exist before then. And no, contrary to what the fundamentalists teach, uh, Jesus did not use grape juice at the Last Supper. There was no way to preserve it. But this fellow Welch found a way to preserve it. It caught on with the Methodists, and pretty soon, all the low church Protestants were using it in their communion services. Episcopalians and Lutherans, of course, were never swept away with that impulse. Um, and these were two major uh, Protestant groups that opposed prohibition to begin with. Um, Episcopalians often call the Eighth Sacrament gin and tonic. Now, the, the other uh, factor here, the why it lasted so long, was it was viewed as an anti-immigrant measure. And prohibition um, was viewed as a slap against the Irish and Germans. And in the early 1920s, there was a very strong nativist, anti-foreign sentiment, again, rising in the United States, and again, primarily among low church Protestants. Okay? Um, it was viewed largely as an anti-immigrant measure. Lots of politicians, especially Republicans, referred to beer and Bolshevism, conjoining the two. And this is the era in which the United States passed highly restrictive immigration laws. And the immigration laws were designed to keep to a minimum uh, Eastern Europeans, Southern Europeans, and shut the door entirely on Asians. Uh, for example, if you look at the, the, the National Origins Quota Act of 1924, which really was the culminating law in this, uh, uh, this series of laws on immigration, and it was not really repealed overhaul until 1965. That's within, within our lifetimes. What it did was it specified that there would be about 150,000 immigrants let in every year and that any group would be restricted to its percentage of the American population in 1890. So, 2% of that 150,000 that would be let in in the future could be Italian, because Italians only comprised 2% of the American population in 1890. This was definitely calculated to keep out the Italians, uh, the Greeks, the Poles, the Russians, the Ukrainians, uh, all those groups from Eastern Europe, many of whose uh, people arrived uh, without a reading knowledge of their own language. And, and that was, uh, and, and American social workers tried to turn all of this around by sponsoring schools, but uh, by also trying to change people's living habits, uh, trying to get the Italians away from Italian food, for example. And we know how well that worked out, don't we? Uh, at any rate, um, it, the, the Catholics, by and large, were in favor of repeal of prohibition. They were mostly Irish, German, and Slavic, and Italian, they were opposed to prohibition. And uh, Chesterton once said, and, and I think there's some truth to this, um, wherever the Catholic sun doth shine, there's lots of laughter and good red wine. At least I've always heard it so, benedicamus domino. And that really summed up the Catholic attitude on, on prohibition very well. Um, I think the last factor that we have to contend with is that middle-class women supported prohibition by and large, even if they were Irish Catholic, even if they were German Lutherans. And a lot of it hinged on the issue of spousal abuse and family abuse from men who were alcoholics men who would go to the bar on uh, Friday afternoon and drink up the whole paycheck and leave the family in privation for the entire next week. Um, 
this was a really major problem in American history, alcoholism. America, from the early days of its inception, was literally awash in alcohol. And this, of course, included Puritan New England as well. Okay. Um, in 1777, we had the Battle of Ridgefield, where the uh, American army and militia faced the British invading army. Colonel Philip Burr Bradley, commander of the 5th Connecticut Regiment, submitted a bill to the state of Connecticut. And that bill was a liquor bill for the rum that the soldiers consumed. And, it's, and, and if we look at that liquor bill and how much rum that was, each soldier would have to have consumed a quart of rum in anticipation of the Battle of Ridgefield. Well, maybe that's what gave them the courage to go into the battle and fight with, 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 with wild abandon, because they did push the British back. But certainly, uh, rum, uh, use of rum was not viewed uh, as any kind of social pathology in the colonial and early national American history until you get to about 1800, and then it starts becoming more problematic. So. How does it get repealed? Now, the victory of FDR in the 1932 election was indicative of something. It was indicative that the voters were fed up with the economy, obviously. But it was also indicative of the fact that voters were fed up with prohibition. Walter Lippmann, and, and some of you, you remember Walter Lippmann, uh, wrote that uh, the country is going down the drain economically, and all the political parties can talk about is booze. Booze was a major issue in 1932 in the election. Of course, FDR won by rather a landslide. The rural Protestant areas of, of the North and the Midwest voted by and large for Hoover. But the cities and the areas with large numbers of, of Catholics, uh, uh, Jews, uh, Eastern Europeans, uh, uh, German Lutherans, uh, they voted by and large for FDR. And FDR obviously won the election, but he was a wet. He was campaigning enthusiastically for the repeal of prohibition. Well, the Congress drafted a constitutional amendment. It sailed through the two houses of Congress, two thirds in each house, and then it was sent out to the states for ratification. Now, you might think that the low church Protestants would have mobilized in 1933 to fight the repeal of prohibition on the state level. But they were so connected with the Republican Party, and the Republican Party was so thoroughly discredited that where they organized, they were terribly ineffective. So that the constitutional amendment was ratified by the requisite three-fourths of the states and many in those states liked the idea of the compromise, dry towns or dry counties. They no longer wanted a federal law, but they thought that if you gave local counties, especially in the South and in the Midwest, county governments, and towns in New England the option to go dry, that this would satisfy the desires of many of the uh, especially rural, low church uh, Protestants. So that by um, early 19, end of 1933, uh, prohibition had been repealed. I think it's important to note the history of it and the way in which surrounding issues and changing attitudes affected uh, the, 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 the legislation of prohibition and then the repeal of prohibition. 
Uh, it's important, I think, to note that um, there were certain groups that stayed with it all along. And they were very well organized. But it wasn't until the wipeout of the Republicans in 1932 that the pro-prohibition uh, elements um, lost their influence and were vote basically voted out of office. Okay, I think we can probably open it to questions for uh, Professor Cohen and, and myself. So, uh, sounds wonderful. Thank if, you. If, if you would feel the questions, um, I that would will. be really good. Oh, oh, one more comment. Is Wilson's still dry? I don't believe Wilkin is dry anymore. And okay. maybe, yeah, I don't think they are. I don't think uh, that town is anymore. But if someone We're, knows how yeah. Uh, in case I'm yeah, we when we were living in Ridgefield in the 1970s, uh, there were no good restaurants you could go to in Wilton, nor were there any inns or hotels uh, because nobody could serve liquor. Hmm. Now that may have changed. I believe I believe it has, uh, hmm. but like I said, maybe someone who is a Wiltonite or, or a local uh, can let us know in the chat. Yeah, yeah, please. We do have some questions, so I will okay. read them out. So the first one is from John. He's actually tuning in from London, England. Uh, mm. So John, thank you so much for joining us. And he asks, did gin become popular in early America as it was in London, England? N not really. You know, you're thinking of Hogarth and Gin Lane and all of that and the satirizing. No, Jim wasn't really a major factor. It was rum. And it was because rum was so easily available. It was made from uh, molasses, uh, which was brought in from Barbados. And New England had a very vigorous trade with uh, the British Isles. The, not the British Isles, excuse me. The islands in the uh, uh, Caribbean. And so uh, rum was really, and, and cider, rum and cider were the two drinks of choice. Now, Jefferson himself loved his French wines. Mm -hmm. And Jefferson went into serious debt on a number of issues. But French wines was one thing that broke Jefferson's bank. And when he died, he was insolvent and his, everything was sold off to wow. pay his debts. Oh, my goodness. Um, Jen asks, I understand drinking alcohol began because water was unsafe, but how did it go from being acceptable being acceptable to drink watered down alcohol to a means of escape and addiction? So how do, you know how mm -hmm. did we get from mm -hmm. from A to B really? Professor Cohen, can you take that one? Well, I mean, part of it would have been the sanitation movement in the 19th century, that the realization yeah. that clean drinking water was necessary and particularly that would have been happening in urban areas first you know the yes. laying of water pipes to uh places like new york city mm -hmm. so that would have been probably the middle of the 19th century and you know, um that yep. water supplies became safer that'd be part mm -hmm. of the answer i'm sure mm -hmm. i i think that's a good answer so in order to to make sure that everybody has safe water they laid these um uh, these lead water pipes which probably diminished people's IQ in the urban areas, but uh, they didn't know that at the time. Right. You know, history, the thing that's so fun about history is that it's mm -hmm. just full of unintended consequences. Yeah. And it is stranger than fiction. It certainly is. Uh, let's see, our next question. Did the blue laws prohibiting alcohol sales on Sunday have anything to do with prohibition? I think they did. Um, the blue laws were basically to enforce observance of the Sabbath in New England so that people did not do servile work. And at the time that the New England states started legislating prohibition, one of the holdovers from it after the repeal, I believe, was uh, the Sunday prohibition on, on, on selling alcohol. Mm -hmm. Am I right on that, Professor um, uh, Cohen? Yeah, I mean, uh, in Connecticut, I think a lot of it was the 
which is still a powerful force, although it's waning. Yeah. It's it's the liquor lobby. It's the, the yes. package stores. It's right. the small mom and pop package stores who didn't right. want to be open seven days a week. That's right. So that that's certainly a big part of it. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, you know, it was only recently where those laws were changed in Connecticut, where that's alcohol right. can be sold on Sundays. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yes. Um, can either of you speak on any um, sort of gangster activity happening in Connecticut? I mean, I, we know Al Capone in, um, in Chicago, and I'm sure there was a lot of uh, gangster activity mm -hmm. happening in New York City. Um, but what about in Connecticut itself? I, I'm not sure about the names of uh, gang leaders, but I do know there were gangs operating in New Haven and Hartford chiefly in the Italian-American, Irish, and Jewish communities. At one time, there, was re there really was a Jewish mafia, mm -hmm. and there was an Irish mafia, and there was an Italian mafia, and the one that really survived is the Italian mafia. Uh, but even today, you have the Russian mafia, the Albanian mafia, the Chinese mafia in major cities, especially New York, uh, because they tend to flourish among immigrant groups. Uh, they provide protection for immigrant groups, and on the other hand, extortion as well. Uh, yes, there was mob activity around here. There definitely was. Interesting. Well, um, uh, if there's any other questions, um, pop it in the chat. Um, I don't see any more <coughs> popping up, um, but um, is there anything else that you two gentlemen would would like to add about prohibition and you know it, it's interesting uh dr cone you know early on they they had prohibition and it didn't work so you know now we get into the 20s and we're thinking that prohibition is going to work where once again history is repeating itself if you mm -hmm. look back in the 1800s it's not gonna yep. work 100 years yep. later so mm -hmm. And of course, uh, of one, course. Can, one can argue, and uh, Steve will probably talk a little more about this, one can argue that it did work to an extent. Yeah. If the goal was to reduce alcohol consumption, there is a lot of evidence now that mm -hmm. it did achieve that goal, at least. It certainly did. Yeah. yeah. It was harder and harder to get the alcohol unless you had connections. Your rabbi could write you a note to get alcohol for sacramental purposes. Um, but by, and, and if you had alcohol before prohibition, you could drink it. There wasn't a ban on drinking it, there was a ban on the, ban on the manufacture and sale of it. So there were some people, uh, not exactly uh, the poor people, but pretty well off people who just bought literally tons of alcohol in anticipation of prohibition, and they had they were well supplied uh, during the the nineteen twenties. So uh, yeah, it, it was it was well, you know Tip O'Neill. Remember Tip O'Neill in the nineteen twenties. Tip O'Neill, who was a poor Irish kid from Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, was working for a catering company, and they had to cater. Uh, the Harvard commencement one year. And he was one of the boys who was there serving the food to all those people assembled. And the alcohol flowed freely. And that was the first time Tip O'Neill realized that there was a class of people in the United States of America to whom the laws simply did not apply. Um, actually, uh, we have a question here from Jen, and she asks, is it true that alcohol was served in the White House throughout Prohibition? I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, the Let's see. Um, hmm. Harding was a Methodist. Calvin Coolidge was a Congregationalist. Hoover was a Quaker. And all of those groups were opposed to uh, uh, drinking. And if that had been the case and it had ever gotten out, uh, mm -hmm. the president would have been ruined and, and perhaps dumped by his own party. So, no, uh, I don't think so. 
But then again, <laughs> yeah. I have heard there were rumors of Harding um, philandering, liking oh, cigars yeah. and cards and, and yep. drinking. But yeah, it yep. would have been hush hush. Certainly, it, it sure. wouldn't have been openly served in the White House. That would have mm -hmm. been, I think, inconceivable. Yep. Well, um, I'm going to check our chat and one more time. I don't see any new questions popping up. So uh, Dr. Cohn, Professor McGrath, thank you so much for, for sharing your knowledge and your time this evening. Well, this has been a lot of fun, I'll tell yes. you. It, it, it's always fun to do this. Absolutely. I did one on the, the, the book, The Color of the Law, last night at the uh, Avon Public Library, and we had 60 people. Wonderful. 60 people on Zoom, something like 80 signed up. We had 60 people on Zoom. Yep. And uh, I think, you know, when I led the discussion last time in person two years ago, we had about 12. But right. that's a hot topic. Mm -hmm. You see, the color, something like cover, color of law is a very hot topic right now. Yes, definitely, definitely. And, you know, honestly, that's also the beauty of, of these online lectures is that we can pull people in from all over, you know, like right. we had John from, from London, England tuning mm -hmm. in. Yeah. Oh, well, I'm taking a course with Professor, I'm actually taking a course with Professor Amy Pazorski of the Central Connecticut um, English Department. And she is the editor of the Roth Journal, the Journal of Philip Roth Studies. And she has brought in experts from all over the world who have studied and written on Philip Roth to be a part of that seminar, oh. all by Zoom. And the students, uh, I'm, I'm just taking it as an audit, uh, because the last English course I had was in 1968. But those students who are English majors, senior English majors, are getting this marvelous exposure people who have written extensively on Philip Roth. And, um, you know, Zoom is very good in that sense. It really is. I mean, the power of technology. <coughs> um, Jen asked, uh, would you, do you have any book recommendations? And I'm not sure if she means specifically yes. about prohibition, but I, let's yes. stick to prohibition. So what are some good books about Graham, do, you, do you have anything in mind? I have a few. Well, I could type in the Rohrbaugh book that I referenced. I think that's a good one. I'll type yeah. that into the chat. It's okay. it's a few years old, but it, it's a very comprehensive study. Mm -hmm. You know, Frederick Lewis Allen. Yeah, that's a good only one. Only yesterday. That's a wonderful a one. Yeah, it's a popular history of the era written in 1931. And it's a very entertaining read. And most of it still holds up. There are a couple of things I want to add to it. Um, William Luchtenberg, Leuchtenberg, actually, L-E-U-C-H-T-E-N-B-U-R-G, William Leuchtenberg, The Perils of Prosperity, 1958. Um, and uh, Oscar Handlin, H-A-N-D-L-I-N, Al Smith and His America. That's 1958 as well. And there's another really interesting one here. Uh, David Berner, B-U-R-N-E-R. -E it's entitled The Politics of Provincialism. The Politics of Provincialism. And that's 1968. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, the parallels between the 20s and the 90s, and then the, um, the whole issue that we have now, rural versus urban, uh, in, ter in terms of the party affiliations today and the, the, the rural support for Donald Trump, for example, it's really not much different. Mm. The evangelical Protestants, of course, today are not who the evangelical Protestants were then. Mostly today they are Southern Baptist, Pentecostals, and all a garden variety of uh, little sects here and there. But um, 
and and your mainline religions today, like Presbyterian, Congregational, and and uh, 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 Northern Baptist, are are basically pretty liberal. But the Methodist Church is splitting up, just like it did on the eve of the Civil War. This is a fascinating phenomenon: the fracturing of American religion over. Maybe that needs to be another, another lecture topic. That sounds, oh, yeah. That's that sounds like a good one. We yeah. actually have one more question, and we'll we'll finish out with this one. Um, is there any correlation between rehabilitation centers and the Prohibition era? No, I, I don't know if there is any. I, I really couldn't. I don't have a yeah. decent answer for that. Fran, do you have an answer for that? I, that's a hard one, yeah. yeah. I don't know if I have yeah. enough knowledge to answer that intelligibly, honestly. No, I certainly don't. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. No problem. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much. And uh, we've learned a lot about prohibition. And, you know, we, we're, we've we been doing these lectures to kind mm -hmm. of hear the audience up for our 1920s exhibit and mm -hmm. you know, learning about these different events and how they influence the 20s um, has yep. been, been incredible. So thank you yeah. both. Thank you both so much. Thank and you. Welcome. And thank yeah. you, everybody. And thank you, everyone. Fun. Yes. Take care. Thanks Good night. for joining us. And um, if you enjoyed tonight's presentation, everyone, please consider supporting the Western Historical Society with a donation or a membership. Uh, you can visit our website, westernhistoricalsociety.org. Uh, for those that are local to Western Connecticut or the surrounding area, uh, please visit the Western Historical Society. Our site is called the Coley Homestead. We're located at 104 Western Road. And you can take a self-guided tour through the property. Our buildings are closed at the moment. Um, however, However, we do have historic interpretive signs throughout the property, uh, so the weather is getting nicer. So bring the family, uh, walk the grounds, learn about the homestead and the Coley family who lived and worked there, and then have a picnic. So it's a great place to enjoy a nice uh, spring weekend. Yeah, you guys do really good work there. Keep it up. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Good night. And. Thank you. Uh, the next lecture that we have coming up in our 1920 series is The Work Must Be Done, The Women of Color and the Right to Vote. Uh, that is with guest presenters, um, Professor Brittany Yancey of Goodwin Co University and Karen Lyon Miller, research historian from the Connecticut Historical Society. So that virtual lecture is going to take place on Monday, March 22nd at 6.30, and we will be co-hosting that lecture with the League of Women Voters of West and the Weston Public Library. So you can visit our website, uh, westernhistoricalsociety.org, for the registration link. Um, and don't forget to follow us on Facebook and on Instagram to stay up to date with all of our programming. So with that, have a wonderful evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Once again, thank you, uh, Dr. Cohn and Professor McGrath, um, and take care.
some playing. Place for playing. Everybody approve. Good. Yeah, so we're set on those. Get two of those ticked off. That's great. Um, and now that this has gone off, I will put it back on. I think that's what's happening here. All was working prior. So uh, the agenda, people have it. My thought was we talk a little about Great Island, which obviously has um, advanced a lot since we last talked. Come on. Here we go. It is on now, believe it or not. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, um, cut the lights here. And we'll just, my th thoughts on Great Island aren't very structured. Um, but I thought it made great sense for us to pick up the conversation on this. Um, and see what there is that might come of our conversation. So with the town marching forward as it is, um, and I guess there's some distance to go from what this internal approval to execution, which is end of, the end of August? Um, ideally, the closing would be September 5th. There is a petition circulating uh, to get signatures to bring to a referendum. The individual circulating in. Is there still time to do that? Yeah, or there is. It? They have 30 days. Oh. My understanding is that um, the application needed to be taken within 10 days, which it was. Um, and they have 30 days to get 750 signatures. Um, I don't have a sense of the status. To get it through a referendum. To require a referendum Bar and then go to the referendum. And then, you know, it's a reasonably high bar to overturn the RTM spell. Yeah, interesting stuff. That is out there. But as far as I know, uh, the town is proceeding ahead with diligence. So. Well, it certainly is exciting. It's certainly a big event, and it certainly has a lot of um, unformed aspects, right? And I'm not talking about any of the closing aspects. I'm not privy to all the trips and traps that there may be in those. Um, but in terms of if it does close and go forward, um, what I've tried to do on the agenda is put forward some items that I think we should discuss, if only to gauge people's temperature, to know how we should interact with the um, Board of Selectmen as they go forward and the rest of the town goes forward with what do we do if this parcel of land. Um, so if ever there was an advisory you know, um, role, one would think it would involve us when it comes to coastline here. There's just a lot of aspects of the coastline that are un resolved if we should buy it. And so I, I thought let's let's bring up some of those and gauge our temperatures for interacting with the town. Uh, again, this um, highly relevant advisory assignment that we may have. Whether the, the board selectman asks us to advise or not, we should maybe think of having a view and interjecting it in the process. And so I, I um, brought up some points here, but you know maybe first just look at this map if, if None of you have seen this before. There's a coastal shoreline zone, which is number four on this. It's the light blue going around. And I'm not thinking we really have anything to do with anything except that. Um, Lori, I think a lot of this is in your zone, obviously. Not necessarily. So, Just um, to tell you what I know, which is I tell, um, if, assuming it goes through, we'll just go with the premise that it's, you know, going to happen. You know, that's what I always said with deals. The deal's over. It's never over until it's over. But assuming it happens, um, it has not yet been determined that um, the island would be designated as parkland, which yeah. would put it under yeah. the purview of the Parks and Recreation Commission. If I was a betting woman, I would say that that won't happen certainly right away. What are the alternative designations? It's just a town-owned piece of land that falls under the management of the Board of Selectmen. And Monica was quick to correct me when I used the word town park. Right. And no, nothing right. to do with a park. This is town land. It's town land. Uh, for instance, Highland Farm is not a designated town park. Uh, the nuance is once a piece of property is designated as a town park, Effectively, it's a park in perpetuity, so the town loses flexibility. The only way you can then turn around and sell that property is if you can replace it with an equal sized parcel, which for a town like Darien is very, very difficult to do. So, 
might it happen someday? Maybe. I know there's certainly people who feel it should, but I would suggest that early on the town really doesn't want to do that until they really work through Who manages everything. Highland Farm as a town property? Does the Parks, Parks and, and Recreation Department have? has been charged with the maintenance. Um, is it Ox Ridge, Ridge, Ridge Horse Field, Farm? Ridge. The big field. Oh, gosh. It's very popular. I it's see very popular. walking yeah. there every day. So the town department <coughs> manages it. They take care of the mowing and all that, but it does not fall so under the responsibility of the Park and Recreation Commission, which many people find confusing. So at this point, I would not anticipate that Great Island would be designated parkland for some fairly long amount of time until all the work can be done. Uh, if you attended any of the various public meetings, the district meetings, or the town meeting, or whatever, uh, certainly people spoke about their desire to have a separate commission formed. Yeah just for the oversight of Great Island. Again, don't know if that will happen or not, or whether it will be a committee appointed reporting to the selectmen. You know, there was some mention if that happens, that, you know, townspeople or each party could apply, they put assistance, but then there, there would be representatives from various stakeholders. Um, the Parks and Recreation Commission was certainly mentioned, and I would think that this body you know, would, you know. Would, would have a, a representative as well. Again, not my call, but yeah. if you're going to have the different commissions in town and, and different bodies that can offer insight into the different aspects of the decision making, I, I, I would think you guys would want to be doing that. But again, that's TBD. What, how, what the governance of the property will be is to, is to be determined. I, I was heartened that on this chart this map where they conceptualize sort of four zones to do things that they gave the coast its own zone yeah. and, and I actually think that was a really smart move and, and one that bespeaks its importance and I the letter I wrote to the town was sort of I really didn't do it as a commission head although I mentioned that I was the head of commission but I wrote personally how much that coastline means to me in like raising my kids. And also in the context of Long Island Sound, you know, the various shorelines we've all seen as boaters, how great a shoreline it is. So to me, is that important that it's singled out as an asset in its own right? And, and I just was, you know, I think this was done before I wrote my letter or talked to Monica about anything. So I think just someone had the foresight to see that also. Um, and I, then it speaks of a bigger task, I think, for us, hopefully, about protecting that shoreline and what to do with it and the intersections of park and rec and the town purposes. Um, so, I mean, if you, um, you know, without knowing that much more about this, what they, what they, maybe more selecting or whoever's envisioning this intent, I think they threw out a whole bunch of ideas that could happen along the shoreline. Um, I know, for example, they listed uh, potential uses, coastal ecology, a discovery walk, water sports, kayak paddle, uh, boating and sailing opportunities, fishing and clamming, uh, 1.5 miles of dramatic coastline, coastal stewardship, water quality education, climate change education, scenic overlooks, sunset island distance. So I don't know, this is sort of a laundry list of what a nice coast does, I guess, uh, <coughs> services it provides and things. Um, but I, I thought, like, specifically, um, what I think immediately falls into our uh, campus, like the access for town clamming, for fishing, um, for uh, the kayak and, and SUPs, um, and also the mooring field policy. I know that falls outside of our purview, but we have, a, I think, a, a voice to have opinions on that. Um, I don't know, so maybe, I, I just thought we could maybe lead the discussion with when you all see this in the context of the Great Island Purchase, what's jumping out at you as some of the most important things that we should be doing to advise the selectmen on protecting this or enhancing it or utilizing it best? Well, don't everybody say something at once. <laughs> Let's talk about the moorings, because I think that's actually a huge policy question that needs to get sort of addressed 
sooner rather than later in the process. The moorings in Ziegler's Cove, probably everybody knows, are privately owned right now, but functionally are a public access um, asset because everybody goes there and takes a spot. And um, but they are, I believe, close to 100 percent what I'll call transient points, which is people don't actually keep their boats on them for the summer, and they don't keep their boats on them when they're off the boat. And so one of the big forks in the road right off the bat is, are we going to let people, and again, this isn't really, this is kind of John Kena's direct responsibility, but it's something we should all be thinking about and weighing in with this selectment, I think, which is, are we going to let people keep kayaks or dinghies on Great Island that they can use to access their boats on moorings, which has the effect of turning those transient moorings into permanent moorings. And if you if you do that, you change the whole nature of Ziegler Cove very quickly, because yeah. all of a sudden there's real boats on these moorings. They're all taken up, and the, the harbor's full. Yeah. It's a parking uh, lot. And so that, <clears throat> That's something kind of right off the bat, because people are going to want to take their kayak or whatever and just use it to go back and forth. And also now you've got permanent boats on moorings. I think that's a really critical issue. Um, you know, I have very personal views on it. And effectively, it's an aquatic park. Yeah. Um, and people from all around come to enjoy it. I, I think as much as we know town moorings are needed, I, I think personally it would be a shame to lose that because so many people get so much enjoyment. And you're right, if all of a sudden those become four permanent moorings, <coughs> there's just really not a ton of room right. in there. And, and Should I put you on the speaker? We've lost something that no, no, you're right personally I'd love to see those become yeah, town yeah. public moorings, which many, many towns have public moorings. And you know, you go to Oyster Bay or Manhasset or you know, all of you crews know there's so many places we've been and then you go and you just pay your fee and you know you go and you can do some kind of reservation system you could have like an annual permit that you pay 200 bucks for the season and you go to permit too and you know on weekdays it's first come first serve the weekends it's whatever but to keep that almost a part of the park right by having, you know, having access to it, but that, that, that is a critical decision. It's absolutely I have critical. two, can I ask just two questions about the moorings? You know, is it, are they maximized? Is there room for any there's, there, there's like a 17 year wait list for a mooring in Ziegler's Cove. So Be that's my second question. So how could they become town moorings if people are already so, so it's, it's a very weird, in a sense, it's a very weird and probably not ideal setup the way it is right now because individuals own those moorings. They have to personally pay for annual maintenance costs of the moorings. They frequently don't use the moorings and frequently other people pick them up and raft on them and everything. There's no real quality control of, of the actual moorings themselves, you end up with rafted up boats frequently on those moorings that are way beyond <coughs> the likely capacity of the mooring down on the bottom. When squalls come in, and there, are, there definitely have been times in the last couple of years when squalls have come in when it was packed in there, that puts a lot of stress on those moorings. There's, there is, I think, a good argument to kind of pulling those back in. And, and because they're transient moorings, it's different in my mind than kicking someone off their mooring that they keep their boat on. These are, these are not where people keep their boats, but they're, they have first priority when they want to go to Ziegler's Cove, they can kick whoever's on there off their mooring. But it's a different thing. So you'd have to figure out with the harbor master if you were going to do that. But there certainly is 
precedent in other towns for them to have municipal moorings that can be available to the general public. Mm -hmm. I, I I can't swear to it, but I, I don't think there's a single permanent boat out there this summer. I mean, yes, been over it, enough and yeah, there's there are a couple nights, are there? there are. There's like a, a hair shop twelve and a half and a couple of small ones. There's there's nothing big, but Not much, but. but it has also been this way for ever, right? A lot of those moorings and spots are also deeded to homes. So homes on some homes. De de deeded may be a strong word, right? It's just sort of by custom. I'm pretty sure that some of the properties, Flip, you may know this, but some of the properties have it in their titles that there's a deeded mooring. I don't, um, I don't actually think that it, it's close to right, but it's not actually right. I think there's a general concept that if you have a waterfront home that you can get a mooring because of that, but it's not directly related to a certain location. So if that is the case, because I've, I've heard of it, which, but I, I don't, yeah. and I don't know, is, is there a place where these rules are all written down? Probably. Because <laughs> if you're changing these things, and if you're going to say you're going to change this, or if you're going to change the mooring field in the Roten Bay, Darien Harbor, Ziegler, Scotts, like all the Darien bodies, because you're going to put different rules in. Well, what were the rules you started with? What are the, and how are they enforceable? And right. what are the changes and why? Because I think you have to look at all of that as a whole picture. Absolutely. So, so there, I think the answer to that is that there's not really a place that these are all written down. And as a result of that, they're like clear and legally enforceable. There could be a place. Um, we just don't know where this is. No, no. <laughs> oh, no, no. Oh, no. Forward, you mean. There yeah. has intentionally, historically, not been a place. And that's why this is an advisory commission on uh, coastal waters, not a formal harbor commission. Um, if we had a har formal harbor yeah. commission, we would have a set of regulations that would spell out all that stuff. Sure. And so. There may be other ways of approaching that, just with tighter ordinances within the town. Yeah. So that, and, and because of questions like yours, which is a good question, it may be that in our future we, we, have, we work through this sort of stuff to lay out what the specific rules are. Yeah. I mean, as an aside, my, yeah, just my observations, at least this summer, is it is my understanding that no more than three boats are supposed to be rafted and I've seen way more than that and, and it's not yeah. well, it's but there's, not being enforced there's, at all. There's there's also a difference between rules right. and enforcement. Right. And there's supposed to be no wakes in Darien Harbor. Mm -hmm. And so well, one of the questions I have about because I, I really like the concept of this continuing to be a park and, it, and it's sort of de facto a park the water is that is a first come first serve um, one of the thoughts I like about converting to some if not all town mores is perhaps we can start to control a little better what's going on there when people see oh I'm just gonna hook up this buoy this casual buoy um, you know it just it keeps growing if there's you know bright yellow town moorings and there's rules spelled out um, maybe that just gets a little momentum and it's sort of... Well, he's real fun. You're not <laughs> coming to my round up <laughs> So, you know, just, just the town rules maybe get to get more enforced with a whole new set of buoys and the Marine Police Unit knowing that this is our new area and we're trying to maintain a free access park and it's, it's and we could turn down think, some of the rowdiness perhaps also. I don't think it has to be free. I think you charge, I'm making a number out, 200 bucks a season that goes into a special fund to maintain the moorings. There's no such thing as a special fund in the town. <laughs> it works in my um, Like a coffee can? Is it but, like a folder? Or whatever. Or? And then, you know, you got a little stick or something, and then, but you'd either the police or somebody would have to. Or, or it could be a per diem. I mean, or there's all whatever. sorts of different models. Yeah, there's all sorts of different models as you cruise around up and down the East Coast. You see different towns have all sorts of different, you know, different I mean, models and stuff. But this is I don't know that it should be free because the, then you can fund the cost of knowing that the tackle is good. Is, is good because you're you go in there you're going on a wing and a prayer that you're on something that's 
suitable for your boat. It's a big ball. It's got to have a big mushroom. That, yeah, that's kind of what we go with. I mean, the safety issues are only going to grow there as the public access grows. Mm -hmm. And so we should, probably should be getting out ahead of it with some sort of regulations. Which I mean, on there, there's going to be a lot more usage. And well, I'm not sure if the public access is going to get more. It's huge now. Like yeah. Fourth of July weekend. Yeah, but I mean, off, the, off the shoreline. So here's that's, oh, yeah. that's exactly the ex and this is a big issue because they're speaking about no laws. The issue of people swimming in Ziegler's Cove, which obviously it's a nice to go swimming and stuff, but people swim between boats and stuff. People are driving their boats. People have been drinking all day. It's easy not to see people in the water. And if people start swimming around to that little beach and swim back, or the issue of people being in the water in Ziegler's Cove is the same issue that we have in Darien Harbor, which is that there are some people who like to swim in Darien Harbor. And I know that because I've talked to the police about it, there are, is no actual law saying you can't swim even in a navigable channel. I saw that swim today. What? I saw that he was on a kayak. He jumped off his kayak. He was pushing the kind of pushing the kayak out of him, swimming to it, and pushing some more swimming to it, and then eventually yeah, got pushed off. It's very right easy right not to see those people, especially especially if you're not expecting them. Um, but that that is a big issue. But there's I don't think as a matter of Connecticut or federal law, there's any law that says can't swim in this area. It, it's, um, would, I guess, it, this is a work to extremes here. Would everybody on this commission be against making that a permanent harbor, like recreating Darien Harbor there, yes. and having you know, rowboats and launches? You mean well, so, I, just so the people that would be there? Are we all residents? They're, they're per, that's the, where they keep their boat. Yeah, yes. it's a, a permanent are you, birth mooring. Yes. Are you asking that just in Ziegler's or around the rest well, of the coast? That would be a secondary question, whether, yeah, whether you'd start to creep into Scott. But, but just talk about right. Ziegler's at the moment. I, I, for example, really dislike that idea. Yeah, I mean, it's, like, it, it's so small to begin with. And it's like a special place the way it is. I don't know. I mean, I've been using it as a, as a swimming destination makes the most sense. It's not, you know, we can pack it full of boats, but that, and now you, 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 you ruin the best swimming hole. And, you know, you know, it's such a special place. It's really special. It's such yeah. For its access on, on, a, on a day mooring basis. Yeah. So I mean, it's not, unless anyone thinks differently. Let, let the private citizens who have been carrying the cost of the mortgage for 30 years continue to carry the cost of the mortgage. But well, that's, that's a difference, you know. I was just trying to explore the extremes, and I think the like if John Kena, right, you know, which is, who is a great guy, but you know, theoretically, he's the state of Connecticut, comes in and says, "There's a big waitlist issue. I want to put 30 permanent boat, uh, boats more than in, in the uh, uh, I, I think we should really oppose that. I think that would be one stance. I would agree. Yeah. So and then so so that's one extreme taken but, care of. Then the other extreme might be we don't allow any moorings, or we just allow town moorings. You know, which is a, maybe we don't want to do that. So we're wondering. But these questions that you're asking, these issues, does it have anything to do with whether or not the town owns Great Island? Is it, it does, all those it does because if you don't own Great Island, people can't launch dinghies and kayaks and no stuff access. to get access that's to their boats. The so that's why it is a transient harbor right now, because there's no real access site to the boats. That protects it. So as yeah. soon as the town buys it and allows kayaks or something, then you have the issue. There's a dock right there. Can we divorce this issue from the shellfish bed issue? Because there's a bunch of beds in there, right? It's yeah. Like, I mean, it's very lame. No, the, the, beds are, the beds in Ziegler's Cove are, are not recreational beds. Because they're, they're too deep. Seasonally right. And they're only seasonally open in the winter. So not open in the summer. But, but we have the beds outside facing towards Fish Island. So those sort of are in the same. Yeah, but that's not where you those more, are not true. those don't conflict with more. That's, that's true. But we're we're talking about more traffic and then that's gonna be I think Grinnell was access to get if you have access to those shellfish beds as like a launching point from Great Island, does it open 
the door to, well, I, I get, I take my paddle board out to the shellfish bed, can I take it out to my mooring? And can I have it there, right? So I think... Well, that's that, a different issue. I haven't thought about Oh, I thought that's what you were asking. I was just thinking of, of the impact of changing the usage of the harbor on the beds, because that's going to have an impact if you bring more people in there. It's more disturbing. It's not gonna. It's not clear that's gonna. It's not clear that it's possible to bring more. <laughs> <I don't laughs> yeah. 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 It's pretty bad. Yeah. Any worse than it is now. Well, this yeah. is why it's seasonally closed because there are so many people in there, and the presumption is that there is some sort of leakage of sewage or other effluent from the boats that no. would cause the shellfish. No, no, the people, the, the boats aren't using their their. Uh, are just flushing it into the water. They're not using their holding tanks. That, 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 that. I don't think it's the people with holding tanks. Let's face it. You got six or eight center consoles wrapped it up, and they're there. They, they have no facilities, and they're there for six days. <laughs> and we all know they're drinking. Yeah. You know what's happening. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we heard CT aquaculture say this. Yeah, this is you know what's it's happening. Provision. Yeah. So, I mean, it's almost a separate issue in terms from the Great Island in terms of. <laughs> Ziegler's kind of gotten out of control. And to me, the sort of next most comparable place is Eaton Snack, where we like to go. There's no moorings in there. Yeah. So you have to anchor, and they don't allow rafting. And it's a very, you can go on weekend, I just, it's a very, very different yeah, what would experience. You, what would people think about doing that? Like, I, I've thought that, because I, I can't stand going in there post-season. Like, I, I kayak in November, and I kayak, kayak in March. And there's still all these junky moorings around. I would love to just encounter clear water. Um, and, and you know, if you know how to anchor, that's not a problem. But it's not the, as easy. The, the difference between those two, and, and maybe it's a difference that you would like, but the difference is the scope on a mooring is much shorter yep. than the scope on an anchor. So you can pack more boats on yep. moorings than you can on anchor. So I think you're also making a big assumption that, that that people know how to more or anchor. anchor. And I, I don't think I'm not making the assumption, I'm actually knowing that people don't have had my share oh. of that entertainment. Sure. On my bow. <laughs> um, so but my my point is it actually maybe keeps some of the crowds down. And I know that's not the nicest of thoughts, but it also keeps it a more pristine waterway, which is more associated with the beauty of Great Island, perhaps. I think it would create a more dangerous environment. Ha havoc. Because you have, let's say a twenty six foot center console with a six pound day hook and all rope and you know Jimmy shows up and throws it over and cracks 14 beers and you know something comes up breeze comes up and he drags or whatever it's, it's not adequate. And the, the advantage of moorings in addition to being shorter scope is you know where the moorings are so you don't have people anchoring too close it's not there's few there's fewer opportunities for user error. Yeah, the great, great salt pond is fun. One twists around and everybody's. Although I've seen it. Yes. I've seen people not be tied up in the river. Yes. Yeah. Well. But. So, but more, there's lots of complexity around the whole topic of moorings in there, and that's definitely something that we should all think about. The, 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 yeah, just one thing. If it was to all town moorings, there's maybe more control over getting those removed in the winter and having that place look nicer during some of the off season. Um, you know, my personal kind of thing, I guess. Find the beauty in the boat. <laughs> Start to enjoy it. It's got to find now. <laughs> Use a filter. Uh, well, so so I, I think this has been helpful, though. I think we, we've got some, in this room, I think, some strong opinions to keep away from uh, making that a, a permanent birthing mooring field. And we like the idea of keeping it to a day mooring field. And then there's questions about town moorings or private ownership and who gets private ownership. So I think there's a lot we'd like to inject in a committee there. Um, and then control. I think it's just better control of its safety. Yeah, and, and safety, so. Yeah. Happening there in terms but of Do we want safety. to consider permanent birthing moorings around towards Scottsville? The town needs it's the same issue no, the same. of access. No. You can't, you can't, unless you're, where do you row a boat? Well, I'm saying, if you own Great Island, you can, yeah, you it's too tidal, right. unless you're going to you can a, put it in a big dock, it's going to be tidal east. on the other side. But you could have a northeast little launch ramp or something there, um, a northeast side of, so it, I think it could be a potential problem if someone proposes that. 
And, and there's plenty of anchoring going on there. Um, that's not as mooring the ball fill. There's some um, there. There's, yeah, there's definitely there's some, like what, a dozen. Yeah, a dozen, 15. Yeah. No, I've never been in there. I think, I think we'll see more in the future. It's, it has become, in the last two years, it has become another Ziggler's. I mean, in terms of a, a nice Saturday or Sunday, it's now there's, you'll go in there and see 20 boats. You know what else is picked up, too? Is Fish Island at low tide. I always thought was sort of a ghost town. And in the past year, this summer for sure, uh, there's a lot of center consoles anchored on the west side of Fish Island, like before the shallow part that, by the big house. But yesterday, there were, there were, 25 boats anchored in there, like in, in, at dead low tide, which I sort of didn't think that you could have a ton of access, but I guess in a center console, if it's there's no way you can creep in there. Are people going ashore? Uh, we were passing from the outside, so I didn't mm -hmm. sort they of go up to the high tide. Before. Yeah, but but just like Scott, just like Scott's in the past couple of years, I think navigation's improved and the ease of navigation with you know. Your phones and better chart players, and I think people are finding those little spots that were could quiet also, for a long time. Could also be Ziegler's is so darn packed. <clears throat> Maybe it's just big expanded overflow. Yeah. But you just can't get in if you don't get there by ten or ten. You just can't get in. Yeah, we gave up going to it some years ago because of that. Still yeah. like it as much. It's just too busy. Yeah. Weekends. Could you want to? We consider maybe <clears throat> like having a kayak launch off one side of the island away from the Ziggler's and the boat mooring and try to concentrate people in one area and then keep the motor boat on the other side. I was yeah. just going to switch to the perfect segue. Um, there's definitely thoughts of adding a kayak rack at the little darn bird. Um, you see the uh, beach area? That's labeled kayak rack. When people see that above the number one, the commons, you know where they have the two little beach houses and there's a sweet little horseshoe beach. They're labeling that kayak launch. So I mean, I get concerned about that. Where, where's, does that mean everyone's going to start launching from there and streaming to Fish Island, and and then you've got that intersection of kayaks and boats? Um, do, do we want to think about the wisdom of that at all? Well, then there's a, a related question of. Kayak launching versus kayak rack, because it's one thing seems to me to be able to launch your kayak and bring it in, bring it, take it away with your car. It's another thing to have. You know, we'll end up with the same racks that we have at the boat club right now, mm -hmm. just storing plastic um, and marring the. It's a bit my right. personal view, marring the. Yeah. Um, natural beauty of the area if we have the racks. Yeah. We have that a pear tree and a weed now. Yeah. I, and I, I'm a kayaker, love kayaking, but I so agree with that. You know, the boats just instantly go up. You build another 10 racks, that they instantly get filled, and what do you have but a bunch of bright colored plastic? That's the you know, thing sticking like that. Yeah. It's sort of incredible. Um, and certainly, if you put them on the shore, it takes that nice little beach, which if you go by, you sort of I always find it sort of like quiets you down. You just think I'd love to sit there and have a pina colada all day, you know? But if it's going to be all bright colored plastic, it'll just lose that. Um, I mean, how many people ride horses? You could probably fill you know, the entire place with a couple thousand kayaks. And just, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Is it that close to the water now? Yeah. But the town could buy like dollies, you know, could have a dozen dollies for, and put the racks back in, in the mind. woods. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's something that, you know, because I, I think that is part of the coastline that you see right on the edge, even though in some ways it's park and rec territory. No, but, you know, we've got them at Weed Beach. They keep expanding. We have a lottery every year. We can't get them. And I, I'm kind of in the view of they distract from right. the beauty. But I've heard other people say, oh, I just think they're really pretty. The colors are bright and cheerful yeah, and like summery. And <laughs> so, you know. Is, is, there, is there, too, like a safety issue? For having kayaks in a remote, uh, kayaks, paddle boards, whatever they are, in a remote area like that, like the boat club or or Weed Beach or Pear Tree, like has some just genuine steady traffic all the time, right? And like the boat club, the the kayaks and the racks are near the boat club. 
maybe you tell someone you're going out, maybe you're not. If there's a kayak and a paddleboard launch ramp on the other side of Ziegler's, and it's a spring or a fall day, yes, you're supposed to be mindful of yourself and tell someone you're going out or not, but it's a lot more exposed. It's a lot more risky to be out there. And what if you go out and you have less likely of coming back, right? I mean, there's less foot traffic. There's less people observing you. On a think 4th of July weekend, there's a lot of traffic for, for eyes, but that's not always the case. Actually, the, the entire coastline poses that question a little. Think of all the kids swimming off the rocks. I mean, if I was a teenager, I'd get down day one and start swimming off the rocks there. And I wonder how that's controlled. Yeah. But here's our purview's perhaps more on the boating side. And I yeah. agree with you. It's a good question. I don't know. This could be a, a good way to deter that from that area because there's just not a lot of eyes or it's too remote. I, I worried particularly about the, what I mentioned earlier, that the stream of traffic that might go immediately from that launch point right to Fish Island. And there's sort of an expanse there where you can have a lot of boat traffic, and I think it you know, isn't the best. The, the motorboats are sometimes zooming in at pretty high speed. Uh -huh. um, it's the same thing coming summer. out of Five Mile River, though, right? I mean, that's where they're all coming from today. And you got a lot of boat yeah, but they can, they can stick close to the shore. Here they do a little bit of a, a stretch across to the Fish Island. There, there's there's a, a lot of yeah. kayaks out in the middle of nowhere these days. Yes. I mean, honestly, it's, I see people kayaking out to Green's Ledge Light. And, they're everywhere already. Yeah. It's true. Um, but I think, you know, I, I just wonder how, like, with the kayak rack signs, how we maybe amplify a message for, for just what you're mentioning. Um, you know, you're, you're in a harder zone to, to navigate if you're, if you're not that skilled to kayak for here, rather than stick in the harbor where no matter what happens, the wind probably blows you back at the beach. Just don't put them there. <laughs> don't put the rack there. Don't put the access there. Well, that's where I am with the moorings and the clean water. Yeah. <laughs> that's <laughs> different views. No, no, I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> no. But there's also the question, Philip, you brought it up, I thought it was great about fishing. Um, and that's bound to be a big usage. Well, there's, there's a, a couple of related issues, and Parks and Rec already addresses them in some of what I think thought were parks. I don't know if it's a park, as a matter of fact. But um, So, I mean, there is a lot of good fishing areas off the eastern side of Great Island. And that will be an attractive asset to people who like to fish. But a lot of that occurs at nighttime. And so, you know, and, and yet many of the parks kind of close at night. And, and there's also picnicking and sunsets and all the, you know, you can imagine people having grill barbecues or something out on some of these promontories that look over Scott's Cove. And that could be a real positive thing but it get all of those things get into people being out on Great Island at night, which has all of the obvious complexities to it of policing it, cleaning it, you know, making sure it's not kids with parties, and, and so how do you how do you balance all of that and to get the most use out of the asset, but do it in a controlled way? The beaches. The, the gates get locked at 10. Um, police and driveways, pear trees is wide open. They can see, um, we're having a lot of issues this summer um, with after hours activities. Of people, like right, and so this yeah, is weed or pear tree. Yeah, but if you think about it, this would take that. Yeah. Maybe we'll get the next <laughs> level of order magnitude. But, but it's also some of the best asset that the place has, I mean, and so how do you not throw the baby out with the bathwater? Yeah. I think the other thing that I, I think it was mentioned in the meeting, the town meeting too, but like, I'd really like to see there be stricter policies on access to the property for town residents. Town residents, all day long, same as the pear tree, the beach permit, whatever, it's a park, it's great. But if you're not from town, 
you're not paying for it. So I don't. I think it should be more difficult for non-townspeople to get it. I don't know if I agree with that. I, I mean, I live near Waverly Park, which is kind of like this without a shoreline, and I go there all the time. And I walk my dog, and we ride bikes there. And I've heard the same argument from McCain about you know, trying to control access. And, I don't know, it's really any different than Central Park or anything else. I mean, it's, it's an idea. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, I don't know. I, I, I think there's certainly an element of when you have a small beach, if you open that up to a wide group, it becomes overwhelmed you know, so quickly that it's hard to do that. But I think you're seeing that at our beaches now. People are taking Quimbers down. Um, Near Water Lane and being dropped off and walking in, who aren't town people. And it's, but it's, there's a lot of legal complexity yeah. too. Um, I'm sure there are federal it's, laws about being able I mean, to access. I mean, like real yeah. legal complexity. Yeah. yeah. And there's uh, the last few years, there's been um, activity in Hartford to um, access. Well, now we're going to access because there is that we're required to provide access, but um, there's differential fees for residents and non-residents with the thinking that it's town residents are paying for the upkeep and the maintenance and all of that. Um, but there's there's been proposed legislation which hasn't gone anywhere yet um, in terms of really not being able to charge differential fees and things of that nature. So, um, and it, but it really, you know, the issue becomes is, and most of the time, we have finite parking. Very often the road, the, the roads accessing them, you know, the residential neighborhoods, um, which, you know, Limited or no sidewalks. There's limited parking, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So it, they're really they're very tricky issues. Yeah. It's, they're they're very tricky a, issues. A big seasonal model out there. I mean, if you look at uh, Greenwich Point or um, Byron Park, I, I've done, I do a lot of kayaking in the off season where I go to places I can't in the on season, um, and I sort of feel like I have access just you know the other two thirds of the year. Mm -hmm. I, mean, that, that, I would assume that's going to be adopted here, some sort of approach. Well, that's, I mean, that's the case. I mean, the beaches now, you know, we only charge the parking fee, you know, the, you know, the summer season. I mean, I, li I like that in some sense, and I think that, that provides, like, uh, different people can come and fish from, from um, Great Island in the off-season, but maybe not in a busy summer. Um, I don't know. A lot of this, this feels to me to be out of our hands. Bigger, bigger well, it's it's almost. Um, I think there are a lot of considerations on on these things that tend to push you towards limiting the hours, limiting the access. I mean, it's certainly from the security and garbage and everything else. Clamping down on these things is sort of the easy way to go, and might be the right way to go, but. I guess the question for us to think about in, in the capacity sort of as advocates for fishermen, for clamors, for whatever pe people who want to be and enjoying the coastline is, should we be kind of a voice saying, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, let's figure out something that works to give people access to this? Because, you know, we're, when you start to say, okay, we're not going to do those things, you you kind of quickly get down to, well, this is going to be a great like walking trail, and that's all we're doing. Yeah. Right? Well, I mean, if we, we think about wanting to educate and get more people involved who give a darn about the coastline, you have to have them experience it. And I don't care if they're, what, what town they're from, right? I mean, I just, I think we want to attract people to use the, the shoreline in, in the right way. And that's really, that, that's the ideal objective. <coughs> we need to think about that. You know, we don't want to create an unsafe situation where you've got kayakers, you know, totally blocking very highly trafficked <coughs> powerboat areas. But, but I, I do think we want people to enjoy the, the shoreline. That's, that's I, I, swim, That's why we're doing this. I, I, I so agree with those statements. I swing to our clamming beds where I think we've got this like real tool to do that very strongly. 
and I wonder how we can amp up our effort. Like D David, you've been such a, uh, a backer of let's expand the amount of people getting shellfish licenses. It's just a simple thing. You can measure it every year. Um, now we actually can have people not, they don't have to have a boat or a kayak, they can walk literally to the side of the clammy beds. As long as it's wide open. Now, yeah. now all we have to do is have open beds. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that, that is another topic I've come to in about five minutes. I've got that, I've got that map. <laughs> but, but to me, that's like a the first lead here is, is how do we, what, what do we do there? What, what can we proactively do? It just, um, it, it can ex just uh, do and, all of what you're saying. And there is just, I, I don't know if you all have actually been to Great Island and had a chance to walk around it, but there is, in talking about the kayaks, there is a, what I will generously call a beach on the north side of Great Island also, a little cove. It's certainly tidal and stuff like that, but you could imagine saying, use that for the kayaks to get in and out of the water. And because it, put, it doesn't put them into the Ziegler's traffic, it puts them in Scott's Cove. Puts them into the, around the corner in Scott's Cove. And then it says that one, but literally at our clamming beds on that outside of Great Island, there's a little horseshoe beach also. It's yes. Maybe just 20 feet or 30 yeah, feet that, across. That one has more um, Spartina grass. Yep, kind of, yep. This one around the corner oh, no, has actually, more like directly in. The Spartina grass, when I was, wasn't talking about that, now just go one northward. It's a little diagonal, oh, one okay. with two rocks on both sides. And it go, literally you can wade off that into our beds. And we'll yeah, yeah, I know what you're Yeah, um, just that launch there, no way. I, I knew so there are, but best. just, I guess the point I'm trying to make is there are other options yeah. for kayaks and paddle boards other than right at that little beach with a, with a hut. I mean, the trick's going to be balancing access and preserving the ecology. But that's, that's really going to be the balance, because what's so special about the property, if you have the chance to go on it, I was just blown away. I mean, I kind of thought I knew what it would be like. It so far exceeded anything I expected. And, and but it's because it's been un effectively underutilized for 100 years, because there is such limited access to it, and it's so pristine. And that's the, that's the beauty and the wonder of it. But yet we want people to get on it, but we don't want to be like tromped and ruined and the shellfish beds ruined. So that, that's going to be the challenge for the town, is really ba is balancing that. How, how big a, um, I'm just curious if people have a sense from like the town meetings and, and just talking to friends at parties and things, how big a movement do you think in town is there keep it pristine? Don't, don't do more of it, do less of it. Do you, That's do you think? my sense that more people are swayed that way. Yeah. If the town goes slowly and not overdevelop it and keep it natural. Not everybody, but I'd say conversation I'm having with people are more swinging that way. And I don't know if it's whether they want the pristine or whether they just don't want the town to spend a lot more money on building stuff. But <laughs> um, I think more people are like, you know, just pr preserve the tree canopy and. Well, there's, there's also more, a lot more of what I'm hearing. There's also a lot of different gradations in those two different definitions. So, I mean, there's the extreme of, oh, we need a new pool, we need a new ice rink, we need all that, which involves a lot of construction, parking space, all that. But then, you know, is it literally just a walking trail? Is Can you have little, prom on the promontories, little overlook sites with grills. I mean, you can, there are ways to develop it more intensively, like along the lines of what we're probably all thinking about for our uses, that are, that are not building big structures. Um, so there's a lot of shades of gray in there, I think. Well, I, I think, I clearly hearing people have opinions on this. We, we ought to find a way in, to interject our voice into whatever process is going forward, whether it be a committee or something. So, um, I mean, on, on my part, I'm going to keep on uh, speaking with Monica to try to ha have us have that voice. I, I don't know what the process is going to be, um, but I've been talking for um, several times on this, and I'll continue saying we've discussed it and we've got views on things. Um, and it's not for us to figure all those views out right now, but I'm not hearing everyone say, oh, it's just going fine. No, we, we've got some views on how things should be shaped going forward. So I'll try to have us have that voice at the table. 
Um, and, and I suspect, Flip, you've got as much um, access to some decision makers as anybody. Um, and Laurie, wherever you think we might inject them, all ears to try to figure it out. Yeah, no, I, as I said, my, my view, this is my view, is that as whatever governing body is created, that, you know, as different appointees are coming from various, I would just whisper about so we should have representation. Yeah. So, sorry, Bill. Thanks, Dr. Sanos. So, um, Incidentally, as an aside here, um, the shellfish grounds of we switch the switch to self shellfish. The shellfish grounds, I understand, are not being sold with the land. The shellfish grounds belong to the uh, off this island belong to the um, Zieglers, and those aren't part of the Steincrafts. And there's been some discussion about whether they could go, and I don't think that has. Um, gotten any traction. I've had some discussions with people about that. Um, but, but if we can switch to shellfish as a topic, because um, there's plenty to talk about there. And just like before we do, I, I just wanted to put a suggestion out here. Would it make sense for us to take the, either a tour of the island or, or go around the outside by boat and see it? I mean, you know, you talk, you talk about these beaches and stuff, and I, I've been in the general area, but I'm not sure I... I understand what's what, and I, I think if we had an opinion, regardless of how the governance of the island ends up happening in the town, if we had an opinion of like what's really important on that shoreline that we it's great. Uh, we think should not be disturbed, or if we just had you know, five things, hey, here's what we'd like to see not happen. I, I think that would be it. Would be good to have that defined. The best way to see it is to walk it. That you you see. Mm -hmm. Having done both, it, you see it much better, kind of by walking around the perimeter. Then, because you're always a little bit, because there's so many rocks. Yeah, uh, you're always a little bit off if you're on the boat. Mm -hmm. So the broker was giving tours. There were many, many tours that were conducted. Um, they're mostly for RTM members because these people are going to be voting on it and whatever. Um, you know, I had the opportunity, and some of my other commissioners had the opportunity to go. I don't know they're still conducting them, but. No, I think you could. Well, maybe could ask. go and ask. Yeah, but you could ask whether they could schedule. Mm -hmm. I'll a come time back to you. I'll try to do that. Members to have, but, um, Jennifer, the, you know, a kayak. Around. It could be a good way, and I have a kayak at my house. It's not there, but it's not that far from there. Yeah. Um, if you wanted, but if we're to get someone to give us a little walk, if you can, yeah. 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 Let me let me give that a try because yeah. I think it's a great idea. Yeah. So. Um, so I think I heard that the, the broker had given over 100 tours. I mean, she's. She can give one more, right? Yeah. She's going to make all mine. Um, so. Um, I'm going to explain what we had <laughs> just very quickly. And sure. then I'll put on up here what we, where we are now. Um, so we, we had a talk with uh, CT Aquaculture uh, the other day. If you all don't know it, our shellfish beds have been closed. So the recreational beds are the purple areas here. This purple area is not suitable for recreational shellfishing. So let's forget about that. What, what do you mean by that? Uh, there's too much wave action, so okay. clams couldn't. Um, Kind of but essentially. Why did, would they ever change that de designation? Because it's it's ridiculous. You, you could never claim that. I think that's right. Um, anyway, so the primary places that you can claim in Darien are this Great Island bed right here. Just what we're seeing. There's closures to all in. Right here. That yellow. Yeah. 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 Okay. And I'm these sorry. are and these orange pieces are what are seasonally open, but I don't think anybody really uses that. Mm -hmm. The Contentment Island bed is useful. This bed here, the Fish Island Bar bed, is partially useful. There's a bit of current that kind of rips through here. And so that's not good for clamming. But if you get kind of closer to the little float line that exists, I think we've all found some clams and oysters in there. But yeah, it's, and then the big part of it has a float line yeah. that's here. And, and people don't go in there because it looks like it's private property, even though it's not. No. So that's a kettle of fish for um, yeah, a different day. A, a, another day. 
But so what's happened here in, in Scott's Cove is that they've had some negative readings um, after particularly large rains, which have caused them to reclassify these two beds and kind of create a new line that goes across here. And here to say that this is, so there's red, which is kind of permanently closed. And then there's yellow, which is, or green, which is restricted relay, which means you could take clams uh, out of there and then put them somewhere else to allow them to decorate and harvest them. Um, David, you could refer people to the chart here. Okay. So it's changed from all being an open ocean into up here. So now this area restricted relay. So everything down. in green there is now restricted uh, relay, which essentially closes these two beds um, and leaves us with basically zero recreational planning. Well, yeah, they, they said it's restricted relay. So if if it was open, you would now have to take your clams and let them sit some for two, somewhere for two weeks. Which and I think that's not climate. something that we yeah. allow or encourage. Uh, well, that's why it's green. To, yeah, to that's it. why it's green. But then they did more than that. They put cross hatches, which means it's closed. And this area is closed too. And this area is closed. And this area is closed. They've closed everything. And this is the Connecticut the water is not clean enough. They, they're, they've gotten some negative, um, some readings showing increased bacterial counts. Um, and so um, there are some questions as to whether um, those two beds could be opened. Um, Bill and I had a conversation with Alicia from the Department the list, of Agriculture. Dragon, yeah. yeah. She's, taking, she's taking over um, the prior woman. I was just about to say. Kristen? Kristen. Yeah. And um, it was a really interesting conversation. Some of it was. We don't have enough resources. We can't do the right job. Some of it was, for three years, we've been getting bad readings at these various sites, and we've kept you guys open. We've, we've allowed you to keep doing your thing in, in this big water. Um, but they had an FDA uh, meeting. Literally, FDA governs this. And the FDA was flying in. Sounds like she was cramming for an exam, basically, and trying to get all her work together for the FDA. And it's like, whoops. Whoops. Better whoops, close this off before I get in trouble. Yeah. I think the only reason we found out about this is someone who um, had emailed me about our recreational beds maybe four years ago took that email and emailed me back and said, Hey David, why are all these beds closed? It like, closed literally overnight. And right? so then I called the shellfish hotline myself, and it said they're closed. And I'm like, hmm, well, that's kind of weird. Um, <laughs> well, in some sense, that, that that's the bad news, though, that she was reacting to, her, if you will, a bureaucratic visit. Um, but on the other hand, she's doing her job. It's not yeah. passing, not passing muster. So it's like, well, maybe it's good that they're closed. And the other thing is she was trying to be, they were trying to be lenient with us for three years because they wondered about if the readings were adequate because they weren't coming back enough. Um, and basically the rule is if they get 10% bad readings over a course of a year, and then is it over three years or no? I think it's just 10% in a year, they have to close it. So I can't like, remember the exact rule. I think our threshold for rain for a closure was three inches previously. And three inches of rain is just like a rain. monsoon. Yeah. And so there have been a few monsoons over the course of the past you know, few years. And I think her idea is to allow it to be reopened under a lower threshold that might like be one inch inch or two inches, where you'd have more periodic closures during the year, but at least you could get in there. Um, but she's got some additional work she needs to do to be able to yeah. feel she has enough facts to make that case to the FDA. And she said the FDA may not accept it and may say we need to survey all our all our coastline, all our shellfish beds and coastline, not, not stop at the areas we use. There was a bit of debate in some email exchanges about the cause of these failures. And um, I think the Department of Aquaculture um, takes the view that there's been increased development in Scott Cove and that that contributes to septic leakage from septic systems being on top of lead ledge rock. Um, there was someone taking the other side of that. Um, and it, it, so I, 
I don't know. There's, but it's, but it's there's, not, that's a real political hot potato. Yeah, and it's, not, it's not help in CC Deep's viewpoint that they can't get access to the properties in Scott Cove, nor on Contentment Island. And she mentioned that we may never be able to get this conditionally approved if we can't get some access to some of those lands for testing. I'm not sure if that's ever going to change for us. So that's a David Knopf town question. So what, one of the things she said she would try to do for us is get conditional approval based on like a one or two inch rainfall, quicker trigger. But she noted maybe I'll, she wouldn't be able to get there, FDA wouldn't accept it uh, if she didn't have the shore-based testing and, and or this survey of the grounds. And in that case, she said- Is she, she trying to look at, is she trying to get access to actually physically sample, or is she trying to look at the septic fields themselves in the house? I'm not, I'm not quite sure. I mean, it's common. I think but she mentioned having visited this one of the sites many years earlier, and somebody's loafer went into some uh, you know, kind of septic that was bubbling up to the surface, and um, that was as good a sign as any that there was a failure. Um, whether that still exists or not, I have no idea. But if, if they can't get the ground surveyed in the FDA box, um, she, could, she said it could be a year or more. It's just things. My posture to her was, what can we do to help? And so uh, I, I'd like to go out over on her boat. She brings a boat down and does her testing. So I, I said, when you get the next date, I, I'm in. You know. And if any, you, would you like to join? We'd love to have you there. It's always interesting to talk to them. I mean, you learn a ton be, be, being out with them, and, and they know, you know, ten times more than the one. And, and they're protecting um, everyone on the coast from getting sick, so it's hard to like just want to yeah. bash them for closing our grounds because this is how we're protecting our citizens. So, but but then when you hear of some of this, some of it is bureaucratic and human resource lack of human resources at CTD, you, you, know, you wonder how much of this is artificial and how much is real. Um, and so I, one, one thing I suggested, could we help with the actual monitoring if you don't have enough people to monitor? And she said perhaps you could be some of the people who took um, samples for us after rainfall events. So they can't, like if you have a two inch rain, they can't shoot down there in a boat. They have other places to go and things to do. But we could take a sample for them. And I, that may be something we could help ourselves get conditionally approved on. So, some, some hope there. So I've offered our services to do that. Um, and we'll come back to you all, because uh, I know you've got a variety of boats. And maybe we can all work out some sort of schedule on being on call to wait for a rainstorm and rushing out um, with our boats and taking, I don't know what you do, you just take one sample and mail it to them? I'm not quite sure. You know, um, it's yeah. something that most of the other shellfish commissions do very routinely throughout the course of the year. There is a, you know, I mean, CT Deep has, uh, the Department of Aquaculture, and you've been up there with me, right? I mean, yeah. they have this huge lab, and they are yeah. every day testing water samples from, that are sent to them by other shellfish commissions, and they're also frequently testing the meats. I guess they you know, need to test for bacterial content within the actual shellfish. Uh, I don't know if we aren't doing that since we aren't a formal shellfish commission. I never really understood the distinction of why they are doing the testing for us. It's supposed most to be other. doing that for the last five years. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I didn't, you know. Do, do, you, do you send them the samples, or do they get picked up? Or Because uh, there's got to... I think they have to go on. I sense... I, was just I don't know the whole protocol. Yeah. I don't know how they get to Milford. I have, I have no clue. But they even test for DNA, so they can tell different strains of diseases going through the shellfish and things like that. But I mean, I was out there last weekend, and there were people claiming um, in the Great Island Bay. No, that's the same. Yeah. There's no, there's no enforcement. Of yeah. Well, here, here if we stomach bug, will be even enforcement. Yeah. 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 So here's a case where the states come in and, you know, probably beneficially 
dictating something to us. But I, I really think it behooves us to figure out a way to, if it's a manpower issue with them, you know, supplement their manpower and take some control back of our of our situation if it's warranted. Who, who wants to open this thing if it's not warranted? But if it is, and if it's just sort of these bureaucratic and testing procedures, let's get in the game and see what we can't do here to keep our beds open. And that goes on expand, with expanding the use of the beds with the purchase of Great Island and really you know, being a, that being a leading tool to get people to the water. And so I think this is a big opportunity for us, even though it's pretty discouraging at the outset. So I'm going to come back to you guys and maybe we have some motorboats poised in different months with rain events and we scoop test tubes in Malamoc or something. I don't know. But I'll come back to you if, if she's going to take us up on that with what might work. I think there's just some element of being proactive with them. I've always had the sense that they're kind of overwhelmed, right? Um, yeah. And um, so uh, being um, in front of them on this certainly couldn't hurt. But on this point, um, Eric Barrett is either in the process or just has recently moved to Norwalk. So, you know, he's been acting as our shellfish commissioner, not our official commissioner. Um, but uh, he'll, he'll be phasing out of that, as uh, also out of the commission because of the, the move. Um, David was our shellfish commission guy and commissioner in the past. Um, maybe one of you want to step up for that or we sort of parcel the role out in different things or maybe we all just have more involvement in the, in the subject matter. It's, a, I think, a great area for us to execute. Uh, let's see. Um, the only other thing I had was uh, some work we've been trying to do on the water quality side um, with social media. I don't know. Has, has anyone seen um, any of the Darien Patch posts that um, I've put out with uh, Julie's help also? Maybe not. I saw one of them. That's what you mentioned. Yeah, thank you. Um, kind of like a typing is. I guess that one you sent to us. I sent the one with the um, dolphins, but I don't know if I sent the actual article. I, I think I might have written that one. I've seen something with a picture of you too, so. Um, okay. Of course, I wrote in the wrong thing. For those who hadn't, I'll just quickly bring them up if I can. What am I doing wrong? That's been stupid. Um, that church is in Norway. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So community news and Darren see we just <laughs> that's not our church. So so here's one we put up on if you guys are seeing it. Coastal water sampling days after dolphins signed off long neck. Well it's discouraging to have something nice news with Hank Warnick's um, uh, picture of the dolphins, and then a couple weeks later, the shellfish beds are closed. Um, quite frankly, but um, the, the Darien Men's Association, you know, is a big help in this. And, and in this case, it was all Darien Men's Association guys going out. There was four of them, I think. Um, and I grabbed Hank's picture, which Flip sent on me because I just thought it was, you know, marvelous. Why are we doing this? This is part of the reason because we're trying to have clean water. Um, but just had a little blurb, one paragraph right up and brought some pictures into the element. Good. You know, we, while it's great to publicize clean water, I'm struck by the, that if there are people who are clamming on closed shellfish pens, that maybe there should be some mention, well, though it's not positive news, that the beds are closed and you shouldn't be um, harvesting. Well, that, that, and that, I, I agree. That's where I went. Actually, two, two weeks ago, I just I just posted three weeks ago or four weeks ago the Dolphins article with these nice pictures of guys doing their job. And then the shellfish beds closed. And I'm sitting and wondering, how to, what's the segue here? Um, but I guess that there's the up, like the economy, there's ups and downs, and you broadcast it all. Yeah, and try to get better fun. longer term, but we, you know, we got it down. Well, we're, we're testing tomorrow, and I was thinking of throwing something out with the shellfish bank closure map. Um, I don't know, Julie, what you might think of that. I, I think maybe two how we blend it in. Yeah. You know. I'm not sure posting it together is great. A little bit 
but we, we've tried this. So this this one we did, and then um, another one here. Um, trouble working this computer. It's new and. Uh, <laughs> it's like the Empire State Building. <laughs> and there was uh, just another one, just maybe this is one I sent around that were in full swing. Just to give a sample, you know, I'm just trying to get us some fanfare as an overly shot, focusing too much on me, sorry. Um, there's some of the guys and Julie um, with the equipment. Just trying to get some public consciousness about us doing sampling. And it's you know, a lead for having people say, hey, let's go down to the water and take a look. Um, and we're trying to do something like you know, every two weeks when we go out and sample. We, we've tried to get the town social media person involved. Um, we haven't had a response from her. We had initial, uh, yeah, initial session with her, and then it hasn't seemed to go anywhere. I'm not sure if she's you know, totally consumed with Great Island or other efforts. But we sort of taken it on ourselves just to do it on the patch for the moment. We'd like to do more on the town's website. Maybe that's where we'll get in a month or two, I'm not sure, with the town maybe being more helpful on it. I don't know. But. Yeah, well, I mean, I think Dean is right that we need to go see on the climbing beds probably sooner rather than later, so we don't have to go in the hospital. Or, right? So that should go on the patch as well as the town website, I think. There is the shellfish hotline that you're supposed to call, but honestly, I wouldn't even think to call it absent a big rain event because well, yeah, we're open. open. Yeah. Oh, well, here we are. With, is, you know, is, there a, is there an email uh, database of the people that have shellfish licenses? Yes. That you could, you know, because it's not a huge. That would be a David Knopf. That, that's job. who it lies with, our health director. Yeah. Um, but, you know, Think of all his dudes. He, he's not a kosher focus guy. He's trying to make sure the restaurants in town are are, are safe. I mean, he's got his hands full. And I, I think this is where if we build up more you know, reputation on this, we might be looked to for more of this type of notification. But I think it would be worthwhile to mention to him that probably I think that that's closed. That we have some obligation to let people yeah, yeah. Right. Have the beaches been closed? Like once. Has so it? Far in the summer. It's early in the summer? Kind of early. Well, when did we have that inch of rain? It was over an inch of rain. That was, feels like that was a month or Ever, ago. Forever but, ago? Yeah. 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 Okay, I can't remember what rain is. <laughs> It'd be great. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, I said like maybe a month ago. Yeah, okay. I was just curious. Yeah. What was interesting with everybody on Fourth of July weekend, I was kayaking through Scott and Zegos. So many people swimming. And I just literally learned that all the talk is different. Also, the Unified Water Study has been testing that water, and it doesn't do bacteria. And I'm sort of like, well, maybe that's been a mess. We should be doing bacteria every time. Um, it, it's sort of lo it's longer term about where oxygen is and chlorophyll. And, um, so, um, you know, it, again, I think we relying on the state for this stuff, and, and maybe we all should be generating more of the info right here. Isn't the health department testing the water for the bacterial count? The it, in different oh. areas. They okay. test near the beach. Yeah. focused, yeah. And they, they're, a lot of them just rely on rain count. They don't have the people also. The rain count's actually meant to be pretty accurate. Um, once, once you get an understanding about how it works, and um, you know, in terms of your testing, and you see an inch of rain, and you know, now you test for the third time after an inch of rain, it's always bad bacteria. They, they stop testing and just make the rule of one inch. Yeah, you know, and, and then there's a 24 hour cooling dilution period, and it's fine. Well, anyway, I think, um, uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll put out a post on just the closures. I think that, that's a good thing. And we'll probably separate from what you post. Yeah. Yeah. You're, are you, you're not going to um, touch the third rail of what is the cause of the pollution? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, that's more than the third rail. Um, yeah, yeah I, I agree. You know, it, it's there's a whole advocacy that one, one could undertake on this stuff, and it does have to do with septics. And then you, you actually 
the city aquaculture person, I thought, phrased it well. You, you, you swing away from the town, really, and you, you get to the uh, state government and, and their need to push um, rules for latest technologies for septic systems. And on Long Island, they do that massively. There's, there's quite an effort. Um, but Connecticut's a void of any laws about latest technologies. And um, so I think we're all in compliance here. David Nosman strongly pointed that. But we're not being forced to go to a higher level and make that across state. And with state funds and infrastructure funds that might flow through the federal government down to help with that type of stuff. Yeah, there's, there's not a lot of federal money or state money to do that anywhere. It seems to me that either to actually replace all the septic fields, it's like it's huge. Yeah. gazillions of dollars, and they're just chipping away on it at the margin right now. It's, it's not really being actually addressed anywhere. It's interesting because we've gotten so much money um, through Long Island Sound um, study, you know, the EPA. Um, um, organization through Murphy and Blumenthal recently. It's just right. some of to, to replace the septic field. No, no, they, they have billions. Of yeah, but you, but, but you wonder if they might have leaned that way uh, for initial phase in projects and funding or something, but nothing mentioned at all. It's a little bit of a discouraging area. It's sort of like uh, you know, climate change stuff. You're sort of like, okay, I'll buy a Prius, but what good is it going to do if the, you know, the problem's so large? Uh, I still have a boat that gets one mile killed. <laughs> well, um, listen, that was it for, for me. Is there other business people would like to bring up? Um, the one thing I would just add to one of the projects that we've kind of had on the front burner, back burner, front burner, the reviewing our mooring standards for dairy and harbor. That talking with John Kena, that, that definitely is something that we will get to probably in the fall and winter, uh, but it's, it's definitely something that we should collectively do, and he's looking forward to our input and assistance. He, he's got, it feels to me, um, bigger fish frying. Um, <laughs> yeah. He's, yeah, he's, in, in some ways, I think he's, uh, you know, raced ahead of us and, and is into details and players that we haven't had reach with, and he's got a big bull by the horns. And, I don't know how we can quite get help him on some of the stuff. He's well, I think the things it. he's grappling with are squarely within the Harbor Master's purview and not within our purview necessarily. Yeah. Is this like the, the waiting list? Yeah, he's, the he's spending, he, he definitely right now is, I don't want to speak for him, but he's spending a lot of time trying to understand who actually is on, on the moorings in the Harbor, who is actually on the wait list, you know, and he's just trying to get a good sense of what's actually happening out there in the field. The Can I ask one question? Is, is there any requirement of having a currently registered boat uh, on a mooring? If you had an expired registration, would that be inappropriate? <laughs> well, I think you're in trouble then, because I think you have to have a registration and insurance, and you have to submit those to the normal master to get your, your uh, mooring. Because I can think of one in particular that I've passed that's many years out of registration. Um, There's, um, I think to what Grant was asking earlier, there's the past practice and then there's when you say, is there any actual requirement? This is not always as clear what the yeah. requirements are relative to how has it been done in the past. Okay, got it. On a personal note, I have spent a lot of time at DMV this year working on boat registrations and stuff like that for projects and things. And the new appointment system at the DMV in Norwalk actually is pretty smooth. Yeah, right. And so if you do have to go there, I would not dread it as much as you used to. I've had a number of good experiences, and the people have been actually really pleasant lately. So, you know, not that you're rushing off to do that. <laughs> well, I remember moving here and I was told you're going to be here all day and bring your checkbook. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's, that's good. Uh, it, the only thing I'd add about the, uh, John Kena's activities is I've been impressed by um, he's doing the very thing I think, you know, you know, you know, I think there's a lot of things he's doing and wait to see how they shake out. 
but he's doing the very thing I think we want him to do, and that is he's trying to take us to the next level. Um, and that's getting the town also involved and getting the state involved in some things. And so it's not just saying... Um, good, e good evening, everybody. Tonight is Tuesday, uh, July 12th. This is the planning zoning hearing. We are live in person in town hall in room 206. First time, second time probably in about three years. I'm pretty excited about this. Tonight we have a general meeting and a public hearing. The first off is gonna be in the general meeting. Um, so let's get right into it. Um, the first item of the agenda is to appoint, to appoint a new member to replace Kara Gately. Um, Kara Gately was on the commission um, up until about a month ago, maybe three weeks ago, something like that. Um, she was a Republican, so the Republican Town Committee has put forth an applicant um, for our consideration as a board. The way it works when a vacancy gets um, vacated, um, the board of somebody gets nominated or somebody gets put up, and then the commission votes them in and appoints them. Um, Jim Rand is not here. He may be here later, but I spoke to him today, so we're going to start with Adam. So um, we, tonight we have Amy's, Amy Barsante, um, who is the past chair of the um, Planning and Zoning Housing Committee of the RTM. Can you come up, Amy, to the microphone and sure. introduce yourself? I've known Amy for probably, I don't know, 10 years. I think her daughter taught my son how to, my son how to swim. Yeah. Um, or my <laughs> daughter's had a My daughter swim. taught a lot of little kids how to swim here in town. <laughs> <laughs> sex club. Um, and Amy's a realtor in town. Why don't you give sure. us a couple minutes and maybe sure. the commissioners want to ask some questions and tell sure. us about yourself, what sure. you do. Uh, I've been a resident since uh, 2000 uh, with my husband Anthony and my three kids. They've all been products of Darien High School um, and have uh, two of gra one's graduated Georgetown, one's Villanova, and one is currently a junior, rising junior at Villanova. Um, I have, uh, pri in my younger self, I worked in financial management for GE Capital until my third child was born. Um, my second career was taking care of two ailing parents for many, for six, seven years. Um, and then I became a realtor, and I've been a realtor since 2010. Um, I'm very dedicated to the town of Darien. I am, have been on RTM, I think, since 2016, uh, Parks and Rec Committee, and then most recently as a chairperson and for planning, zoning, and housing committee. Um, I follow the issues that are coming down from the state. I feel very passionate about uh, keeping Darien's local control of zoning. Um, and that is actually what spurred me to finally say yes to Steve all those years after he said, why don't you do this? Why don't you do this? Why don't you do this? So I'm going to give, uh, you know, that's, that's really the impetus for me, is, is that I feel very important that Darien has its own voice. Um, prior to uh, volunteer work with RTM, I was the uh, chairperson for the Council of Darien School Parents, and prior to that, Darien Advocates for the Education of the Gifted. Um, I'm, I've been involved in town for quite some time, and I'm, I'm hoping uh, to continue my service here with the commission. Fantastic. Can you just tell a little bit about the way you handled your com your committee on sure. the Great Island um, sure. potential acquisition? Because sure. I know you did a bunch of meetings, and I went yep. went to a couple yep. of them. I th personally think you did a fantastic job. Oh, th thank you. Um, you know, we w I was a little concerned about the time frame under which we'd have to turn around and make a decision. Um, I took advantage of a regular meeting that we had scheduled to try to brainstorm uh, prior issues that we might want to consider as a committee. Um, and then spent a lot of time with our committee uh, attending other subcommittees, parks and recs, uh, public housing, um, public health and safety, really understanding what was the issues uh, that were going to be presented to the town and understanding the zoning issues around the purchase of Great Island. And I thought what was very important was to highlight to the community what could be done if we didn't purchase the town, what we didn't purchase that property. Um, and understanding and bringing in uh, you, Steve, and Jeremy uh, to our meetings to understand fully what the zoning requirements would allow for um, and, and our current regulations, potential processes for an outside developer to come and um, potentially override our, our zoning regulations and what that would mean to the town. Um, so I, I thought it was important that the community see both sides of the penny, the one that was standing in front of us and the side that you needed to un overturn and look at from the other direction. 
Agreed, Ivan. I think you did a great job. Any any questions from anybody for Amy? No. Really? <coughs> okay. Oh, wow. <laughs> nope. With that said or not said, um, I would entertain entertain a motion to um, appoint Amy to the commission. Jeff makes a motion. Looking for a second. Adam makes a second. All in favor? Right. Welcome aboard. Thank you, guys. Thank you. You have a seat ready right here for you. <laughs> I think you already have some papers to read. You need to next. Okay. Thanks. Great. And then, just for the record. Um, Ms. Barsanti will be sworn in by the by the town clerk uh, yeah, tomorrow or the next day. Right. You, you're going to get a tour card that's stamped by a town hall. That's an official oh, government okay. ID, and it works on airplanes. So get out of jail card. <laughs> it is. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's an Okay. Um, the next item on the agenda is an appointment of a secretary to um, place uh, Miss Carrie Gately. Would anybody like that job? Would anybody like to nominate somebody for that job? <laughs> Why should I make an enemy? All <laughs> <laughs> right. I feel like that's kind of mean, though. Uh, Jim's it. not here right now. That's exactly. <laughs> <laughs> somebody can nominate Jim. We can nominate anybody. You, well, you can't nominate anybody, so it's between you two guys. Okay. Or, oh. I'm too new. <laughs> <laughs> it's not very complicated. Your name shows up in the paper a lot. That's about that's it. That's it. Yeah, either one. Yeah. That's you, one. Have you, 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 oh, you, you nominated somebody. Jeff. Sounds good. There you go. Nominate Jeff. Does Jeff have a second? Second. Yeah. Second. All in favor? <laughs> Jeff Ball is our <laughs> <Yes. laughs> <You may. laughs> new secretary to the planning zone commission. Thank you, everybody. <clears throat> Fantastic. Okay, that's it for the general meeting for now. Now we're going to jump into the public hearing. Um, the first item on our public hearing is proposed amendments to Darien Zoning Re Regulations <coughs> COZR number 4-2022, amendment to the special permit application number 188 FS and Frank, Darien Board of Education 2 and 80 High School Lane. Proposal to amend the Darien Zoning Regulations to permit lighting and public address facilities at the stadium field at the, on the Darien High School property and to be utilized by nonprofit educational and community purposes, inclusive of but not limited to athletic activities. Proposal to amend the applicant's previous special permit to expand the hours and number of days that the lights and public address facilities may be utilized and to expand the permissible uses of the facilities from limited to athletic use to include community-wide events and activities, including those of groups and organizations unaffiliated with the town or the school district. The subject property is located on the north side of High School Lane, approximately 800 feet west of its intersection with Middlesex Road, and is shown on the set spot number nine as lots 80 and 81, located in the R2 residential zone and the Municipal Use MU Overlay Zone. Jeremy, what do we got? Sure, as uh, Terminal Vanny noted, there's really two aspects to this application. Uh, change to the zoning regulation text to amend section 405, special permit regarding lights, <coughs> and an amendment to the special permit for the light use at Darien High School, the stadium field there. Uh, you have in your packets, the latest revision proposed uh, June 15, 2022, which talks about the regulation change, uh, which we put in your packets last week. And you received a number of emails uh, throughout the past day or two. Fred was kind enough to print them for you and leave them in front of your desk here. A uh, variety of emails, letters from neighbors, et cetera. And you, sh you should have those. Uh, I believe there was even a video sent out. We did, because this is his own text changed, we referred this to other local communities as well as, as the state of Connecticut DEEP. State of Connecticut sent an email to the Department of Environment, Energy and Environmental Protection. Thank you for referring it to us. I have no comments on the proposal for the commissioners at this time. 
So uh, the Board of Education brought a number of folks here to present the application, including Joe Williams from Shipping and Goodwin, I believe. Okay, Mr. Williams, welcome. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Uh, as stated, I am Joe Williams. I'm a land use attorney with Shipman and Goodwin, and I'm proud to be here before you this evening representing the Darien Board of Education on this application. Uh, with me are uh, Mr. Duke Deneen on the end of the first row, Chairman of the Board of Education, Dr. Alan Adley, Superintendent of Schools, and Chris Manfredonia, the Athletic Director. And you'll hear in a moment from uh, Duke and Alan. In to just by way of brief background, in 2017, this commission granted a special permit allowing the Board of Education to install permanent field lights at Darien High School Stadium Field. Um, and I believe it's fair to say that at that point in time, and for some years leading up to it, the issue of nighttime usage of the field under lights uh, and potential issues associated with it were a new development. Uh, and there were strong concerns in the neighboring community about how the lights would be used and how the use of the lights and the field at night might impact them. And the Board of Education therefore entered into an agreement at that time, uh, which it then presented to the Commission as proposed terms of the special permit. Um, and the agreement was entered into with four residents to place certain restrictions on the initial usage of the lights as sort of a trial run, if you will, with an agreement to keep it in place for at least five years without suggesting any changes. Uh, tonight, five years, more than five years have passed, and the Board of Education believes it would now be appropriate to loosen some of the restrictions and to allow greater community access to the facility and to be able to use the stadium field at night under the lights. Uh, Jim, was that what we called the green sheets? You remember that term? It was attached? I don't recall. Okay, that's fine. No, I remember that. I was chairman of the time. Okay, keep going. We're doing great. Uh, thank you. Um, but the board wishes to do so still within reasonable guidelines and in accordance with Board of Education policy. Um, but now we have a track record with the use of the lights, and we know the facts, and we're not predicting them like we were five years ago. And the facts are that the use of the lights has gone very well. Uh, that there have been very few problems or complaints with nighttime usage of the stadium field. Um, and there have been many benefits to the community associated with that nighttime usage. And the board has honored the terms of the agreement. Um, and so regarding the use of the lights at stadium field, the Darien Board of Education has proven that it knows how to be a good neighbor, that it cares uh, deeply about being a good neighbor, and that it has an open door and an open ear to any suggestions from the community as to how it might improve in that regard. The board is also keeping in mind its first priority, which is what is in the best interests of all Darien students. <clears throat> and the board has held multiple meetings on this issue. It has listened to community input. It then deliberated and voted uh, that it believes it to be in the best interests of its students to broaden access to use of the field at night. And that's the reason for the applications before you now. So with that introduction, I would first like to call up Duke Deneen and then Dr. Adley to give you some perspective from the board. And then I will return and make a few points regarding the, the, uh, the standards for your permits. And I'm going to just put this on slideshow. It just for the record, everybody on the second should have read, I mean, the commission member should have read, inside the applications is a letter from the Board of Selectmen, um, Monica McNally handing the reins over to Alan Adley, and there's a letter from Alan Adley handing the reins over to Shivan Goodman to represent the town and school on the application. While well, on the subject of the packet, did we get a copy of the policy 1200? I actually brought it tonight. I put it out, so I'm going to put it in the record so you can have it. Policy 1200. Well, you Google there's the right? policy 1200. Sure, it, was. it was submitted for the record. Um, I didn't see it in my packet, but, so yeah. I'm going to put it in the record anyway so we don't have it. So we didn't get Okay, so here, why don't you put this in the record note? That's Darien High School policy number 1200. Yeah, it, the policy 1200 was certainly submitted for the record, but whether commission members received that in their packets is uh, 
may have been an oversight, but um, it certainly was submitted for okay. the record. That's fine. Great. It's on the record now. <clears throat> Mr. Dean, welcome. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and committee members. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. I'll, Can you spell um, your name for the record, please? Sure. Uh, first name Duke, D-U-K-E. Last name Deneen, D-I-N-E-E-N. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Joe, for kicking that off. So at the end of the day, I, I am chairman of the Therian Board of Education and have been for the last year and a half and vice chair for three years prior to that. Um, the board and the administration goal is always to be a good neighbor for the seven school properties that we have care, control, and custody of. Um, I know personally and through members of the board, I think we've demonstrated that continuously uh, almost the nine years that I've been on the board. We've worked with all our neighbors, uh, most of who are parents, around new buildings, renovations, security, traffic, and all the various events that the school properties are used for. Our main goal is always to deliver the best education for our students, and that includes clubs, theater, arts, and the sports programs that make our district a top choice for parents. We are a community that supports and invests in our schools. The board, as Joe said, had the opportunity to review the change, uh, to review and possibly change the Darien High School Field Light Special Permit and Field Light Usage Agreement from 2016. Uh, the board went through a very sound process as we always do in reviewing agreements or items like this. Since the agreement was in place, several board members and the superintendent have changed, so we also went through a process of educating both board members and the superintendent. We did that with also some guidance from our council. In March, we felt it best and we worked through our facilities committee to start the process and look at the agreement. The board felt this was a good place to review the agreement, ask the right questions, and get thoughts of board members and community members that participate in these committee meetings. The facilities committee brought the agreement to the full board with recommendations to move away from a restrictive agreement in early April. The board had a robust conversation around the restrictions for field usage. The athletic director, the superintendent answered many questions. We also had Joe, our uh, land use attorney, as part of the conversation. <laughs> The board in late April continued the board conversation around the agreement and also had a public hearing as part of our regular hearing to hear from the public. The conversation, the conversation continued in early May and the meeting of the board decided to move forward without a specific restrictive agreement in place with changes um, around uh, usage of the field and the light, uh, the timing of the lights. The board and the administration, and it's right, the board felt the administration in its rightful role should manage the administration of the fields based on the district's care, control, and custody of the school buildings in the field. The board, also, the board also felt that the public was looking for more opportunities to use this town out, asset outside of what the district needs are for specific school sports and functions. The lights, sound system, turf, and even the concession stand up at the high school are all possible by, incredibly genero by the incredible generosity of parents in the community through the Daring Athletic Foundation. The board felt it was important to build in opportunities for the community for field usage after school scheduling was complete, and that's what we're discussing as part of this process this evening. The board will continue to review the field usage policy with lights on an annual basis. The board takes any questions, comments, or concerns seriously around the facility's usage. Um, in my time on the board, and recently as chair and vice chair, I've been involved in two complaints about the fields that were handled through the administration process around our facilities usage policy and guidelines. So the board requested also that the administration develop administrative guidelines in conjunction with our field usage policy, and both will be followed strictly and enforced. The board reviews these policies and administrative guidelines and can adjust them accordingly. Um, so I'll pause there and... Dr. Adley? Any questions for Mr. Jones sure. before he goes yep. down? Okay, thank you, sir. Members of, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, thank you for the opportunity to speak here. And I'll see if I can get this a little bit closer. Welcome, sir. Sorry. A L A N A D D L E Y. I'm the superintendent of, of schools. Thank Pro you. Proudly so, um, and thank you for everyone in the room who supports our educational system. Uh, the use of the facilities brings a lot to the school system, brings a lot of camaraderie and school spirit, 
uh, to the district in general and also to the town in general. Uh, the opportunity to expand that allows a wee bit of an opportunity to build upon the community spirit that is already there and the school spirit that is alive and well. I just want to just touch on a couple of, of uh, background information just to give you a little bit of a sense of uh, where we are and what is currently in place versus uh, some of the recommendations that, that are coming forward. I would like to say that uh, the board, and as the, Mr. Chairman has uh, spoken to, we've worked very collaboratively with our neighbours and I want to recognise them and thank them for that. Uh, we are going to continue to do that. Uh, there's no reason we won't do that. We do that with all members of our community around all issues and we would continue to do that. And those are also art articulated in the administrative regulations. So this just gives you a wee bit of a sense of kind of currently what the current status is. Uh, the lights are off uh, by 7.30, Monday to th uh, through Thursday and 10 p.m. on a Friday. Varsity uh, teams basically are allowed to play two games and one playoff game. So essentially you, you're, uh, the current permit or the current agreement allows us to play up to about, let's say, 18 games. Cutting it, uh, just going to the, uh, the the alternative of what we're looking for is about 20 to 25 games. Uh, so that's... Yeah, I counted 8 and 12. 8 in the fall and 12 in the spring correct, is right. 20. Okay. Yep. Okay. Um, we, the, currently, uh, the lights are used for uh, Furfield, uh, inter, interscholastic uh, athletic uh, competition or conference. Uh, it's not used uh, for the state, so if, if our kids get into the state finals or otherwise, uh, they can't play there, nor is it allowed to be used for a site if, if that's the case. We're, we're also suggesting a uh, modification to that. And the youth sports practices uh, end uh, by 7 o'clock. 7.30. 7.30, right? Yep. This is just a wee bit of a sense of what the other districts do. Uh, we're looking at increasing our games to, to 20 to 25 uh, a season, thereabouts. And you can see that uh, for the most part, uh, we're we're in line with uh, other uh, other school systems there. Some guiding principles, the, the idea of like working collaboratively, we have done that. Can you hold uh, one second for that? On the Greenwich, and I'll be through. Is that, am I adding 10 plus 10 plus 10 is 30? Let me just go back. Uh, Greenwich is 10 tall. Okay. No, it's 10, it's 10 for the years. Okay. Okay. So some guiding principles that, that have guided the work uh, up to this point and also continuing to, uh, as we move <coughs> forward. Uh, the board and the administration take seriously the idea of working collaboratively with our, our community members. That includes uh, our neighbors in this particular aspect. Uh, but they also want to maintain some decision making authority. Since we have honored the agreement, and this is the appropriate time to actually come forward with any modi uh, modification. Uh, we want to create schedules that allowed families to attend games uh, more regularly and uh, continue the opportunity amongst all teams to maximize the use of the field space. Maintain a, a reasonable time limit for school nights. We don't want people out there all night, that, that's understandable, and certainly don't want the lights and sound system out there all night either. Uh, create opportunities for our, our facility to be a host site. Uh, there, are, there is pride and uh, opportunities for our children to play. Uh, in those, those uh, games potentially, and so we just wanted to open that, that, that up. Uh, continue to limit the noise in the stadium. You'll see in the uh, regulations that we've tried to take steps to uh, delineate some restrictions to the noise in addition to the lights, and to support the opportunity uh, for our young people in the, across the town and the organizations to participate and use the fields as best as possible when they're available. So the proposals uh, just simply uh, simply stated, teams will be permitted to hold games and practices at, at 9 o'clock uh, during the week and 10 o'clock on Fridays and Saturdays. So that, that will allow uh, games to start at uh, 6 p.m. in the stadium. Our, our site will become a host site for Fairfield and Connecticut interscholastic uh, conferences uh, for playoff games. And our science system will be used at the high, uh, for high school games only. Uh, so you'll see the, there are administrative regulations. I think the administrative regulations that have been developed honor, uh, continue to honor the relationship, the positive relationship we have had with our community members. Um, and moving forward, we would continue to do that. Uh, there's, there's no intent that one, one day we have a set of administrative regulations or policies and the next day we change it. That, that really just doesn't happen that way. Uh, so we've tried to uh, develop some administrative regulations that, that include uh, 
games must finish 15 minutes before the lights uh, so that people transition out and it's not just a, like a 10 o'clock deadline and people walk out before it's like 10.30 before they actually get off the field type of thing. So we've tried to be reasonable in that and I think that uh, in response to uh, the concerns that we've heard and also uh, in response to the board's desire to open up the fields a little bit. Thank you. Any questions for anybody for Dr. Adler? Um, Go right ahead, sir. Thanks. Uh, Dr. Adley, uh, in comparing the other communities, I did not know uh, what the times of other communities are for turning out lights. Do you happen to know? Uh, I'll ask the athletic director if he knows that one. Okay. Hi, Chris Manfredonia, C H R I S M A N F R E D. O-N-I-A, I'm the Athletic Director at Darien High School. Um, I think if you look at slide, um, the third slide, um, Staples has a hard time off um, of 8 o'clock. They're the only restrictions on it. The rest are no restrictions, but there are some restrictions to how many they can have. Turn the lights on. Did you happen to survey Brian McMahon? Because that's where we play our offsite games. Uh, I did not, but if you were to ask me off the top of my head, I don't believe they have any restrictions at Brian McMahon High School for, for okay. Uh, lights. Okay. So there's no shutoff time in those other towns? Other than Staples, no. Okay. Staples is Westport. Um, yeah, okay. I've got a question. Who, who did this? Is this one of you guys, or is that the, the lawyer? Yes, that's the, the, I think those are the Ministry of Regulations, Mr. Mulvaney, that you're looking at, yes. Right. The only thing I would ask, it came up on your slide here, where it says sound system will be used, by J, you'll be used at JV and varsity games, comma, only. But is only supposed to be there? It was on the other slide. It's on the slide there? It was on the slide. Well, yes, for, for JV and varsity games. We were talking about nighttime here, yes. Okay. So it's JV and varsity games only? Yes. Right. Okay. What, um, you know, like, um, what do you envision just being able to do more than you didn't do prior? What is, what is the impetus to, to have the control in, in the administration and, and at the board that, to control your own destiny? What is it that you ultimately are, think you'll gain out of that? So it's going, to, it's going to relax some of the it's going to relax some of the restrictions and open up the opportunity to play more games, uh, opportunity for our, our students to experience that under the lights. That's what they were purchased for, and those those are special times if you ever have an opportunity to experience that. So now, for the most part, um, that will mean uh, additional two to four hours a week for. Uh, the high school, but it opens it up to eight to ten hours a week, additional hours for our young people in the community uh, to utilize. So it gives them the opportunity <coughs> just as much as it does our, our uh, high school athletes. Mm -hmm. So that you talk about the youth sports? Yes. Okay. I mean, I played Ram football in Garden City. It started at 7.15 at night and ended at 9 o'clock at night under the lights. Okay. Um, anything else? How often, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. How often do you change your regulations around the policy to use the field? The, the, the answer the, to that is the at, policy, at, whatever. Ten, ten the minutes. actual correct answer to that, just the legal answer to that, is as necessary. But it's not. It's not typically something. Regulations just don't arbitrarily uh, get changed. It's also not in the spirit of the way we operate. Uh, with our community members. It's not been that practice at all to do that. Um, in the Ministry of Regulations have also built in opportunities to hear, continue to hear from the community and to bring those reports back to the board to be very transparent about uh, the process. So uh, while uh, some policies allow the administration to change it, um, it has to be changed within the scope of the policy. Uh, so there's, there's, again, it's not an intent to one week have a set of regulations and next week just to change it. I think also to um, oh, just to, to the podium, please. Yes. Thank you. Just to add to that, it's a good question that the board has a policy committee. That policy committee meets on a regular basis, on a monthly basis, and there's a review process of <coughs> policies that go on throughout the year. A lot of that has is done in conjunction with our council, because a lot of it has to do with changes at the state level or the federal level, but that's also included. So. 
like any like this process, it would go through a process from the policy committee on up through the board before we looked at any changes or recommendations to changes. So, in your proposed uh, amendments to the zoning regulations, you just said basically as authorized by the BOE, <clears throat> without specifically referencing that uh, set of policies. I'm guessing that's so to handle that change so that you don't have to come back in front of us every time those policies change. Where if you said in let's say Part D on your proposed amendments, you said we should you know as as denoted in the Darien Board of Education policy 1020 or whatever it's called, okay. um, then that means you'd have to come before us every single time. So that's why you're sort of just saying based on Darien Board of Education, right? Correct, and that's then referenced in the administrative regulations back to the policy. So in terms Here's of the board right now is. But that's not in here at all, anywhere. So, so in theory, that, that policy isn't what governs the special permit at all. Sorry, what's that again? 1,200 governs the schools. Yeah. Right, so because it's, it's, it's in, every single school is in the care, custody, control of the, of the Board of Education. We give it to them. And then, I mean, I'm going to help you out a little bit. This policy 1,200, I guess, was enacted in, was it 1999? It was revised in 2015, effective 2015. Then it was enacted, it was revised. Ten years, five years later, in November 2020, I think I'm reading this right, right? And then you just did it again um, in October 12, 2021. So it might have been some, you know. Right. Uh, it's a good question. I had the same question, and uh, Mr. Williams and I discussed this. That if the, the commission were to approve this in the special permit, you have the regulation change in the special permit. In the special permit. You couldn't say everything's okay subject to policy 1200 because that is too open-ended and it's beyond the commission control. So whatever conditions the commission were to put on the special permit, lights have to be off at this time. You can only uh, rent it out to whatever. They could be on these days of the week, these hours, whatever. It would have to be better defined than a policy which is outside the control that could, as you change, acknowledge, have, change you're coming back outside time, of the right? special permit. Yeah. So the special permit goes first, then the school policy 1200, and then this administrative policy. Yes. Yes. Right. Let me get a little smarter. That makes sense. Okay. And this this administrative policy revised June 2020. This is brand new, right? Correct. Okay. These administrative guidelines came out of the conversation through the board meetings that we wanted administrative guidelines in also along with the, the facility usage policy, which we're comfortable with this time at this time, add these administrative guidelines, which over time, if we feel any of these administrative guidelines could be then moved over into the field usage policy. But we thought it best to start as administrative guidelines first. Yeah, I mean, that's, it says it in black and white. Consistent with this policy, the superintendent shall develop and propagate administrative regulations and associate forms governing the use of the schools and the facilities. Yes. That's this. You did exactly what you were supposed to do. Okay. Uh, I, go right ahead. I feel compelled to comment on Adam's question, though, about when policies are made, because I did serve on the Board of Education for 11 years, and I think through most of that we were considering the usage of lights. Uh, certainly the temporary lights that I think ultimately resulted and then uh, it was quiet for a while but these things can come up when there are agreements made and, and they're reconsidered and it happens all the time I guess um, but while I have the floor can I ask another questioner sure um, Dr. Eiley would you just uh, expand a little bit on the benefit to our community spirit by having other communities use our field without their end being involved except otherwise providing the field well, there are times where we made use of other people's fields, whether it was Norwalk or other in, in the past or otherwise. Um, so uh, extending that opportunity just as a good neighbor, to just to start with, is a good thing. Uh, the idea of the FCIC and CIC games coming uh, to town uh, is a very healthy thing, and it, it, it increases the, the school spirit. Uh, our young people who get the, the opportunity uh, to practice on the on the field. Uh, just have an, a, have an opportunity to experience that, that special experience of under the lights and also to get just to continue uh, with their practices should the, should the need of those. It, the, whole, the whole high school experience um, uh, is enriched by 
uh, resources, the facility, and then in, in this particular case, this particular facility, the lights and the opportunity uh, to, to utilize them plainly. Okay, fair enough. Uh, one last one, if I could. Mm -hmm. Um, just quickly, uh, what do you suppose will be the youngest age of anybody playing on the fields uh, up after 730? What's been the history of that? Um, you know, you're, so you're talking about the youth group users, and that's probably, I would say, I would say no younger than second grade. They could be playing from 730 to 9 p.m.? Um, no, I mean, it's... Second or third grade, the youngest I'd say would be at that late. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So that's the age that those football teams start at or soccer teams start at. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, what else? Do you, um, and maybe this might be for Chris. Do you know of any other school district? And Doctor, you've been around the state for a while. Any other school that doesn't allow other FCAC or or state things in their town? That does not. Yeah, this is uh, not. Not the, not, the com not the comes to mind for me personally. Not the comes to mind that I'm aware of. So we're the only one that it kind of, you know, quote no, unquote excludes. I wouldn't go. I'm just asking, but not that I'm aware of. Right, right. I understand. Okay, you came from like a small town. It's not like Darian's going to go up to Cheshire or something. Okay. Um, any other commission questions from this from commissioners? What would the non-sports usages that you have envisioned be? Because um, there's like general. Usage you've, you've stated too. Like I get the games and stuff. That's awesome. But what what do you envision using it? That fireworks. Fireworks. Lights. Lights. They turn the lights on. The fireworks. <laughs> I would say that you know there's a priority in the field usage thing for not for profits. We've had concerts and music out there. I, I would say that with sports and the youth groups, the schedule gets pretty full, and there is a prioritization within the policy of what we look at. So the only thing that really comes to mind that the fields are used for over and above that is really the fireworks. And then the lights don't come into play other than from a security standpoint. Yeah, that's what's there. I imagine part of your policy is, you know, understanding the, the surfaces that, you know, are on the stadiums and the preserving uh, not having a usage that would be detrimental uh, uh, to the to the surfaces that are there that are in place. Yeah. So uh, you know, I mean, I would imagine that's part of your policy and your underwriting of an organization that comes to. Yeah, there's an pieces. approval, yeah. a review and approval process. Okay. Um, so then, I guess, Chris. Uh, I'm sorry, Joe. Joe, you're going to go over this with us. Yes. Okay. Any other questions for these two gentlemen? Okay. Thank and you. Mr. Mayor. Okay. So at the end of the day, inside your narrative packet that you gave us, there was, um, I read the one that was in the packet, right, which proposed special permit, and then you put this, then we got this as a sub, as a sub. Right. Is there much difference between, and maybe you guys know, between this and that? Except no, the revision was simply, um, to the proposed change to the regulation, not the special permit, on the topic that Jeremy mentioned because we filed the application and we proposed to amend the zoning regulation to say one of the conditions on being able to use permanent lights was that they are used in accordance with Board of Education Policy 1200. And I had the discussion with Jeremy, he made a very good point. Um, so I revised our proposed amendment to the regulation to make it a little more simplified to say, as authorized by the Board of Education. So what you see, you should see some uh, red lining or black line, whatever, on the front page. That was the only change we made in that revision, Mr. Mm -hmm. Chairman. Okay. Um, now, as to the proposed amendment to the special permit, I just want to start by saying we've only proposed to, to amend and to somewhat streamline the terms uh, that govern the use of the lights and the use of the public address or PA system. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of other conditions, and there still are a lot of other conditions in the special permit that we're not proposing to revise or amend in any way. So anything that's not talked about in our proposal would stay the same and, and is not changing. So, to go back to what I said at the beginning, I think we, we um, effectively called these, or affectionately called these the green sheets. And I don't know if you were around at the time, but that's what we did. Because this is proposed amendment to the special permit number 188F. So we're not making any changes to the R narrative that we came up with. 
Very, you mean the P&Z approval? Correct. That's so correct. There will be a separate decision by this commission, which will have to stand down. Itself. You're not touching that thing. They're not touching that. That's correct. Got That's it. right. We're not proposing to. <clears throat> okay. Because it was a special, there was a regulation special permit, and behind that were these two pieces of paper. That's why it's an amendment to the special permit. If it wasn't an amendment, it would have been part of it. That's what the history was. Okay. And I, um, and I think um, I have a fairly detailed list of what's changing and what's not changing. I think the board went over it in a fair amount of detail in your questions and, and you heard in the presentations from Dr. Adley and Mr. Deneen. Um, but I would just also note sort of in summary that there are a number of the you know, key provisions of the terms governing the use of the lights that we're not proposing to change either. Even though the language has been, as I said, sort of, we believe, simplified and streamlined, you know, things like um, that the, the fields are going to be used by Darien High School sports and Darien youth groups. That's staying the same, even though we're adding uh, some organizations that would be allowed under the Board of Ed policy to use the lights. Um, the fact that the lights will continue to stay off on Sundays, except for playoffs, that's staying the same, um, although we added Saturday. Um, the time limit for Friday games to end at 10 p.m., that's staying the same. Uh, the fact that only the stadium field is a permitted facility to use lights is staying the same, meaning no other Darien uh, public schools facility will, will be able to use lights. Uh, and the fact that the public address system is to be used for Darien High School games only is staying the same. So um, what we are proposing to change in summary is that the Board of Education will be able to manage the usage of the lights in the order of priority. Um, as set forth in the policy that you talked about. And that priority will now allow use by junior varsity um, teams, which it did not previously for games. The light usage will be allowed through 9 p.m., as you heard, um, expansion from 7.30. Um, but under the administrative regulations issued by Dr. Adley, everything has to end by 15 minutes before the deadline so that the lights aren't being kept on past the deadline to let people leave the field safely. So. Um, so the lights should, should, will be able to go off at the, at the deadline. Um, also was noted, it is included in the administrative regulations, is that the use of the lights will not be extended for youth games. And so that's, that's offered as an accommodation, whereas the permit right now currently states on Friday night, for example, for a football game, the lights will go off by 10, unless there's a need to continue it past 10 if there's an injury or timeout or whatever it is, and the, the administrative regulation issued by Dr. Adley says we're sticking with 10 p.m., not extending it. So if the game has to start earlier to make sure that's accommodated, then that will be the case. What about like overtime? What happens with overtime? It's not being extended. That's, that's, what, the, that's what the regulation provides. So for any, for any reason. You got, a st you got a championship game and you're tied FCX, and it's okay 955, you it's think for, those lights are going off? <laughs> it's not high school or JV. Yeah. Okay. It's, not it's DJFL. Okay, 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 okay. Okay. All right, so to turn, if I could, to your special permit standards, and we, uh, we did provide you in the project narrative file with the application a more, a more full statement of compliance with Section 1005 of your regulations, which provides the standards for approving a special permit. So just, just a few points on that. Um, as you heard, the use of the lights for the past five years, the Board of Education strongly believes, has improved students' athletic and educational experience um, and believes that revising the restrictions will broaden access to nighttime use of the field, will allow more students to benefit from it, and will enhance town and school spirit. Uh, but the guidelines that we are proposing within the special permit are reasonable limits to be fair to neighbors of uh, the stadium field. But the Board of Ed has gone beyond those. As you heard, it has a longstanding policy in place, 1200, governing use of school facilities, including the eligible organizations, the order of priority, restrictions on use, that sort of thing. And in addition, Dr. Adley has issued the administrative regulations that we talked about. Um, which provides that the lights go off 15 minutes before the deadline and will not be extended to complete youth games. Um, and they also provide, importantly, that there will be no use of the press box sound system or of any portable sound system by youth groups. Only Darien High School games 
can use the press box sound system. And the regulations also provide that the uh, administration will keep a record of any complaints of usage of the field at night and it will conduct an annual review and report on it to the full Board of Education. And so by limiting the use of the sound system to high school games, the board is ensuring that a good portion of the additional usage that we are proposing will hardly be noticed by people who live near Stadium Field. And I say that because it is our understanding that it's not the lights or the people on the field or the activity on the field that neighbors notice, at least from what I have, I have been told. It's the sound from the PA system. And so um, we have volunteered limits on that usage. Uh, for only dairy and high school games so that the additional use of the field at night for practices or other organizations or whatever it may be is not going to be something that is projecting sound out toward the neighborhood. Uh, excuse, excuse me. If, if we have a CIAC game or an FCAC finals game, you're not going to use the PA system if Darian's not playing in it? Because you keep saying Darian high school sports only. Yes, we would say yes. We would have to. We use would. We would use it. Right. I, I meant yes. I meant to include high school games, including the additional playoff games. Okay. That was so. It's right. it's, a, it's every high school game, not just Darian sports. Correct. Games. Thank you. That's a good clarification. You're right. Um, so as such, we believe the proposed revisions to the permit terms continue to satisfy your special permit standards. And then finally, the zoning regulation amendment um, is a fairly minor revision to section 405.B.5.D. Um, and it's simply to accommodate the relaxing of restrictions that we have just talked about. It limits activities under the lights to athletic and related activities authorized by the Board of Education. And so the board would then bring to bear everything we've talked about tonight in, in making those decisions, including its policies and regulations. Uh, and we submit that the amendment fits within your scheme of the zoning regulations and is consistent with your plan of development. So with that, uh, we thank you for your time and attention and for the assistance of your ABLE staff and respectfully request your approval. And I'll just uh, reserve the right, if I could, to respond to any comments or oh, questions you receive tonight, Mr. Chairman. Yep, all right. Any more questions, Mr. Chairman? Question for Chairman. In, in our files, in the last five years, have we ever gotten any letter from any neighbor complaining about anything at all? I do not recall any off the top of my head. Okay, so we can check the file if we didn't. <laughs> we can check the file. Okay, because it's, I've, I've never seen anything sometimes it used to sound to us. Um, you're good? Okay, thank, thank you, you, sir. Um, and does the police department weigh in on this? Did they send any comments? Let's see if they sent any Did they any comments? I believe so. I'll double check. They, but the, the police department was cc on uh, Monica's letter, I think. Yeah, she definitely was. Fire Marshal, no issues noted. <coughs> I don't see anything here from the from the police. But so, but in your letter from May 18th, with the waiver of the traffic study, uh, Captain Anderson was copied. Right here. Yes. Yeah. Chief. Chief. I'm sorry, Chief Anderson. Sorry, Chief. Um, okay, we're good. Would anybody like to speak uh, for the public to speak to this application? Please welcome, sir. Just state your name and um, address for the record. I'm Albertus Vandenbroek, and I live on 15 Linda Lane, and I've been living there for 50 years. Can you spell your name for me, please? I can give you it afterwards, maybe. Thank you so much. Take your time. And Not a problem. Uh, now, first I want to mention that uh, student sports are very, you know, it's not a site activity in our family. We are very keen on that. We have supported and participated in the funding of the, uh, uh, we have supported also and participated in the funding of the turf field in the Dairy and Athletic Foundation. We have played in the games. My son has been very, much instrumental in the success of the uh, lacrosse league in town. My granddaughters have been playing in the various games to get to state championships, so it's not a simple thing really when we talk about sports. But however, 
but there has to be a balance between the activities on the athletic fields and the requirements of undisturbed living in the homes right around the fields. The agreement that was developed five years ago after extensive deliberations among the Board of Education, the school administration, and the neighbors did accomplish that with the exception of the management of the sound. What we have learned over the last five years is that the lights are the lesser evil thanks to the new light technology. When the Darien School Administration was first asked by the Board of Education about the Darien High School lights in November 2021, Superintendent Dr. Adley said that he had conferred with the Director of Athletics and they felt the existing guidelines were working well for the Darien High School. As a matter of fact, I have filed a video of that meeting where it is being discussed. Yep, so. Now, against the recommendation of the Darien High School Administration, the Board of Education is submitting changes to the permit under which the use of the stadium lights have been operated to essentially allow unrestricted use until 9 p.m. Monday, Thursday from the 7.30 and 10 p.m. Friday, Saturday from 10 p.m. Friday only and eliminate all restrictions on the nature of activities. So not longer just sports, it could be concerts, could be rallies, and you can use lights no longer just the DSS, but also non-profit teams or profit uh, organizations out of town. I mean, there's all an open game now. And the games uh, and the noise that comes with all these games too. But the Board of Education also proposal removal of all noise guidelines as it has been submitted to us. In the narr narrative accompanying the application to modify the special permit, the Board of Education states that this proposal maintains a reasonable time limit on school nights for students and families, while remaining good neighbors with these residents that live in close proximity to the high school property. We do not think that games and practices under the lights every day until 9 p.m. is a reasonable time limit, and the statement that while remaining good neighbors is really a total fabrication that's contradicted by the points put forward by the neighbors in the public hearings before the Board of Education and for your commission today. The narrative states that expanding access to the lighted field will benefit the entire Danian community while ensuring that use of this facility will be appropriately managed in compliance with existing Board of Education policy as it has been since 2017. <coughs> This approach has worked well for the past five years and has resulted in very few issues or complaints. That's how it states in the narrative. It totally ignores the fact that it has worked well because there was agreement that spelled out how the stadium lights would be managed. The Board of Education does not have as its call the welfare of the residents of Darien as is quite well illustrated by its attitude and pronouncements comments by a Board of Education member that the amendment would be prepared in the spirit of the existing agreement were quickly overruled as evidenced by the content of the modification submitted. Concerns about the welfare of the students with the expansion of the athletic programs, increasing pressure on the students expressed during the public hearing were brushed aside with comments as, I am not getting into in any state of determining when or what time children need to go to bed. I think that's in the best interest of parents and not either in this board's purview or even the administration's purview. Recent tragic events have underscored that the welfare of the students should be foremost on the mind of our leaders in education and all residents in Darien. The games under the light have been well received by the community of Darien and the neighbors are open to expand the availability to availability of the stadium field for that purpose by allowing games every Friday night. Contrary to five years ago, there has not been any discussion between the Board of Education and the neighbors on the details of using the lights and particularly the sound system. It is the elimination, elimination of meaningful noise restrictions that is most troubling. We propose that these discussions take place and the changes will be limited to the Italian High School athletic activities to come to a satisfactory conclusion. We are strongly opposed to the notion in the request for modification that the planning and zoning remove all restrictions of the use of the Darien High School athletic fields and let the Board of Education decide how the Darien High School and all public property is being used. <coughs> planning and zoning should not relinquish its primary responsibilities to preserve the natural beauty, maintain the health, safety, and general welfare, <coughs> and to enhance the well-established residential character of the town. 
I'm just adding also here to hand over an article that was in the Darien patch of May 5th, 2022, and it gives a good su summary, really, of the history of my talk here in your review. Thank you. Thank you. Now, before you, this, I saw this thing you said from the patch. Who wrote this? It doesn't have an author to it. To oh, you mean the article? Yeah. It was submitted by uh, uh, Paul Mikowski. Mr. Mikowski is the author, because it says at the bottom, it says the author is... No, the author has been a neighbor of DHS since 2000. Right. So this is Mr. Mikowski, and he lives someplace close to the high school. Yeah, so he could have to go speak. No, he lives at yeah, 371. Okay. But well, it's again a good summary of it from the past and, and what has inspired in, in a couple of pages. People like yourself also, many of them were not there in 2016 or 17 or even earlier. And then what was your address again? My address was 15 Linda Lane. Linda Lane, okay. Linda Lane. Okay. Any, any questions? No, we're good. Thanks for your time, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Would anybody else like to speak to this application? Welcome. State your name and your address for that. Um. Jake Wilson, uh, 527 Middlesex Road. Uh, all right. uh, my name is Jake Wilson, and I'm a rising senior at Darren High School. I'm also the captain of both the Darren varsity football team and the cross team. Since 2015, the lights have been an exciting addition to our stadium, something every kid in our youth program has dreamed of playing under. I had that same dream when I was younger, and I was psyched to learn when I was in seventh grade that we would be installing lights, and I would be able to play under Friday night lights for football, and have the rare chance to play under the lights for lacrosse. However, I was quickly disappointed, much like many of my teammates, when we learned just how few opportunities we would have to play under those lights. For football, Friday night games, or any night games overall, allow for a unique and traditional football environment. It also allows for athletes to have a chance to use their Saturdays or Sundays to catch up on schoolwork and spend time with family and friends, something that is rare during the week with all our practices. For lacrosse, since most of our games are on weekdays, it is unfortunate that the games have to start typically around 4 o'clock or 4.30 due to the limits with the lights. Because of this, many working parents will not be able to watch their sons and daughters play the game they love. My dad taught me to play lacrosse, and unfortunately was not able to watch any of my weekday games this year because he was working. I'm just one of many that are the victims of this unfortunate situation. On a different note, what our community needs right now is opportunities to come together and enjoy what our amazing town has to offer. Our storied and dominant sports programs can provide that chance. Every student at Darren High School, athlete or non-athlete, is extremely grateful that our town is fortunate enough to have stadium lights. Our one request would just be the chance to use them more. Thank you for your time. We appreciate your consideration. You're welcome. Any questions? Thank you. Would anybody else like to speak to this application? Please. Jen Montanero, welcome. Hello. Jennifer Montanero, 86 Maywood Road. I'm the president of the Darren Athletic Foundation. Could you spell your last name, please? M-O-N-T-A-N-A-R-O. -O. Thank you. You're welcome. First of all, thanks, Amy Barsanti, for stepping up. And uh, sometimes a very thankless job. So thank you all to the commission as well. I just want to say a couple of things. Um, for the Darren Athletic Foundation, the lights are less about which sport. When we set out to gift this to our town, to the Board of Education, it wasn't about football, it wasn't about lacrosse, girls versus boys, varsity versus JV. It was about providing a community asset, and we've always thought that, and we've always stood behind that. So, you know, we did make sure that when we raised the funds, we could have very easily put in a pole with some lights not so much different than what was previously there where there were boards up on the schools, et cetera, so there was no glare. But we went the extra mile and we got the state-of-the-art lighting system that we have. You can tell from the photo, there's just no bleed. The sound system is really no different. If you go back in time and look to the applications, you'll see how progressive the sound system is. You can be sitting in the stands and not hear any noise that's coming out of the speakers, it can be targeted. So I know we keep talking about, is this thing about the lights, or is it about who's using it, the time, or is it this, it's really the sound that seems to bother the neighbors? But it can be controlled. You know, all of the gifts that we've now given to the Board of Education, um, they have been such good stewards of these gifts. 
you know, I think they have earned the right to be able to use the facilities and the gifts that are given to them in the way that they feel best. Whenever there's been any sort of uh, discourse or um, unsettlement, if someone made a complaint about something, I, I do recall when I was running lacrosse for a period of time there, Steve, you'll remember, you know, there were a lot of cars up there, and that created a, a big mess for the Board of Education. So we work together, because that's what we do in Darien. We collaborate, and we're all good neighbors to one another. We want to make this work. So allow the Board of Education to run <coughs> their assets the way that they should be running it, to the benefit of the students, not just the athletes, maybe there's gonna be a, maybe they should have a pep rally, right? I mean, we do all these things for our students. We're talking about mental health. We're talking about how the camaraderie. Well, maybe we should have a pep rally. Maybe it should be under the lights. I don't know what that looks like. My kids aren't there. I don't, I'm not really a part of that anymore, but, but allow the Board of Education to do what they do best, and that's utilize what they have and what they've been given. Because I'm certain if there are issues, they will come to an agreement. But when we tie their hands with these restrictions that no one ever, ever thought would, would be there five years ago, I mean, it's not good for anybody. It just creates discourse and animosity among a lot of folks, and it shouldn't be. This should be a positive thing. How lucky are we in Darien to have these beautiful fields, to have the schools that we have? I'm also a realtor, and every single time I meet a new client, they want to know about the high school. They want to know about our schools. They want to know about the gifted program, the athletics, about theater, th you know, uh, 301. They want to know about Darren because they hear these wonderful things. So let's just keep being great. We could do it together, but we don't need all of these restrictions. So thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you, Jeff. Appreciate it. Any questions for Jeff? Good. Thank you. Would anybody else like to speak to this application? Sir, welcome. Yeah. Steve, your name and address for the record, if you remember? Uh, James Tom, 12 Oak Park Avenue. Display last name, please. Uh, T H O M. Thank you. Uh, my name is James Tom, and I'm a rising senior at Darien High School, as well as one of the captains of the Darien football team. In the past five years, I've benefited from the lights of the stadium, extending practice time in the dark hours in the fall when I played DGFL, and now as a varsity football player and playing under Friday Night Lights. My youngest brother is still playing for DJFL, and my father is a volunteer coach and on the DJFL board. Extending the lights a little longer on weekdays for DJFL practice provides a safe place for practice to take place and allows for the teams to have a good two hours of practice, starting at a time that works best for all the volunteer coaches. Um, our town needs community spirit right now, more than any other time. Gathering for sporting events under the lights is an exciting exciting experience and a great way for the town to come together for shared community spirit. I hope that we can expand the opportunities and take advantage for the lights for what it can bring to our community. Whether it be for a football or a field hockey game, the lights will help to strengthen our Blue Wave project. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Sorry about that. Anybody else want to speak to this application? <laughs> Sir. How you doing? Uh, Harrison Hunter, H-A-R-R-I-S-O-N, uh, H-U-N-T-E-R, -R -R -E 16 Linda Lane. The old, 16 Linda Lane? Yep, the Overbeck Sold House. Um, so uh, first off, I appreciate the time. This is the last place I'd like to be as a former athlete. This, uh, I don't want to, I'm not trying to be annoying. I just, uh, you know, given what I heard about the Board of Education meeting, it was pretty frustrating. So I figured I'd just give you my perspective so we could try to figure out something that makes sense. Um, look, first off, a lot of people in this room probably tailgated in my backyard. The Overbex used to have a bunch of tailgates there, so everyone knows how loud it is. So I, I disagree that it's not loud. Um, and to me, this has nothing to do with Darien sports. It's 100% about youth sports and the ability for the lacrosse teams and the football kids to play at night, which seems fine. But I, I guess I'll just give you some perspective I have as to why it is frustrating for me. And look, I'm 34 years old. I've got a three-year-old and one-year-old. They're going to play at Darien High when they're older. Uh, so just hope you can at least appreciate where I'm coming from. So first off, uh, unfortunately, I work in private equity. I work a lot. I work from home, and it's pretty loud during the day when the music starts at 3, 8, 3 p.m. and goes till the game time. Um, I disagree with the comment around the uh, decibel level. I recently recorded a 78 decibel reading in the middle of a work call where it was cursing, and I literally had to stop my call and apologize to people on the phone for the fact that I'm trying to do well in my career, and I've got 
rap blaring in the background of my Zoom calls. So look, at the end of the day, like work from home's not going away, and I am all for you sports, but 78 decimal rap music at 5 p.m. on a Tuesday is not part of the what makes our school program better. Um, I have a three-year-old and a one-year-old, and I live, also live in Linda Lane. We've got 11 kids under the age of 10 that live on our street, five of which directly about the high school. Uh, they love going to the school, and they, we go there every Saturday. I walk my dog around the school every week. I take my daughter, um, and I hope they play on the fields in the future. But they also have to do homework, and they've got to sleep. And they shouldn't have to wear earplugs to go to bed at night, which they've had to do lately because the, the music is so loud. Uh, and honestly, without the sound, I wouldn't care at all about the lights. I think the lights are great. I love view sports. I hope that we continue to win titles and everything. But it's the fact that no one actually pays attention to the rules. And I disagree that, you, that we follow the rules at night because it's really loud. Uh, home values, you're a realtor. I, I agree. You know, when I moved here, I moved, I used to live in Middlesex Lane. I live on Linda Lane now. And when I moved in 2020, there's a 100% chance the reason that our home, we got the, the home for the price we did is because people were ner nervous about the noise. and. Um, I disagree that it doesn't impact the home values that we live in, and it affects tax revenue for the schools or for the town as well. Uh, but I, you know, we thought it was kind of part of the appeal of living on Little Lane. You can walk to the school; half the school walks through my backyard to go to school every day, um, and I thought that was great. Um, but there's no doubt that this proposal went back my own value, and that's frustrating. So I at least appreciate that that it's a pain in my my butt, and it's going to financially affect me and a lot of people in my street. And then lastly, again. I got two kids under the age of four. They take naps every day. They wake up every time there's a game, and that's frustrating. I want my daughter to be able to sleep, to be honest, and to be able to not be impacted. So, I totally respect that they want to play, you know, under the lights. But just appreciate that it impacts a lot of us as well. Even people that are young and have kids and want them to enjoy the sport. So, I guess my question is like, this policy was in place for I don't know. I, I moved here five years ago. I don't know how long it's been in place, but forever until five years ago, years ago, we didn't have this policy. I think it's a pretty good place to live, and I think people want to move here anyway. So, uh, I guess I would ask, like, did, how did this actually impact our student athletes? Did we not win enough state titles because we didn't have lights and sound? I don't think so. We win state and everything every year, so I disagree that it impacts our student athletes in any way, shape, or form. We win state against the schools and other towns. I guess my other question is uh, the comment around the zoning and how others, other you know, towns, what time they turn off lights. They're not in my backyard. They're in random areas that aren't in neighborhoods. Of course, they don't care about the light timing. My, I want my daughter to go to sleep at 8 o'clock and not have to be annoyed because there's music blaring in her window. So it's just pretty frustrating. I'm all for the lights. I support that. I just ask that you at least use common, some common sense and, and uh, appreciate that there are folks outside of the school that actually are impacted. And, and to me, again, I don't think this has anything to do with the school personally. I think it's entirely about youth sports, which I get are insane here. But I grew up in Georgia. Football was my life. We didn't have the lights. We won a lot of state titles. And I had a great high school experience. So. I uh, appreciate the time. And, uh, but can I answer a quick question for you? Anyway, you said um, that it happened at like four o'clock in the afternoon. Hundred percent. Right, but that doesn't fall under the time. That, that's no, I'm saying the fact part. is, it's the decimal level of it's the combination of the fact that there's lights. Sure. There's also the fact that there's a two-hour warm-up where they're just blaring music in the middle of a work day when everyone's working from home. That's frustrating. So I think it's the lack of following the rules that I'm frustrated with, okay. and the fact that. I am 100% sure that if there's weekend, weekday games under the lights, I won't be able to work at home. And that impacts my career. And that's frustrating. So, okay. Appreciate the time. Thank you. So we might have to talk about this because what he's talking about is outside of what we're talking about. It's 4 o'clock. It, it, it's dark, dark at 4 o'clock right. in the summer. <coughs> uh, would anybody else like to speak to this application? Sure, welcome. Just please state your name and uh, address of the record. Good evening, uh, Paul Mahalski, M-I-C-H-A-L-S-K-I. -I. Oh, you're the gentleman that did the free Wrote the path, yes, yes. Uh, 371 Middlesex Road. If it, actually, on the patch, it did have the name. It just, when it printed, it somehow didn't have the name. So okay. it wasn't anonymous. Yep, then um, you also have your free information letter from two weeks ago. Yeah. Okay. Welcome. The, um, I'd like to just hand you, just following up on what Mr. Hunter was saying about you know other schools and how it impacts it. And I'll address this in my comments. But it's, I know this is in the record, but in case you don't have this, this actually shows aerial views comparing Darien High School to some other towns because I think the real point is there are only two towns that are relevant to talk about, and that's Westport and Greenwich. The others are in the middle of nowhere. Um, and in fact, uh, you can pass that around if you don't have it. 
Um, just before I start, to address a couple of the things that were said, in fact, I believe Westport and Greenwich both allow only Westport and Greenwich games to be played. Um, and I believe that Greenwich also limits their practices to 8 p.m. And they only allow six practices during the year, just for some of the things that were said. And as to why there were no complaints, it's because the neighbors were actually complying with the meeting with the administration and trying to work with the administration. So there were a number of times that the administration was contacted about problems and that it was dealt with and worked out there, which is why it wouldn't have come to the, the commission. Okay. Um, so before commenting on the proposal, I'd like to make one request to the commission. Um, Could I, before you move on, to yeah. that, uh, relative to this document. Which one is that, I'm sorry. This is the, the unlike Buchanan. Yeah. What, why, how did you pick the towns that you picked? Because we always go to Brian McMahon High School for like the lacrosse games under the lights. So the, but that's not one of these. So these are the, these are the towns that have been, for example, when the Board of Education was looking at comparable towns, comparable sort of residential character towns, um, these were the towns that were compared to look at their lighting regulations, towns where, you know, like more like Darien, not like where Brian McMahon is. And so that's how, where these towns were picked, is these are the ones that were often cited as um, which, you know, which towns we should be comparing in the charts. Okay, because I, I would say that, that Brian McMahon is pretty, is in Tokenika, or the, I don't know, is it called Tokenika? Yeah, Tapa Highland. The, but that's not called Tokenika. Row eight. Row eight. I'm sorry, it's a row eight row area, eight. which is, I think, similar, but okay. Okay. So, um, so first the request. I believe the public notice for this meeting was materially defective in inaccurately describing the proposals in several important respects. As a result, members of the public and neighbors of DHS who would be impacted by the proposals may not have come tonight because they were misled by the inaccurate description of the scope of the proposals. First, the notice describes the special permit proposal as, quote, to expand the permissible uses of the facilities from limited athletic use to include community-wide events and activities, including those of groups and organizations unaffiliated with the town or the school district. And in fact, the proposal is tied to Board of Education Policy 1200, which permits literally any type of group or activity including for-profit activities, political activities, protests, rallies, the notice is materially misleading. Second, the notice states that the zoning regulation proposal only applies to the stadium field of DHS. And in fact, it applies to all town and school properties of over six acres. Because of this material inaccuracy, there are many members of the public who would not be aware that they are potentially affected by the zoning change. Third, the notice states that the zoning regulation proposal is to permit only nonprofit educational and community activities, but the board's proposal would permit for-profit for activities and activities that have nothing to do with our community or education. Again, I think it's materially misleading. Um, and in addition, the administrative regulations that we saw tonight for the use of lights were added to the board's application just yesterday, even though they indicate they existed in June. This does not permit adequate time for the public to even discover them, let alone read, discuss, and appropriately consider the implications of the regulations. There are filing deadlines and notice requirements for special permit applications for a reason. <coughs> These should have been part of the original application or at least added well in advance of tonight's meeting. Uh, because of these defects in the 11th hour amendment, I would ask the commission to continue this hearing until a corrected notice can be published and mailed with adequate time for the public to prepare and then attend the public hearing to comment on the am amended application if they choose. Um, and now I'd like to just share, share some serious concerns about the board's application to amend its special permit and its proposal to amend the zoning regulations. Um, I am vehemently opposed to both as proposed. In many ways, the last five years have been an experiment to see how the Board of Education's guidelines embodied in the special permit have been working. We've learned several things. First, we learned in November that the school administration believes the current guidelines are working well from their perspective. In fact, the current proposal was approved by the Board against the recommendation of the school administration. Second, we learned that DHS and its neighbors could work together cooperatively when any issues arose. This was also acknowledged by the school administration in November. Third, we learned that the lights themselves are by far the lesser evil, thanks to the newer light technology. Although still an annoying sight, it's tolerable. Fourth, we learned that the greatest nuisance is everything that comes from activity under the lights, particularly games. Crowd noise, PA system commentary, pre-recorded music played through the PA system, the band music, whistles, air horns, car horns, etc. What is joyful on a Saturday afternoon is an unreasonable disturbance during the week and in the evenings. It is an intolerable nuisance. 
In this respect, even the current guidelines are too permissive, and I'm encouraging the Commission to tighten the restrictions on when games can be played and when music and amplification can be used. The music played before games often contains explicit lyrics, which is unacceptable with many young children in the neighborhood. The volume of the PA system is far too loud. One DHS neighbor recently described music from the field as, quote, insanely loud, preventing my kids from sleeping. The board didn't even respond to another DHS neighbor who told them their daughter has an auditory disability that makes the noise from the games debilitating. Game noise is particularly disrupted during the week when people are working remotely from home, as Mr. Hunter and students are studying. As a neighbor, I can attest to the fact that even through double pane windows in my house, I have difficulty concentrating or working when a game is going on. Disruptive game music also includes things like air horns and car horns. And just to address what Mr. Hunter was saying, as to the sound regulations, they actually are what we're talking about because the, the special permit had lights, but then it had regulations on sound. Those sound regulations didn't only apply when there were lights going on, they were when you could use the PA system and the sound levels of the, of the PA system. Um, I was tempted tonight to wear my New England Patriots hat. It bears a famous slogan of Bill Belichick, do your job. I considered wearing it as a reminder that the board's proposal is actually urging you, don't do your job. Even more astonishingly, the Board of Education is actually, actually asking you to let them do your job, and Connecticut courts have made it clear you can't do that. The Board of Education is effectively asking you to give them the power to determine uses and establish conditions for use of the property in a residential neighborhood, thereby circumventing your role as a quasi-judicial body charged with overseeing and applying the special permit and site plan requirements and the protections of the Darien zoning regulations and state law. I want to focus first on what I believe is your role regarding noise. Connecticut General Statute 8.2 requires that special permits be subject to, quote, conditions necessary to protect the public health, safety, convenience, and property values. Darien Zoning Regulation 105 states that you must consider, quote, the health, safety, and welfare of the public in general and the immediate neighborhood in particular. 1006 says, in granting a special permit, the commission shall attach such conditions and safeguards as may be required to protect the public health, safety, and general welfare, and to ensure continued compliance with these regulations. And importantly, Section 323B states, any use or activity that creates a nuisance, including but not limited to noise, shall be prohibited. And I want to emphasize, shall be prohibited. The special permit includes various limitations on noise. These were proposed, were, they were proposed by the school administration in 2016 based on an extensive report and set of guidelines developed in 2008 by a special committee of the Board of Education that studied the lights issue for months. For example, the PA system may only be used for DHS games, pre-recorded music may only be played during warm-ups before varsity games, the band performances may only be pre-game or at halftime, and the PA system must be operated within certain volume parameters. The board is asking you to remove all these restrictions and simply get comfortable with a condition that noise complies with state noise regulations. However, this is merely a disguised attempt to try to eliminate all noise restrictions. A school board member tipped their hand by pointing out at a meeting that there is an exemption in the state noise regulations for, quote, a sporting activity that has all local approvals, suggesting that their noise limitation would not be a limitation after all. So they apparently want you to be lulled into believing that you are satisfying your obligation to protect the health, safety, and welfare of the neighborhood with what they quietly think is a meaningless limitation. There are several serious problems with this. First. There is a very recent Connecticut court, a Connecticut court case involving athletic fields that sheds light on exceptions to the noise limits that may apply to an athletic event. They may apply to the game itself and unamplified human voices such as crowd noise, but that does not include use of the PA system or band music. The applicable noise limitation on amplification of music is 55 decibels until 10 p.m. and 45 decibels after that. Second. You as a commission do not have the luxury of simply falling back on the state noise regulation. You must impose conditions that ensure any activity that creates a nuisance is prohibited. And you must impose conditions necessary to protect the public health, safety, convenience, and property values. The state noise regulations are crystal clear that they are not legalizing the creation of a nuisance 
and compliance does not mean there is no nuisance. So you can't satisfy your obligation by simply relying on the noise regulations. The law of nuisance is alive and well in Connecticut to give you guidance in applying the applicable zoning regulations. In another recent Connecticut case dealing with a private nuisance, the court noted, quote, loss of peace and quiet in one's home, which has traditionally been viewed as a place of refuge and comfort from the outside world, is a serious injury, the economic value of which is not readily quantified. In another recent nuisance, nuisance case in Connecticut, the court said, the ability to have peace and quiet inside one's own home is a minimal requirement for the plaintiffs who live in a residential neighborhood. To those who would say they chose to live next to a high school, I would point you to the same court's response. Quote, it is no defense to an action for nuisance that the plaintiff came to the nuisance by knowingly acquiring property in the vicinity of the defendant's premises. To those who would say, but it's not every night, I would point to you to a recent case in which the court enjoined a nuisance that occurred only on Friday nights, but was on 12 of 20 Fridays. The court said, the plaintiff's use and enjoyment of their homes will be disrupted for more weekends than not for the entire spring and summer. This is not a slight inconvenience, and the plaintiffs cannot avoid it. I believe neighbors are generally supportive of the community spirit created by DHS games on Friday nights, but do not want use of the PA system or music other nights. So what I'm urging you to do is the following. First, permit some additional Friday night games as originally recommended by the school administration to the Board of Education. It's important to note that a chart presented by the school administration to the Board of Education showed that last year, the DHS teams didn't even use all the games under lights that they're permitted under the current guidelines. As a neighbor, I'm indifferent to which DHS teams use the Friday nights. It can just be a total that's allocated by the school administration. Second, restrict use of amplified sound to Friday nights and Saturday afternoons. Saturday evenings are a time of home and backyard gatherings that should not be disrupted with game noise. Third, require that amplified sound, amplified sound and band music comply with the 55 decibel and 45 decibel limit and require monitoring devices to be install, installed to ensure compliance. Monitoring devices maintained by the school are critical. Without them, neighbors would have to purchase equipment or hire sound engineers before every game. Otherwise, there's no way to prove the sound level of a loud, of a loud event after the fact. No way to ensure compliance with the special permit and the zoning regulations. In the past, when neighbors have told the administration about insanely loud music, they apologize, say it's difficult to control what happens in the sound booth, and promise to look into it. Fourth, continue the current limitation on band performances and recorded music. The second aspect I want to focus on is the board's proposal to remove the limitation on use of the lights only for DHS and Darien nonprofit youth sports. They've asked you to impose no conditions other than that the use complies with the DHS facilities use policy. It is by far the most outrageous aspect of the board's proposal in several, several respects. It is asking for advance approval of an unquantifiable and completely discretionary increase in intensity and change in nature of use. It is hard to imagine how such an approval would not be seen by a court as arbitrary and abusive discretion and an Ill illegal delegation of your responsibility to find facts, apply the standards of the zoning regulations, and impose necessary conditions. First, the board is effectively asking you to abdicate your role as the Planning and Zoning Commission and delegate to them your role and responsibility with respect to the future use of lights on the DHS statement field. This is true for two reasons. One reason is that the board can change the policy, which means it's, the, it's a meaningless limitation. In addition, even if you were to lock in the policy to as it exists today, the policy essentially permits any, time, any type of use. It only really regulates priority of use requests. I believe Connecticut case law is pretty clear that you may not delegate your regulatory responsibility other than purely ministerial actions. This is asking you to hand over the keys and not even keep a set for yourselves. Second, because the DHS use policy essentially permits any type of use, the school administration could approve use of the lights for nightly concerts, for political rallies, for protest rallies, for town parties, for events by for-profit entities, for concerts, rallies, parties, and events by non darien groups and organizations. But you have not been given any information on these other events that would permit you to fulfill your obligations under the special permit and site plan requirements to consider the health, safety, and welfare of the public in general and the immediate neighborhood in particular with respect to these activities. 
and to impose conditions that ensure compliance with all the zoning regulations, including the prohibition on nuisances. How can you possibly satisfy the requirement in 105 that the nature and intensity of the use shall be in harmony with the appropriate and orderly development of the district when the use could literally be anything? For example, unless you could conclude that turning the stadium field into a for-profit concert venue Monday through Saturday with no conditions other than the noise limit would meet all the site plan and special permit requirements, you can't possibly approve what the board is actually asking you to approve. You have not been provided with any traffic or crowd information other than for DHS sports events. All the information provided in 2016 in connection with the special permit and the site plan related only to DHS and Darien nonprofit youth sports. You haven't even been given information necessary to expand use to include games in which no Darien team is playing. When Darien is involved, at least half of the fans are local. Many can walk to the game. In addition, at least half of the fans are people who care about our town and the preservation of its character. A game involving two out-of-town teams means all the fans are driving to the game and parking, and none of the fans have a natural instinct to respect the neighborhood. You have no information on the implications of such an event from a traffic, parking, crowd, or noise standpoint. Third, what the board is requesting is completely out of line with what other towns with, with similarly situated fields have done to protect neighborhoods, and it is completely out of line with the recommendations in 2008 of the Board of Education Special Committee on Lights after months of review, including review of what other towns have done. In fact, the current special permit guidelines were proposed by the school administration in 2016 based on those 2008 recommendations. Only two towns are even similar to Darien for comparison. Greenwich and Westport, towns like Weston, Wilton, and New Canaan have fields far removed from homes. Again, to grant what the board is proposing would certainly appear arbitrary and an abuse of discretion given the DHS situation and history. So what I'm asking you to do is to maintain the current limit on the use of lights in the field for DHS sports and Darien non-sport, non-profit youth sports. Those are the only types of events for which you have been provided the information required in order to make the determinations needed under the special permit and site plant requirements. It's been working well for the school administration, they said so. There are numerous other problems with the board's proposal that I want to just touch on briefly. First, ignoring the town plan. Despite assertions in the application to the contrary, the board's proposals are not consistent with the town plan. In fact, I believe the board's application to amend the special permit mischaracterizes the town plan as it did when this commission found in 2008 that DHS stadium lights were not consistent with the town plan, the town plan emphasizes the importance of maintaining the residential character of Darien. On page 98 it says, maintaining the residential character of the community is a key element of the plan. A corollary to this is maintaining the character of residential neighborhoods. It goes on to say that the commission must, quote, continue careful monitoring of land uses in or near residential areas to minimize impact on surrounding residential neighborhoods. The board's proposal asks you to cease all monitoring at DHS. The only reference to light usage is on page 119, quote, lighting to extend daily use, extend seasons of the, quote, active outdoor recreational facilities the town currently has. First. This is a clear reference to use for only for Darien Athletics. Second, the term active outdoor recreational facility specifically lists only Baker, Cherry Lawn, Houlihan, and McGuan Fields. As this commission correctly noted in 2008 when reviewing the town plan, there is no suggestion this even relates to DHS or school properties. Second, ignoring zoning regulations. It's not even clear that use of the stadium field, other than for nonprofit sports, is permitted is a permitted use within a residential zone. While a public school is a permitted principal use, an accessory use is one that is, quote, customarily incidental or subordinate to the principal use. School sports certainly fall in that category for a public school, but not all the other uses permitted by the board's facility use policy. Even if some other activities were squeezed in under social, cultural, and recreational uses, serving a community need or convenience, it presumably is about the Darien community, and it specifically can't be primarily for profit. The board has not filed a new site plan with all the required information. Your zoning regulations 1022 clearly says that a site plan approval must be obtained prior to an expansion or change of use. Ignoring the health and well-being of youth. 
at a Board of Education meeting where the Board was discussing extending the time limits uh, that may be used on school nights from 7.30 to 9 o'clock is in the application. A mother who is not a DHS neighbor raised sleep and health concerns about elementary and middle school children playing sports until 9 p.m. on school nights, citing studies about the importance of sleep for you. Addressing her concerns, one board member said, I'm not getting into a nanny state of determining when or what time children need to go to bed. I think that's in the best interest of parents and not either in this board's purview or even in the administration's purview. So whether or not the mental and physical health and well-being of students is in the board's purview, you are obligated to consider the health, safety, and welfare of the public. The Thriving Youth Task Force presented a 2021 report to the Board of Education on dairy and student mental health and substance use trends. Quote, excelling in sports was cited as a significant source of stress, particularly for ninth graders. Just last month, the Darien Times published an article about four students pleading with the Board of Education to rethink academic and athletic pressure. It was reported one, young, one woman expressed that her life, quote, now revolves around trying to be the best athlete and student so that she does not let her teachers or family down. The Darien Youth Sports Leagues pushed the Board of Education to expand light usage from 7.30 to 9 p.m. on weeknights, school nights. If youth sports can practice until 9 p.m., it is highly likely the coaches will schedule practices until 9 p.m. There will be tremendous pressure on youth to participate and tremendous pressure on parents to allow participation. What about family dinners, homework, sleep, more unhealthy pressure? The school administration recommended against lights until 9 p.m. They recommended 8 p.m. This application was approved against their recommendation, with two school board members voting against it just for that reason. Ignoring history. Not only is the board's proposal asking you to abdicate your responsibility under the zoning regulations and state law and ignore the town plan, they are asking you to ignore the history of lights at DHS. When this commission rejected an application for lights at DHS in 1994, it noted, the hours of use and frequency of use need to be very specific if the commission is to have a level of comfort with the proposal. It appears strongly that the lighting of Darien High School would create a number of nuisances to several of the surrounding residential neighborhoods, and one of those they cited was noise. When this commission determined in 2008 that a plan to light the DHS stadium field was inconsistent with the town plan, it noted, quote, the Darien High School and its associated fields are located in a single family residential neighborhood. The town plan is generally predicated on the preservation of these residential neighborhoods. The commission policy has been and continues to be the preservation of the character of these neighborhoods, particularly of areas of competing uses adjacent to residential zones. Our traditional concern has always been light and noise intrusion from a special permit. When this commission permitted 30-foot temporary lights in 2012, it noted, quote, an important factor for this commission in its consideration of this application is the location of the high school in a fully developed residential zone surrounded on all sides by single-family houses and with the stadium field in particular located directly upon a portion of that neighborhood. This commission approved lights only until 7 p.m. and said a longer-term approval of lights beyond those contained in its approval quote, could have unacceptable impacts on the neighbors and upon neighboring properties. It went on to say the commission acknowledges the need to closely monitor the use of these field resources to ensure minimal encroachment on neighboring residential development. Any incremental use and physical enhancement to the existing fields and facilities is subordinate to maintaining the character and quiet enjoyment of these pre-existing neighborhoods. The commission has traditionally maintained the preservation of residential character with regard to any increased use of adjacent properties. Any longer duration would trigger increased scrutiny by the, by the commission. Any game or weekend use would also trigger increased scrutiny by the commission. And when this commission approved the current special permit in 2017 without neighbor objection, it noted, Quote, it was clear from the applicant's presentation that no different or more intense use is being proposed as part of this application. The lights herein are proposed for a very limited duration. Any longer duration would trigger further review by the commission. The Board of Education's mantra is that it wants to take back care, custody, and control of its asset, the lights. And it is asking you to ignore that the stadium field is in a residential zone asking you to ignore the priority of the town plan and the requirements of the Darien zoning regulations and state law, 
asking you to ignore your legal responsibilities as a quasi-judicial body administering those regulations and effectively delegate that responsibility to them, asking you to ignore the reality of the proximity of the field to its neighbors and the impact on neighbors of activities on the field, realities that this commission has been recognizing repeatedly since 1994. But that is not how things work in a residential community. Zoning laws are not about the property owner who wants to exercise their care, custody, and control. It is about others in the community whose health, safety, welfare, and peaceful enjoyment of their property would be negatively affected. Zoning laws and the Commission are here to protect against encroachments like this, where the many believe they can bulldoze the few. In the words of Bill Belichick, please do your job. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Any, any questions? Bill? I have a question for Mr. Mifredonia. Um From my recollection. Oh. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, just a clarification. Um, what's the policy on athletic um, practices? There's a, is there a limit as to how many hours a team can practice in any given day? Not hours, but days per week. You have to have one day off per seven days. One day off for seven days, and there's not a limit as to how many hours. There's not. No. There's not. Okay. Uh, Jeremy, relative to the nose being defective, did you quote unquote approve it, or did you look at it at all? Uh, Fred and I worked together. Uh, you may recall a recent application a few months ago that went before the commission, where uh, the, the opposition attorney, you remember that one, where he came in and said the notice is defective. Right. Okay, you remember that one? Uh, it, 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 it was fine. Yeah. I think in this case, it speaks for itself. Mr. Williams is the applicant. He, he can certainly speak to I'm this. I'm going to ask him, too, when he gets back. <coughs> um, and the other question is, are there any restrictions of quote, unquote, care, custody, and control in any other school property in Darien? <laughs> I don't understand your question. So are there any restrictions on homeschool where I live that the, the, that the special permit has anything special to it? Well, the schools in and of themselves are permitted uses as of right, which right. means if the buildings comply with the setbacks, Mr. Deneen and his team at the Board of Ed can run the schools in terms of hours, buses, location of the buildings. We've seen it, the commission looked at Oxford School not as a special permit, but as a landfilling and regrading and a site plan change. But if you think of something like Hinley School, where the site plan doesn't change and they don't have a special permit, they can change the hours of the school. They can change whether there's one library or two libraries. They can change the number of classrooms, the number of children. They don't need a special permit to do that. But do they need a special permit to have Haley happening at, or the Token Eat Pumpkin Fair or no, those the are, picnic man going to home school? You know, those are all related to a school and whether a school has summer camp or summer school, those are part and parcel of running a public school. So you could have Hindley happening at Darien High School? Sure. Okay. Darien High School can have a Hindley happening type Correct. event. With, right. with lights and, and tell whatever type of night, same with it, as, as Toganit does. Related to the operation of the school. Okay. But they can't have lights. Right, but the Ferris wheel's got lights on it. Uh, clicks, right? It shuts down. At what time? Eight o'clock, I think. Okay. I'm just trying to see if we if we yeah. regulate that permit at all, because I've never it's mainly yeah. happening and tokeny pumpkin fairs never come in front of me, and I've been on the commission for nine years. Yeah, mm -hmm. pumpkin fair is only at night on Fridays yeah. till eight, and then the Saturday Sunday I think it ends at like six. It ends early in the day. Right, like the, the, the seventh and eighth grade kids yeah, go there. On the, on the Friday yeah, night. you did that when yeah. you were on the. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Would anybody else like to speak to this application? Mr. Sini's in the house. Mm. Oh. Welcome. Bonnie, you got the spell? Yes, yeah, I think I might. <laughs> I might. Um, good evening, John Sini. Uh, like George, we actually swap places. And your uh, address, now, your address, sir? 36 Birch Road. Thank you. Uh, Darren resident Welcome. for 21 years. Um, I do sit on the Board of Education, but I can't speak for the board this evening. I think my representatives of, uh, on the board and Dr. Adley and attorney did a fine job. I wanted to give you my perspective as being the chair of the commission that passed the regulation change and passed a special permit to allow Darien High School lights. Um, I think you 
asked a great question, Chairman Albini, in that schools do operate as of right. In fact, when we were um, exploring uh, the regulation change, we had multiple discussions with Jeremy and staff about whether or not the use of lights would be as of right. Um, you know, part of my recollection is as we crafted the regulation change, we did carve out lights to be required from a special permit, but all other activities. You know, if you want to have graduation at 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock at night, um, you know, we'd probably be able to do that as, as a district um, or any other school-related activities, to, to your point. So just remember that. It's a residential area, but the schools operate as of right. Um, I have a long history with lights, too. I was on the DJFL board and helped uh, be the li liaison with the Darien Athletic Foundation. And we were very thoughtful as we you know, looked at how we'd accomplish the change in the zoning regulations and change in the special permits um, with neighbors in mind, clearly. Um, you know, I think Greenwich was mentioned. That was one school we said do not ever follow. They're, they have a perpetual standstill agreement. Uh, it's, it's a disaster in terms of uh, that situation at the high school and the inability of Greenwich to have proper care, custody, and control over its athletic events. Um, I would argue, I was on the roof and taking pictures at Staples when they first put up their lights. They beat us by a few years. If you look, I mean, literally, if you stand on their um, visitor stand, you look over a hill, you're looking down on roofs of houses. So the proximity, go on Google Maps. I did all the research back in the day um, and, and check the proximity. So, you know, Chairman Albany brought up other schools that aren't being mentioned, like Norwalk, like Brian McMahon, schools that we played at, you know, Darien High School when we didn't have lights. So, again, not speaking for the administration or the board, but being good neighbors is important for us um, to give back, especially when you, you enlighten uh, Norwalk uh, is going to go under a, a significant uh, redevelopment of its school, a reconstruction of its school and property. Um, Mr. Vanderbrock talked about extensive deliberations. They were very closed deliberations at the time between the superintendent, maybe a board committee, um, but they were not privy to the general public. They were not privy to the Planning and Zoning Commission as they were developing a proposal. They were not privy to the first selectmen or the town council at the time. It's very questionable how these, these arose, but that's five years ago. But they were not extensive deliberations, in, including the community. I will speak as a representative of the Board of Education. Yes, Dr. Adley did say, uh, say we directed Dr. Adley to, um, as a, to, to look at the times in which we would like to extend the lights or the district would, but we as community members looked out to our constituents and recommended a slight extension at that time. Uh, so it could be an asset used like, uh, by the community, uh, like Ms. Montanero said. Um, the sound system uh, was developed uh, with strict uh, design elements in place. You can go back, it's actually on the town website, and it shows a decibel level. Um, so um, you know that, that's not changing per this uh, application. Um, Mr. Michalski does a brilliant job of laying out his cases, or his case. I just want to remind the board in 2015 he sued the town, Michalski uh, versus Town of Darren et al. A lot of the same arguments, including a deficient filing, were part of that appeal, and he lost 18 to nothing. Um, lastly, I was part of the development of the town plan at the time. We specifically put lights in. So 16. Yeah, we took. We, I mean, I was part of the draft with you, Steve. Um, we sp and clearly our, our town staff, but uh, we clearly put lights in with the intention of lights at the high school and lights maybe you know beyond in the community. So, thank you for your time. Sorry to go on for so long, but uh, I thought that was an important perspective to share with you. Thank you, sir. Any questions from Steve? Good. Okay. Would anybody else like to speak to this application? Seeing none, that's the thing. One more? Oh, Terry Bach. <laughs> I like a small thing. I'll be brief. Jeff, congratulations on your new job. Thank you. Uh, you picked a, you picked a <laughs> bad day, I think. You, want to, you guys want to push that one again? Uh, Terry Bach, 7 Birch Road, Darien. Um, Spell your last name, please. B O C K. Thank you. Um, 
Uh, I'll be brief. I've, uh, in 15 years in Darien, I've served three youth sports boards and two today, and actually been before uh, Planning Zoning Commission on behalf of DLL uh, before, as well as uh, sit on Darien Junior Field Hockey today. Um, the, the advantages of this proposal are also tremendous to, um, to youth sports as well, uh, in terms of expanded use. Um, the only thing I'd ask, you know, to shine a little bit of a light on is, um, you know, Mr. Hunter talked about the broad benefit, the, you know, more state championships and everybody thinks of football and lacrosse. Um, it actually, many of the beneficiaries of this tend, might in fact not be those sports and actually like elementary school girls, for example. So um, field hockey has the distinction of actually having to triple in the last three years. So where we were a league of 200, we're now 600, and actually we're finding ourselves, frankly, in the have-nots of field time. So when you're thinking of, you know, fire departments parading in with uh, state championships in lacrosse and football, it actually may be that the beneficiaries of that are third, fourth grade girls, in fact, and not those groups. But and so to please consider that perspective. Um, though my own little bit in government and serving the public and in my professional career, I happen to be a big believer in home of best fit uh, for day-to-day -day administrative functions. Um, I've personally, as, as I've been involved with youth sports for so long, worked with the Board of Ed, dealing with our scarce and very expensive resources uh, for these fields. Um, if you've ever done that before, they are, they are very, very good at that and have all the infrastructure set up and at least in my 15 years, I've been a very good steward, steward and um, a, a good neighbor. And I think that I don't think there's anybody that wouldn't trust them with the day-to-day -day ability to administrate that. So for, for anybody that's been in that position of having to, and not a job I would suggest, because managing these schedules um, on behalf of the sports leagues, when people want to know exactly what their schedules are six months in advance, so they can schedule everything around them, um, it's a there, it's a very important job to make the town run and uh, administratively um, I don't think there's anybody in the youth leagues that support would would not trust them with the day-to-day -day operations of that and frankly the home of this but so thanks just can I ask you one question relative to varsity baseball are you involved in that at all I think I heard you like, being an announcer once <laughs> Uh, 15 years of uh, serving youth sports, that might have been the most fun I ever had was I got to, uh, and actually that's another good point, is all the, the opportunities for, I mean, Daft Media is a gem of this town and those opportunities I did get to, I did get to call for a game for varsity baseball. Do they have, do they have, um, you know, Terry Bach Jr.'s coming up to bat next? Do they have a PA announcer there at all? Uh, no, there's no PA on, uh, on the baseball field. Because, uh, okay. no, you know, baseball's one of those things we have, Unique field requirements means we can't share with other people, so we tend not to get things like PA systems and lights and that sort of thing, just as we're, yeah. we have strange dimensions to our fields, so we have to find other places to play. Got so. it, okay. But a home run, people cheer when the home runs hit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Anybody any questions? No. Good, great. Thank you. Yes, I just have a question for maybe Mr. Williams. Yeah, I mean, he's probably going to come at the end. Yeah, okay, great. We have one more. Come, Dan. How are you, Dan? Hi. Dan Baumgartner, B U M G A R D N E R, 64 Hansen. Um, I applaud what the Board of Education Administration has done since their deliberations earlier and maybe in late spring to address noise. Um, and But I would ask that this commission address the noise, both the, um, the hours uh, and, the, and the volume. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I didn't bring my state statutory code, but is the 45 and 55 decimal? I want to make sure we read that right. I don't have, don't have a copy of either, but okay. Because I know it's within state code. Would anybody else like to speak to this application? No. Mr. Uh, Wilson, I think you get the chance to close. Oh, hold on. <laughs> um, That's all right. You don't have to be slow. Well, my name is Doug Wilson, and I'm on the board of directors for the Darien Junior Football League, and I'm also on the board of directors for the Blue Way Booster Club. Is that your son? No, it, it wasn't. I wished it was, <laughs> but uh, well. he was very impressive. So a couple of things that um, I think just bear clarification. 
that came up in tonight's meeting that have been uh, a recurring topic in the community. Um, first, um, DJFL only allows grades 6th, 7th, and 8th to practice at the high school. I'm in charge of scheduling for DJFL, and I can definitively tell you that there are no second or third graders practicing at the high school, and we absolutely have no intention of practicing second or third graders until 9 p.m. in the evening. I thought that was a little, uh, okay, thank you for that clarification. DJFL has never used the PA or sound system in any of our practices or any of our games, nor do we anticipate using the PA or sound system in any of our practices or any of our games. Do you use a portable system at all? Because I think that was going to be restricted, right? You don't bring a portable system in place of. The we have not. We've not. Yeah. We do not publicly announce our games. Okay. <clears throat> I think that one of the other distinctions has been the nine o'clock cutoff time. Mm -hmm. In the late fall, when light, when the sun starts setting at an early hour, there are times when varsity games will be scheduled when it is impossible for us to arrange practice times. <clears throat> Our intent is not to run practices until 9 p.m. We're parents too. My desire is not to have a group of 40 6th, 7th, and 8th graders out at the high school stadium until 9 p.m. However, there are circumstances when other members of our youth teams will be participating in practices and games where there is the need to practice later. Unfortunately, that need cannot be served today with these restrictive provisions that present themselves in the application. Mm -hmm. In the old amendment, you mean? In the old amendment. Got it. So these are just some of the, obviously, um, you know, just for the record, my name is Doug Wilson, W-I-L-S-O-N, and I live, live at 43 Arrowhead Way in Darien. And obviously, I'm here to voice my support in favor of the proposed amendments. And I thought it was important that I come up. There's been a lot of questions around DJFL in particular. And rather than read um, a prepared statement, I'm happy to answer any questions that this board has. Any questions here? So right now, your cutoff is 7.30 for lights, right? That, that is correct. So what we're adding is an hour and a half. And how many days a week do you use that field? Just Monday to Thursday? Typically, we practice Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays during the week. However, we give our coaches the optionality of practicing on Wednesdays if they so choose. But as a practical matter, that field is used by DJFL three days a week. Okay, but in terms of Fridays, you can't have a Friday night high school event and the DJFL. That is correct. You can't overlap. It's that like is, that is correct. That okay. is correct. So we can't. We, I don't want to double count. What days are you here at Holohan Field with the temporary lights? So that's where our younger children practice, and they're also here three days a week. So important. That would be sixth graders and less. Correct. An important distinction: the Fairfield County Football League caps practices to six hours per week, okay. and no more than two hours per day. So the notion that we are going to have an open-ended practice that starts at 5 and ends at 9 o'clock is wholly untrue. Okay, that's what that. So we, up at the high school, you have 7 and 8 or 6, 7, and 8? 6, 7, and 8. And then at Holy Hand, you have 2, 3, 4, 5? Is that right? Is your second two, graders play football? Second and third graders uh, play flag football, okay. and that's at home school, and they practice once a week and have one game on the weekends. That's what I thought. Okay, so they don't put pads on until, until fourth grade. Third and fourth graders participate in a modified flag program that has pads, and then fourth graders have the option of putting on pads. And then the little kids, do they ever practice lead? They Which will. Is, they practice per the terms of the lights use agreement here at um, at Hulahan. Go. Okay. okay. So they're not even over there. So that's that's not part of that. The only reason that the younger kids would ever come to Darien High School would be in the instances of inclement weather, where the town shuts the fields because we don't want to do cause any damage to the fields. Then we will squeeze um, the younger kids in, but only in the in the case of extreme weather. 
So that's because of grass versus turf. You can play on turf, you can't play on grass. Exactly. Okay. Hey, would, they, would the little kids ever play a football game at the high school? Or they play older games? Do they play older games at the high school? Um, we play, our, our smaller kids do play some games at the high school. Okay, we're on Stadium East and on the other one. Stadium right? East and Stadium Field. Correct. Okay, okay, thank you. Any other questions for this gentleman? Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Thank you for your time. Okay, would anybody else like to speak to this application? <coughs> nope, okay, great. You're up. I've got a couple of questions for you and maybe Chris Manford can help you out. There's only 52 weeks in a year, okay? And there's only one Friday and one Saturday. So you're starting out with 52 times two. Right? In the sports seasons, how many weeks exist? Because it's not an infinite time. Is what That's I'm trying to say. So, Mr. Manfredoni here, right? <laughs> yeah. So we only have, we're talking about a certain number of outside days. Okay? So the sports season for fall sports starts at a certain point and right. ends at a certain So you're going to start the fall season second week of September? You're going to go the regular season to the end of October? So how many weeks so is that? Seven or eight weeks. Okay, seven or eight, right, times two <coughs> is 16. Right? Okay. 14, 16, yeah. That's fall. And then in spring, what's spring? Spring season starts again, say first week of April, and we'll go until third week of May. So you're probably again looking at seven or eight weeks. Okay, so that's seven, eight times two, right? Again, it's 16. So the outside date is 32 days. Uh, Fridays and Saturdays. Correct. Right. That's sounds the, right. That's the, the that's game. Sounds that's right. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm glad you brought that See, up. Right. Remember, it, it's well, a simple math. It's, well, not it's, right. it's also related to my question for, I guess, Chris and Joe. One of the big differences between the current proposal and what you're putting forth is, I think under the current proposal, it limits it to nothing from the end of school in June to the start of school in, let's call it September. Nothing. What do you envision by allowing you that use of time, clearly there's no varsity sports, there's no JV sports, DJFL, there is, what do you envision as you put in this proposal to use from, let's call it June 15th to Labor Day? Duke? I don't envision any use of time. Yeah. But it's the, the, the Policy 1200 says you can use the athletic, the, the school facilities outside of, this, outside of the school year. Right. Right. So, right. right. so, so I can have an express lacrosse game on a Saturday at Darren High School with Manfred Tony we can express the fields, which is really hard to get anyway because we wouldn't give them. Yeah, <laughs> That's I mean, all they would, the, the request came in, it would go through the process. Right. So. You know, it doesn't get dark till late in June and July. Probably wouldn't get dark. So you could foresee August where it gets dark at, say, 7.30 or 8 o'clock. It would not likely be used by Board of Ed teams. It would likely be these outside groups. Some soccer team. Who knows? But it wouldn't be for the sports teams. Okay. Thank you. And, and that would not allow the PA system. No, it's not. The PA system's not right. Th those are the kind of forever. I'm just trying to wrap my head around because it's it's not like you can use the field, you know, like like uh, Gillette Stadium, 365 days a year. No, that's a very good point. You're all actually the stadium on Fridays and Saturday nights. You're right. The uh, the season's even shorter than I was remembering it is. So that that was that's a great question. Yeah. Okay. Do you guys do you get where I'm going? Do where I'm going with it? Mm -hmm. right. it's yeah, not, I'm not terribly impressed by it, frankly. That's those, okay. <laughs> those are 30 days. That it's 32 days. It's a great right. nuisance to people. Understood. But it's not, it's not, it's measurable. True. Yeah. There's only, because there's only 52 weeks in a year. Okay. Thank you, sir. Well, welcome. Anything you want to end with? Just a, just a few things. I'll, I'll go directly to Mr. Mahalski, actually, because he had the most sort of inclusive um, presentation. I, I noted that he said early in, the, in his remarks that, they, uh, that he and his 
um, neighbors have not made complaints to this commission because they had met with the administration and worked out the issues. I think that's, if I heard it right, I think I believe that's what I heard, and that's been our understanding and, and experience as well. And so I just wanted to underscore that point because that's what we want. It's exactly that's, our point. It is what we want. We, we don't want this commission to be bothered by it, and the board, you know, the shoulders that responsibility to, like I said, have an open ear and an open door, um, and to try to work these things out. And so, if, as to anything you heard tonight. Um, that still remains the case, and that will still be the case, that the board will meet with folks, listen to them, and do everything possible to, to work out issues and concerns. But even before it gets to the board, it goes to the administrative policy. Correct. It's got to get past the administrative policy first. And that right. Right. And, and anybody, you know, violating the rules, well, their application may be looked at differently if they come back yeah, and ask to be, to be able to use it. It gets, it gets pulled. Right. You have to submit the form. You have to run through the and you have to comply with the rules. Absolutely correct. Fair to adhere to these regulations results in suspension of loss of field use privileges. It may, yeah. Great. Number 11. And that relates back to 1200. It's the same exact thing. We can find it the board. Great. Okay. I'm correct. Sorry. Uh, Mr. Mahalski had made a complaint about the legal notice for for this public hearing. I was strongly disagree with that. I don't know if there's any merit in that complaint. I actually, when I got this notice, I actually remarked to my staff, "My, that's that is a rather robust notice, more than you usually see." The only you're not required, as your staff, I'm sure, knows, that the, a commission like yours is not required to print the entire application in the newspaper and all the terms of it. Rather, you need to tell the public there's going to be a hearing, when and where is it, what the application is, what property is the subject of the application, and a summary of the nature of the application. And so two lines as opposed to 10 or 12, whatever this is, would have been sufficient. But it, you know, it states a summary and it gives inclusive language of what's being proposed and then the public knows you have the opportunity to come here and speak to it, and you have the opportunity to go and read the application in advance, and that's all that is required. So I, I believe this notice goes over and above the requirements of Connecticut law in that regard. Uh, let's see. And, and then uh, Mr. Mahalski complained about our submission of the administrative records, uh, regulations. <clears throat> they were provided when they were officially approved and ready to be submitted. They're not a required component of the application, so it, it, it's incorrect to assert that they needed to be submitted with the original application. Anything other than the required original components of the application can be submitted to the commission up through the close of the public hearing, just like Mr. Mahalski did with several items yesterday, today, and, and tonight. Um, uh, what else? I, oh, I also want to note that um, Mr. Mahalski um, and Mr. Uh, Vandenbroek are two of the four parties to the original agreement with the Board of Ed. So I thought you might want to note that you haven't received any statements in writing or here at the hearing from the other two parties to that agreement, uh, which I think the board can conclude means they don't have any objection to the proposed revisions to the terms. Can I, can I ask you a question, Mayor? Yep. In a letter that someone submitted for the, for the um, application tonight, it was an article out of the Darien, the Darien Night. There's eight people on this. Which is on the article? Yeah. We respect the board of selectmen and leadership to endorse for the vice president. Uh, there's eight people out here. Have you ever heard from any of the other eight, seven, six people? Nothing other than them being listed on there. So if, if some if, if some of those folks are listed there, then they, I mean, they have, might have they moved, have. they sold their house, they're not there anymore. That's true. Like I just I just Walker didn't Riley. see I didn't see any direct comments to this commission either here tonight or by email or whatever from whoever are the owners of those two properties. Put put it that way. Got it. Okay. My realtor is going to check and see if they sold their houses. Um, with regard to Mr. Mahalski's comments about the town plan and residential character. Um, I mean, a, a town plan obviously has all kinds of different goals and objectives that anybody can point to on any application, frankly, and say you advance some and maybe you don't advance others. However, I disagree that the application is inconsistent with the goal of the plan for doing things consistent with residential character because having school and community events, building uh, school and town spirit and camaraderie is consistent with residential character. Um, and as Mr. Sini very aptly noted, 
this town obviously decided a long time ago that a high school belonged in this particular neighborhood and the high school and its associated activities, um, other than a special permit for lights, is permitted as of right. Those are the main points I wanted to make in response and we are happy to answer any remaining questions and again we thank you and request your approval. Thank you. Any questions? Okay. Yep. We're going to answer. Um, let's, um, Mr. Williams, would it be problematic to amend the language of your proposed amendment to 405B where you indicate that uh, used to accommodate activities conducted in compliance with Dairy Board of Education Policy 1200 concerning use of school facilities by adding and any applicable special permit as amended? used to accommodate athletic or related activities authorized by the Board of Education and any special permit you're saying? Yeah. It seems kind of loose not to have reference to that in this. Uh, well, no, I don't think it's problematic. I also would say, though, I don't know if you need that in the regulation because if you have to get the special permit, then you have to get the special permit regardless of whether you add that language to the regulation. Because that's in number eight, too, isn't it? Granted my special permit to address unique um, characteristics. Actually, yes, it is, yeah. Sure, that probably covers it. Okay, so all right, I, I just have a sense that there was a, a feeling that um, the special permit wasn't really significant anymore, that we're simply going to rely on policy 1200. No, no, and, and I'm glad you point that out, Mr. Chair, because this, this language of the terms under five, I believe, was added as part of the board's application five years ago, and so it has always been, and we're not proposing to change it, it will remain part of the regulation that you can only use permanent lighting facilities if they're granted by special permit to address the unique circumstances, et cetera. So the permit applies and the regulation requiring you to get a special permit applies. Okay. And a special permit can have the times in it. It certainly can. Almost all special permits have limits on either dates and or times and or the YMCA has got a number of things there. Right. I mean, Middlesex Cubs lights for Palatine is going to have to be up by 10 o'clock. It's all the same thing. It's not a resolution anymore. It's in a special permit. Okay. Sorry, keep going. You're doing great. <laughs> Thank you. I was done. Yeah. Amy, you had questions for um, this gentleman? Um, I have questions more for uh, the, uh, Duke and Alan. Um, we heard a lot about n noise. Uh, being a particular concern, um, and it seems that you've, you've attempted to address the PA system, um, but I, I'm just curious as to what other what other feedback have you heard from the community directly with regards to sporting events, nighttime events? Because there's been an indication that it's not just the PA system. Have, what have you heard has been your feedback from the community? <laughs> I think what you heard this evening is accurate. One of the one of the takeaways from from the agreement was that uh, the noise is is generally more of a problem for our neighbors uh, mm -hmm. than the lights themselves. So uh, we've continued to try to address those uh, issues where where they come up. But I think in in my tenure, I mean, I think when they come up, we address them. And I mean, I respect the comments that were made, but if they're not brought up either via complaint to the administration, the board, or the police in terms of a disturbance of the peace, yep. we can't react to it. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. those instances where I've been phone called about um, lyrics on a sound system at the high school on a weekend and called Dr. Adley on a weekend and we handled it uh, with respect to the supervision that was going on at the high school. So. You know, I appreciate the comments, but unless it comes in, and we've spoken to the chief about this in terms of a public disturbance or a noise type thing, or someone calls or emails us or another board member, uh, you know, we'll react to it right away. Can I see Christian on the same line? My daughter was a post-53 kid. When she graduated and they said, Kelsey Galvani, the guy with the fire truck blew the horn. And his daughter graduated the last same year, and when they said his daughter's name, she is in her own high fire department. No. She, sorry. Uh, they blew the horn. Has anyone ever complained about a graduation blowing the horn when some, my daughter's name gets called? Not to my knowledge, no. no. <laughs> Thank you. 
Hey, so I'm trying to make sure that we know what noise problems is a problem. If, you know, I was kind of psyched when they blew the horn my daughter graduated. But. I think being a volunteer fireman for many years, I think they kind of are tame at blowing the horns compared to what they actually could do or <laughs> want to do. But I think out of respect for the, the graduation ceremony itself, I think they do it in a respectful way. I think so, too. I thought it was kind of cool. Okay. Yeah. Um, May of course I, you can. While I'm here, may I yep. just address that there was a video posted of me? May I make a comment about of it? Of course you can. I, I just some, yeah, someone's printed a 28-second video. Yes, yeah, so I just want to just, uh, just comment on it. It is accurate, obviously. It was recorded. Uh, but it's part of a much longer sequence. And uh, it is correct in the sense that I, I did say that um, we were happy with the agreement. Because we have been at, at the bit of a happy working agreement. Uh, for say, I also said in, in that short clip that we would, be, we would, with the exception of adding one or two days, um, which is actually what we said tonight we would do for our school point of view. But that was part of a much longer board conversation about the board ended up on different time asked me to go back and look at youth sports and open it up for other opportunities. So it would need to be looked at in its entirety. And yes, I did come back with a different recommendation than the board said, but that's not unusual sometimes. Um, and that's just part of a bigger process. I just want to acknowledge that. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, is there anything missing from this application? It looks like we're ready to close. Yeah, we uh, commissions. Uh, we posted everything. Is there online. anything you guys we think we're missing? Hard copies of what we received. I'm looking forward to reading 1200 at some point. Oh, it's, it's in the record. Okay. Then, with that said, I would enter a motion to close the public hearing. I got a sec um, proposed by Jeff. Looking for a second. <coughs> Adam, a second. All in favor? Hearing's closed. Hearing's closed. We will deliberate this, I don't know, two weeks, one week? Um, September, August, July. Yeah, the commission has 65 days to make a decision, which would bring us to. Um, I don't know. Middle of September. Is, is it going to be on? We have two more meetings left, so it's just before the summer break. We'll probably deliver, be, deliberate in at one of your upcoming meetings in July would be my guess. Okay. So we might deliberate July 26th or seven days by July 26th minus seven days. But just watch the agendas. I know I've been told they're kind of full. Thank you. All right. Why are the decents in the house? I don't know. 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 I thought it was collated for the application materials that were really not thinking about it. Not necessarily the three minute DOE time limit, but some kind of reasonable 15 minute time limit and then submit the rest for the record. I remember sitting at the beginning it's certainly uploaded to the application. All right, next up we have the um, Token Eat Club. So if you're done with the applications in high school, great. You gotta get a gavel. <laughs> and we never had a gavel. I always wanted to get like a big <laughs> one. Like a big one. <laughs> a cell phone instead. I just want to look at this because it's annoying. Thank you. <laughs> Decimals get faster. Okay, we're back on the record. <laughs> Um, all right, continuation of the public hearing. Our next item on the agenda is social, uh, Coastal Site Plan Review number 27, Ephes and Frank, Pledge Stem Referential Application, number 20, Ephes and Frank, Land Filling and Regrading Application, number 325A, Amendment to the Special Permit Application, number 22, is that Q? Why should I shut? Site Plan, uh, it's 22Q, Slight Plan. Tokeny Club Inc. for Tokeny Beach Drive. Proposed to replace the existing swimming pool and its equipment, reduce the size and renovate the bathhouse, relocate the stack bar from the area uh, ground level of the clubhouse to an outdoor area near the pool, renovate the existing stack bar area, make improvements to the terracing, walkways, landscaping, and form related site development activities within regulated areas. 
no, no intensification of use is proposed. The 5.17 plus minus acre subject property is located within the terminus, located at the terminus of Tokening Beach Drive and its intersection with Butler's Island Drive and is shown on census map number 67 as lot number 83 in the R1 zone. Jeremy, what do we got? Yeah, the legal notice here is uh, also self-explanatory. The main goal here is the uh, total rehaul of the pool at the Tokening Club. The pool is right on the beach, if you will, uh, and it's quite old, been around a long time, and for a uh, replacement pool. Uh, part of the issue here, of course, is the Tokening Club is right on the water. It's in the flood zone, susceptible to flooding. So uh, Wilder Gleason and his team have done a lot of work to try to figure out the best way to minimize flooding, get everything up to current codes, uh, flood codes, things like that, while trying to modernize this aspect of the club. So you hear a lot about modernization tonight and trying to minimize flood damage. And just before Wilder Source, we, we did get a letter in the record from um, uh, PNC staff, Mr. Talamelli Wilder's going to respond to that tonight as well. Okay. So those guys all we, all we those did guys. refer this to DEP. They sent in an email dated June 22nd. This member should have that as well. Yep. Um, I won't read the whole thing, but it should be in the packet. Okay, okay. we got it. Great. So, Wilder Gleason, welcome. Thank you. Wilder Gleason, Gleason Associates. I'm here with Mel Kernan, our architect, Bill Rutherford, our landscape architect, Tom Nelson, our uh, civil engineer, and Azar D. Schleicher from Race, who's our coastal consultant. And Chris Hughes who's, and uh, Arthur Collins are on the building committee. So we've got a team. I want to get through this in 40 minutes instead of the. <laughs> Jeremy promised it was 30 minutes the prior application. <laughs> I would like to get you out of here at 1030, so we're going to probably truncate this a bit Thanks. if we can. Appreciate in any event, let's. Uh, uh, and, and we have Namrata with us, uh, who's Hello. with the architects. Um, she's going to help us with the presentation. So if we go to the first slide. This is the, uh, uh, the Google Earth view. We're really dealing with this quadrant of the property so that we're um, dealing with the beach, the pool. This is the bathhouse. The pool equipment is in this corner of the bathhouse. There is a bunch of equipment outside of the, the heater and there's a propane tank above ground. It's a 2,000 gallon propane tank. There is this boardwalk sort of or patio that connects to the main clubhouse building that was recently built. This is the circular portion in the 1955 um, uh, blockhouse, call it, that uh, is a, a, it has actually served us very well because it's way high. And what has happened is there is a snack bar and um, a um, bar down there. And what has happened is we want to utilize this area a lot more in terms of a dining than what we have, because the dining was always upstairs. And we started doing dining on the beach, and it's been an absolute home run. And people love being down there, because it's informal. The kids can go out and play, and it's just, you're down by the waves. And we've cannibalized the restaurant, because nobody's going there anymore. So. That's part of the change that, as the club moves, that we're trying to adapt to. And the pool itself is 62 years old. It's got like original technology. And we're going to do a lot of good things in making these changes. And as part of it, this is the Montero house. Mr. Montero and his wife are here tonight. And we, Chris Hughes has been working with them to make sure they're satisfied with what we're doing. And we submitted the application after we talked to them initially, and then they've made some suggestions, and Bill Rutherford, our landscape architect, has made some changes to the plan, which we're going to describe to you tonight to address their concerns, which are basically, um, we thought they wanted to preserve their water view, so we kept our screening low, and now we're making it much taller to give them better protection and privacy, which was what they wanted. So um, those are sort of where we're going. Um, we intend to commence construction in 2003, the fall of 2003. 23. Uh, 2023. Yeah. It's all right. Yeah. 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 2023. So, anyway, um, 
And so we need a permit that's going to be lasting for at least two years. Typically, you give us a one-year permit if you give us an approval. We'd like two years because we're not going to start this till the fall of 2023. We need to complete it in the off-season, and we think we can do that. Um, there is no change in our membership. We are capped. We can't, we can't increase. We're at the max for everything. There's no change or intensification of use. We're open basically five months of the year, closed seven months, and it's a great place to be, I can tell you. And it'll be terrific when we're done. So let's go to the uh, pictures. This is the existing clubhouse. There's the snack bar. That's the opening of the snack bar. This is the concrete um, uh, boardwalk that we have. That'll get uh, pulled out, and a FEMA-compliant one will be installed. This is the bathhouse. The, west side of the bathhouse. It, can, it has a ton of old lockers that nobody uses. They're basically changing rooms. And they've been there for 50 years and they are useless. So we're going to tear this section down and we're going to keep the wet areas, the men's and ladies rooms, um, uh, and do some renovations there, minimal. Okay? Um, this is part of the bathhouse, which is the lifeguard station. And here's the pool. Um, a fence, and this is the, uh, there's a storage area, and this end of the, the bathhouse houses the pool equipment and an 800 gallon chlorine tank that is single wall and doesn't meet FEMA and would be a disaster if it were to let loose, and that's going to be fixed. And this is the staff housing, and that's the, the peak of the Montero house. Next slide, thanks. This is looking back uh, currently. We have some uh, tables out here. There's the snack bar uh, that's uh, underneath the main clubhouse, and that's the roof there. Um, this is the pool looking out. That's not the Montero house is here. That's the, uh, the Mangual house on the other side. This is the, tr uh, the uh, existing screening along the Montero property. You can see the pool is, well, it is really old. <laughs> Here we have other pictures of the pool and the property. Let's go to the next one. Thanks. That other one, with, that's this, the dining room's on top of the snack bar? Um, the di yeah, this the dining room is up there. So nobody eats in there anymore? And, and, yeah, there. I mean, we're doing very few. Uh, uh, in sh shoulder season, when it gets cold, people will dine up there. And there's a great bar up there. And it's a beautiful place to be in a call full day. But when it, in the peak of the season, you want to be down on the beach and you want to eat on the beach, and it's just the best. So um, what we have here is existing. So you have staff housing, the existing pool, bathhouse. See all these lockers? Nobody uses these things. They're going away, OK? Here's the snack bar and the bar, OK? We need to make this a more focal point, and we're going to move the snack bar stuff over here, and we're going to take the pool equipment, get rid of this end of it, and we're going to shrink the bathhouse, which is non-FEMA compliant, we're going to drop, we're going to eliminate about 29% uh, of it goes away. And we're going to add to the pool. So let's go to the next, yeah. So here's what we're proposing. The propane tank, which was here, is now going up there. It's going to get buried underground. We're eliminating what was bathhouse here, and we're replacing it with an in-ground pool equipment. It's the filters and the pumps. <coughs> and they will be in an 8 by 10 foot by 8 foot deep box underground and they're wet all the time from pool water. And it's, uh, Mellow will go into the details of it. But that's going to be here. And then we're going to create a vault that is designed by Azure D to resist flooding forces. And it'll be here with the door opposite <coughs> the, the uh, Long Island Sound. And we are going to put all the electrical equipment in there. <coughs> and the connections and everything in there. And the, our initial proposal was to have a, a large roof on that on which we would place a huge <coughs> commercial heater because mechanical equipment is supposed to be lifted, and that's got to be up at 17 feet. And that would be screened from the neighbors. And we have 
uh, an aluminum screen. <coughs> but is our pool consultant is, came is to us. Electrical equipment that's in there is that? Yeah, it'll be it'll be it's, it's, it'll be a, like a submarine. You can't get in there. And the submarine door in the back, right? So that's that's below 17 it's, feet. Or it's below 17 feet, but it's designed to resist resist flooding forces, and the regs allow you to do that yep. exactly for this sort of thing. Because we didn't touch this whole thing last time. Because right. Came. This is the, this is the one area of the campus and, and the cabanas right, yep. that haven't really been touched. So this is a major. Uh, a major project. So what we're doing is put the electrical in there and um, the idea is that the chlorine tank, the big chlorine tank, will be reduced to two smaller tanks, double walled, anchored and strapped down, designed by Azure D to resist flooding forces. And instead of a single walled 800 gallon tank. And then what our, our pool consultant, after we filed, said to us, you really ought to consider doing three at-grade residential heaters. That's thing. They are easily removed. You can disconnect them quickly. If a storm event comes, you take them, pop them up in the attic. They're out of sight of the neighbors. If one of them breaks, you still get pool heat. <coughs> Components are easy to find. And you don't have this big, ugly, scaffolding covered by a, 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 an impact on neighbors' views. So as uh, Mel is going to talk about that, um, but I just wanted to sort of preface that. But the pool, so this end is now pool equipment. We've cut off this and um, we've cut out the lockers here. We've kept a couple for storage because we're taking the snack bar out of this <coughs> end and moving it to, and this is a brilliant, this Vermont Island Kitchens equipment. It's on casters. It's, you take your snack bar, and it's right here. And when a storm event threatens, we can run it right into the elevator, pop it up in the attic. And it's all self-contained. All you need is an electrical connection, and you're good for the day. You can fry food, you can grill food, and that's what the snack bar is all about. <clears throat> and that's all gonna be here with a pergola and an awning that's retractable. And the pergola is going to be designed by Azure D to resist flooding forces. And then we're going to, uh, this is an existing um, concrete um, patio that will be ripped up because it's not FEMA compliant. It'll be replaced with something that Azure D designs. It's going to have an EPA uh, top. So it's that <coughs> really heavy, awesome wood that. Um, it doesn't it float. EK top? E e e e IPE. E and our current bathhouse is not accessible. It will be because we're going to have a ramp that gets us up and a ramp that gets us in so that people can access this and we are accessible, which is really important. ADA. ADA compliant. Yep. Uh, when you do a renovation like this, you've got to make that happen. We're doing that. So, um, let me just see. Uh, that's not female lifeguard. Um, Some of this stuff is also, uh, it, it, it's kind of given. The buried propane tank is going to be anchored, right? Yeah, oh, yeah that's going to be anchored, strapped down and anchored. And so all of this, we're doing a lot of FEMA compliance stuff and making it work. And so the other thing is, so the pool, the pool is redesigned. It now meets current standards for a six lane uh, pool, swimming pool, and we have the appropriate uh, dimensions for a diving well, and we'd like to get a zero entry. Just slide and you know, walk into it. Uh, pool. So the pool is a little bit bigger than our old pool, and we have increased patio around it, slightly larger. And um, so as part of coming a little closer to the Monteros, which we can do under your regulations, the Montaros have asked us to increase and beef up the screening here, and Bill will talk about that. And um, the DEP commented about the fact that we are going to be taking more beach space, that you know, beach is a protected resource under the Coastal Area Management Act. But the fact is that we made a lot of beach. 
pursuant to a permit that you gave us in 2019. That. So let's go to that. But did you did you do that? I didn't think you did. Yeah, we did it. That's you ran out of money or something. Oh yeah, it keep going. Not another one. Extended. And I, this is okay. Uh, this is the permit you gave. I remember us. that. I and we we uploaded this, so it's in part of the record. So this is 2019, and we added 11,660 cubic yards of sand, and it cost a lot of money to do that. And so let's go to the next. Keep going. One more, please. I asked Seymour's, <coughs> and for those of you who don't know, Jeff McDougall passed away this past weekend. I didn't know that. And I, he's a dear colleague, and I am so sad about this. But this is one of the last things he did. Wow. And it's almost accurate. So, um, he compared the survey before we did the renourishment of the beach and the new one. And this gray parched area is 7,200 square feet. So we increased our beach by a third of an acre. Whatever that is. It's not a third, but 7,200. It's a little under a quarter of an acre. So, and what we're doing is we're increasing our encroachment on the beach by 4,450 square feet. That's 60% of the beach we created. What's the distance though? And we increased the distance from, it used to be the setback from the clubhouse was 35 feet. Mm -hmm. It's now 53. Okay. And the setback from the pool is 53. And it was significantly less before that. So. We think that's a fair trade-off. We, we built 7,200 square feet of beach. Let us use 60% of it. Question for you, Wilder. Um, is there any view easements that run the D uh, no. on the oh, There's property? no view easements favoring neighbors or okay. anything like that. We own the property. It's not subject to view easements. We want to be a good neighbor, so we do what we can to make sure the neighbors are happy. Mm -hmm. So. Um, let me just see if I've hit, oh. The pool renovation estimate, um, uh, the bathhouse renovation, is going to be less than 50% of the value of the bathhouse. We've given you evidence of that. The reason you want to stay under 50% is that you have to lift it up to meet FEMA, which means all the habitable space goes up to, and that's the bathrooms up at elevation 17. Ain't gonna do that. So we're keeping it to less than 50%. And um, that that's really important, uh, an, an important part of it. You can see we're taking this part away, taking this part away. That's a five-year look back, I think? Three. 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 No. Five in Greenwich. No. And uh, I thought that was feds. back to the beginning of time in Norwalk. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, all our pool electric collections, uh, connections and shutoff valves will be in the flood-proof fall. Talk about that, Veronica and Kinch, I talked about. Uh, do, 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 do. I think I turned it over to Melo now. Right? Um, oh, I, I, I missed what two things, sorry. Um, Rick Talamelli's memo raised a number of issues. We'll address them, but there's two that we can't address tonight. He suggested, I think quite wisely, that the, uh, the club have a construction flood preparedness plan. What do you do if you're in the middle of construction and there's a, a, and there's a hurricane coming? How are we going to deal with that? We did that before. I don't recall ever seeing that, but we're going to do that and we're in the midst of drafting it. And there's also a normal flood preparedness plan that how do you deal with a flood if there's something happening or a storm event. How is the club going to make its operations? We're asking you to approve us, you know, three heaters that we can remove easily and lift and throw into the attic and other equipment like the Vermont Island kitchens. And we have our tables and our chairs and our umbrellas and whatever else that <clears throat> we do. How, what do we do? So we're in the process of drafting that. We're not ready to submit it. I would ask Mr. Collins, did he do that over at Narot Yacht Club? You didn't? Wow, that's what you did. So, okay. you know, I, I think Rick's going to have some influence. So, yeah. Uh, Sorry. 
Anyway, so, <laughs> so Arthur <laughs> Collins said no, they didn't, weren't required for the record. All right, Thank Bonnie? You. Okay, so um, what's, uh, we're going to file those, and we'd like to have this hearing continued for two weeks so we can give those to you, you can look at them, and if there's questions from staff or you guys have questions, we can review them and approve them. We'd just like to hold the hearing open for you to look at that and incorporate that in your record. Um, at this point, uh, I want to turn it over to Mel. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mella Kernan, M-E-L-L-A. I'm sorry, could you, could you sure. repeat that again, please? Mella Kernan, M-E-L-L-A, K-E-R-N-A-N. I'm a principal architect at Rogers McCagg in Norwalk, and we've been engaged by the Tokenique Club for this project. Um, and Wilder has really covered a lot of the issues that I was going to talk about. This is the existing pool here. It's a six lane pool, 25 meter pool, but it's not quite the typical six lanes. They're very narrow lanes. And then this is a diving well here that has a one meter board that's not really deep enough for today's standards. Um, the, pool, uh, the pool deck area comes along here very close to the neighbor's yard and then scooches <coughs> back in here. The pool itself, the shell of the pool is, meets the 25 foot side yard setback. Um, this, is, this heavy line here sort of denotes the area of the construction that's going on. It extends over here because we're going to do some interior renovations in the lower level of the snack bar and then comes up here and covers the um, existing changing rooms. They call them at the Tokeny Club, they call their changing rooms lockers. They're very small, three by five little cubicles where people do not change their clothes now because they're too small. <laughs> So we're going to address that. Um, a lot of this area is open area here. The hallways and stuff between the lockers are open. And then there's the wet areas where they have the bathrooms. Um, this area that's hatched over here is the existing pool equipment enclosure. And it is part of the building right now. And that's the area that we're going to take down, take away all of the existing pool equipment, because it's really not to today's standards at all. Um, the uh, next slide is the proposed. So this is the red outline here is the existing pool. We're putting the swimming lanes here, um, concentrating the sort of activity with the sunbathing and the lounge chairs on this side of the pool, closer to the beach, closer to the clubhouse. Uh, this, this will be a 25 meter pool, 45 feet wide, which is what you need for the seven lanes plus the, the buffer zones on the side. And then this diving well will accommodate a one meter board. This is a learn to swim area for the small children. That's the, what they call the beach entry or the zero entry and that it sort of starts at nothing. And um, it's 48 feet long because it goes from zero down to 48 feet at a one in 12 slope, which is sort of the ADA typical ADA ramp. Um, the Azure D will speak in a, in a minute about the construction of the whole pool deck and the pool itself on the beach, but there is a, um, a coffer dam around the perimeter, and so we will top that with the bluestone edge, and then inside with structural fill, we'll have the, um, the, the pool deck, which will probably be a, a brush concrete scored um, that's this area in here. That's why you see all these different rectangles. Um, the pool fence will be a pool compliant pool fence and also FEMA compliant pool, pool, pool fence. Which is a little bit of a, an anomaly there because the, the requirements are sort of different, but we'll work on that. Um, the, like I said, the, the bathhouse <coughs> then is this area up here, and then we'll come back to this area in a few minutes. So the bathhouse, next slide. No, uh, this is the existing bathhouse down here. This is the area that's coming down for the new pool equipment enclosure. Enclosure being that it's a fence enclosure. It's a screen from view from the pool area, but it's FEMA compliant. Um, these little lockers, we're keeping some of them along here and we're breaking two into one. So that instead of them being three by five, they're now six by five. Still pretty small, uh, making some of them ADA accessible. Um, this area in here is the wet area of the bathhouse where they, they change the showers, the <coughs> toilet stalls. Um, that will really be a cosmetic upgrade because we're very limited in what we can do with, to comply with the 50% the, uh, rule. 
And then in here, as um, Wider said earlier, there is a change in elevation from coming to the clubhouse to the pool um, pool deck now that is not um, conforming to any FEMA standards or ADA standards. Um, there's actually about a 15 inch rise from some of these buildings here down to the pool deck and we're using the pool deck and the construction of that to be able to get at least a 1 in 20. When you have a 1 in 20 slope it's very gradual and you don't need handrails. So we, we're trying to keep everything at the 1 in 20 and not make it look like it's ADA ramp but just very gentle slopes. Um, and then this area in here is the proposed uh, boardwalk. IPA is a fast growth mahogany, it's not an endangered wood. And if this system is um, slats so that the water can flow underneath it so that it doesn't become buoyant and doesn't float up. Um, to the next slide. Um, then that's where that is here, and then back over to the existing um, patio area that's here right now that will be repaired. Some of these um, fences that are around here will be replaced with better looking fences that are FEMA compliant. Again, something that can be either breakaway and hinged. Um, we'll be working on that in the next phase of the design. And then back over here to the lower level snack bar, currently there's a large pickup window on this side that faces this way and this is where the snack bar is. We're going to close up a lot of that on this side. Um, this will be the new snack bar area here where we've taken down the, um, the, the, the lockers and um, put a roof over, a, a, a FEMA compliant roof over the area where the Vermont Island Kitchen, which is this movable section that can be designed, the pieces are designed so that they will fit within the club's service elevator. Um, and then inside in each of the pieces, it's almost like a home grill. You have your, you know, your, your portable gas, you have your, uh, <coughs> your hand washing system and everything is all portable and the only thing you need is power. So that can come from a connection up at the roof so that it's FEMA compliant. Um, that comes out of the ceiling? The yeah, I'll just plug it in at the ceiling, exactly. All the power, everything will be up at that level. Mm -hmm. um, so then this is the new, this is the new um, layout for the bar. The cooking and refrigeration, everything is still in the center, no real change. Instead of having the pickup along this side, there'll be pickup on this <coughs> side and slightly along two ends so that they can basically <coughs> maximize the dining area. Right now the bar is in here and so it sort of crowds out the people sitting at the dining tables. Um, next slide. Before you, before you leave that slide, can I ask one question? Excuse me? Uh, before you leave that slide, um, from the edge of the pool where the swimming lanes are, how much surface do you have on a decking surface? On this, that, this, this we're bringing it to where the existing is right now. And what is that? So we have to have a five foot clear zone around for lifeguards. So we're doing 12. So we have a five foot clear zone all the way around. That's a requirement by the yep. state of Connecticut yep. Department of Public Health. Yep. Um, and it's a general public pool um, requirement for the clearest sort of space yep. for, the, for the lifeguards to move. And then we just have enough free sheds on, on that side facing back towards the okay. pool, which is another seven feet. It's um, also for the swim coaches. Her daughter's a swim yeah, coach. Yeah, so, so, so the lifeguards and when there's swim meets, they're being <coughs> there and water polo matches. And that's the side where all the spectators are going to want to go to. Do you have the circulation space you need? And do you have the buffer so the kids are not climbing on the fencing for the neighbors? Yeah, so this is, you'll see in a few minutes, we, we're showing this with an existing crab apple tree that's not yeah. going to make its, its way through the, the copper dam system. So what we have, and Bill Rutherford will speak to this in a minute, is we have very heavy screening with cedars and, and different planting here okay. to basically enhance what's there right now. Because what's, what's there right now is not existing, it's just one tree and a few sheds. So we will be putting in, and the tall fence will stay, and then the buffer zone will be there. Do you think the spectators will be on this side or over here? Uh, to the Please. extent that when, if that's where all the racing and the, the action is going to be for swim meets and water polo events, they're going to go to that side. You mm -hmm. don't think Marge walks up and down that side? <laughs> I, just, I just wanted to yeah. know how big it is. Yeah, no, I guess that's important. Just contemplation that there's going to be a buffer so kids cannot. Yes, oh no, absolutely. This is a 10 foot high fence right now. There's a okay. 10 foot high fence there and it'll maintain that. Um, along along this part, at some point it drops down to eight, 
but there's no intention to take that out. And um, like I said, there's the, the cedars will be along here too, and then viburnum as it gets closer to the water. And it's a six lane pool, you said <coughs> 1.7 lanes, I think it's just. Six, lane, six lanes at seven feet a lane, and okay. then you have eight, 18 inches on each side of the two side ones for the ladders and whatever to not approach into it. This is just an idea. This was something we put together for ARB just to show some of the materials, trying to stay in with some of the more natural materials, taking the bathhouse, painting it a light gray to match the clubhouse so that it's not so stark. Right now it's very stark. This is some of the state-of-the-art equipment that uh, Wilder talked about. This is this um, compact vac sand filter where it's, this is great ground level. So this grate is at ground level and it's actually filled with, um, <coughs> with the pool water at all times. So when you have a gutter system, which is what this pool is going to have, um, there's constant movement of the water back through the filter system. You also have a surge tank so that when people come into the pool, the, the water doesn't go over the edge of the pool, it goes back into the surge tank. So that basically fills this tank up here and all of this equipment is always underwater. So that means that if there is a storm event, it doesn't have to come out because it's basically full of water already. Um, this is the smaller double wall. There'll be two of these, the double wall. Um, uh, chlorine tank that is top filled. This is just a smaller pump for the for the chlorine that will be bought in part of that electrical building that we're talking about, putting all the electrical connections <coughs> and electronic because there are pumps and different things that happen automatic now that don't have to be in any way manual. And then these are the small pool heaters which are really just a residential size. This is 28 inches high. Um, this is very easily disconnected and taken away. So if we did this at ground level, this was this is why the pool contractor had re recommended that. This was sort of the screening we talked about using if we had to put it up high. Um, this is, sorry, go back one. That's the Vermont Island kitchen system there, and it's on casters, and there's, um, you know, the counter, the worktop is behind, and then this shows how the water distribution system is contained within that down here for the hand washing. Mm -hmm. So we've looked at this with David Knopf at the health department. Mm -hmm. it, it, who, is, who has to sign off on the 50% rule? Do you have any involved in that? Department. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So you're going to work with that, right, Ron? Um, uh, we're confident. Rick has looked at it, and I think he's comfortable with where we are. I can't get oh, I'm sorry. Yes. yes. Rick yes. Talamelli of our office has reviewed that with Wilder, and he's comfortable with it. And if he wasn't, it would have been in his memo. Right. Okay. He, he came out with Woody to look at the property and then looked at our memos, and he didn't mention it in his memo, so I think we're fine. And it goes, it goes off the assessed value of the property? Yes. Yeah. It goes of the building. Of oh, the building. There's of, many of that, different right, right. of that specific percent building. of that building. Because it's a reassessment year, right. too, so it's probably yeah. going to it's yeah. gonna change. This is just taking the existing <coughs> building, showing you some of the natural materials that are going on, at the, that it'll be painted gray to be more supple, like the existing building. Um, this was where the, um, the electrical closet here with the screen on the top Hopefully we won't need the screen, but we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, these are some of the pergolas here. Uh, this is a pergola over the Vermont Island kitchen. This is a pergola here over the Vermont Island kitchen with the units behind. And I, that was just the alternate option showing the electrical closet with the water facing inward away from the, from the uh, Long Island Sound uh, with shut off switches and connection panels inside. Um, CO2 mounted to the outside, chlorine mounted outside because you don't want your chlorine interfering with your electrical connections in here. And then this is the size of the three small pool heaters that would be used if the residential ones were on grade. And then that's the vac filter system buried in the ground. <coughs> and all of that will be behind a screen fence, screened both from the tennis courts and screened from the pool so that it wouldn't be seen, but it would be outdoors, so it wouldn't need to have any roof or anything over it. This is just a gate, gate system here out of the pool, gate system here for somebody to go in and maintain the, the equipment. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and then this is a lighting plan, very little lighting happening in here. There will be some pool lights just in the pool itself, just for safety. Um, there are some lights mounted on the building right now, which are basically egress lights out of the pool. Um, this, this, we're putting something like this just up, everything will shine down. Uh, it shall light the path of egress. It has to be up high because it has to be out of the FEMA zone, so it has to be up around the fascia of the top of the building. Um, all hooded lights, all um, facing downward. Some lighting for the staff to have if they need it under here with some paddle fans up, mounted up on the, under the roof of this to make it um, the environment workable for the that's people the working that's in there. The kitchen, right? That's the kitchen area. That's where the, so the grill areas are not under roof, but the refrigeration areas and the walkway where the people will be working are under roof. So there's no air conditioning inside there. It's just paddle fans. Pardon me. There's no air conditioning. It's just paddle it's fans. It's paddle fans, and we have to make it. Well, yeah, we have to make it workable. Okay. Um, and then uh, just again, some of these lights are inside. The, um, the existing building to light the walks so that the people, not inside each of the individual areas, but so that somebody can get out safely. Um, and then catenary lighting, which is a dairy end word that I never heard before, you guys to look it up to see what it meant when I saw your list. But yes, there is some here right now that we'll, ma we'll maintain over the dining area and we'll probably add a little bit just in this area too, which can come down. That, I think, is it from me. Yeah, that's it from me. Great, fantastic, thank you. So we'll this is the landscaping plan, right? Yes, yeah, so this is the landscaping plan. We're just here. That's enough. Okay. Okay. Then we're going to hear from McCord Engineering, right? I'm next. next. <laughs> William Rutherford, it's R U G H E R F O R D. Thank you. Yeah. And I'm architect. Welcome for the project, thank you. Um, I, I worked with Mela on the overall site development as well. And um, what we did, and starting in this area, we, we actually increased the size of this planting bed. Um, our handicap ramp is in here. I have two beds on both sides, uh, which were added in. This is the only existing planting that exists. Uh, there was no planting at all over here or all down in here. I'm so. sorry, you're going so far away from the microphone. Okay. I'm, not, I'm having, you can pick the microphone okay. up and <laughs> well, just take the microphone okay. out of the stand. And there you go. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. Let me, let me get that. I guess this can go like this. Okay. Whoop. I'm just take it out of the stand itself. That's, yeah. That's Does it come out? There we go. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. So um, we, we created planting beds all through this area here, uh, which is the building is here, and then there's fence areas in here. So we're going to have planting all up against the fencing. And then um, uh, this whole area, which has no um, planting at all, is going to become solid planting. Uh, I started up here. The, there is a fence along the property line with the, our neighbor's property. Uh, it does start out at 10 feet high and then um, somewhere right in this area, I believe it drops down to eight feet and then goes down to six feet and then the last little bit is four feet. So we're not touching that fence, right? No, the fence is... You can have eight foot fence next to a special permit use. Yeah. This is an existing no, fence. It's, 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 right. We're not right. So we're not touching the fence at all. Um, so on on uh, our side of the fence, I've um, I have uh, cedars. Uh, again, all the planting in this area here is all native. It's because most of it is in sand. So all these plants are. Uh, this is a good habit, you know, area for these plants to grow. Um, so I've got the taller cedars. They um, could get up as, as high as 25 feet, um, you know, when they mature. Um, it's up to the club and the neighbor to decide how high they want those to grow. Uh, that's something that they can work on. Then as we got down here, I went to viburnums, which uh, again, are native, and they will get up, they can get up as high as 8 to 10, possibly 12 feet. And then as we get down towards 
um, this area and our fences are lower. I've got shrubs and um, one of the things I'm looking at in this area is going to dune grass, um, which is will hold the, the, uh, the sand um, in, in looking at the storms. And, uh, so uh, that you know will get up to be about 18 inches, maybe two feet in height. But that's way at the end. So. How will those plants hold? Hold on, hold on, hold on. We get into that in a second. Rather, are we going to have an agreement between you and the neighbors on the max height of these um, things? I, excuse me, Bill. Yeah. Um, and what are they? What height are they going to start at? I, 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 the the ten foot fence will remain. The eight foot will remain, and I think there's an understanding that's not put in writing, but I think Mr. Montero sent an email today, which is part of the record. We are looking at expanding and extending that eight foot fence closer to the water. Um, it has to meet FEMA, it has to do all these other things, but we will work with the Monteros to do that, and Chris Hughes is going to address that. But uh, And then the, whatever the Monteros want in terms of plantings, we will do. That's what I'm trying to put in the resolution. Yeah. You know. I, I, the planning plan is going to be subject to an agreement with the neighbor, and frankly, my understanding is we're going to do what, what we reasonably can do uh, that meets the needs or desires of the Monteros. Can we put the max height of the, of the plantings in the resolution, Jim? Because one of those things start, one of those things start out at 12 feet, and they go to 25. Here, um, um, right now I have the cedars at um, uh, eight to nine feet, and they can grow up to 25. They can, eat, yes, they they can max out at that height. Okay. So I'm just thinking that you're going to eventually come up with you're going to come up with some height that's the max. I I would I would just leave it at the max, and if the Monteros want us to cut it, to cut it. I mean, I, that to me makes the sense. And the viburnums, you said, were eight. Right, and, and eight I, I think one of the things we'll be looking at is, okay, how far do we bring the taller plants before we drop to the lower right. plants? Uh, I just learned about this last Thursday, so this is something we all have to work out. Of. Yeah. And, and we're, you know, that, that's what I'll, I need to look at. I'd I mean, love to go to his property and even look at it and work with him on, okay, here's where they end. and. Whatever, so that, that, that will be the next phase. How big is that planting bed? The way feet. What's the depth of this planting bed? Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, I believe we're 12 feet here and uh, 15 to. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because the pool is 25 feet away. Yeah. It's yeah. It's 25 feet away. We're not going to have. Got it. it. It's all. There's no grass. Yeah. But it's, a, it's a deep bed there. to allow those yeah, trees to grow. The, yeah. And then in front of them, I got shrubs, which will yeah. get up, you know, yeah. four or five feet in height too. We do have one limitation that there are some uh, drainage structures in this area here. Uh, it's going to be right here. Oh, right there. Okay. That's one of the reasons I have the grass because I may only have. Uh, 12 or f two feet of uh, sand to grow in. Um, so if, if, if there's any other questions on the planting, I... Is it on this side? <coughs> good? You good? We're good. Thank you, right. sir. Okay. You want to go? Yep. Or he's, he's the big kahuna. <laughs> Move down. Got a couple wide. <laughs> he's the guy that's important. I am. Jeez. <laughs> Uh, Tom Nelson, professional engineer with McCord Engineering. Can you spell your last name? Sure, N-E-L-S-O-N. Thank you. Um, I thought I'd start with the construction sequence and then get into some details on, on some of the other uh, uh, site development um, components. So uh, construction sequence, of course, will start with establishment of the silt fence and the limit of disturbance here on the beach. Um, <clears throat> after uh, also establishment of the construction staging area and the gravel parking lot that's north of the existing tennis courts and stockpiling areas. We anticipate two stockpile areas, one out by the road for your typical construction materials and another one down on the beach that will strictly just be for beach sand that they're going to gather up, move away from construction activities to respread at the end of the project. Uh, once the uh, staging and, and uh, demarcations are established, they can uh, start removing the existing pool equipment, which is located in between the bathhouse and the staff house. 
uh, and that allows them to then bring in the construction access. So all the construction access will come down uh, this road and right straight on into the construction area. It's a driveway, it's not a road. Well, exactly, yes, you're right, existing driveway. Good point. Um, once the, uh, that's all established, the demolition can begin. So we have the components of the pool house that are being demolished and probably more, uh, much larger, obviously, the, the existing pool and pool patio will be demolished. Uh, once the demolition, the demolition is finished, then they can uh, install the uh, sheet piles around the entire perimeter or, or the three sides of the proposed uh, pool. The sheet piles are actually, and we'll, uh, there'll be some more details on that later, but the sheet piles are on the edge of the pool patio. Uh, they uh, will create a copper dam for the excavation and dewatering for the pool construction. And, and they also kind of are now gonna contain the construction activity. So all of our earthwork is now gonna be protected by the sheet piling system. They stay in place, it'll be there permanently, it'll become a, uh, the base of the uh, new patio. So the sheet piling is actually kind of doubles as an erosion control. Uh, once the sheet piles are in place, excavation for the pool shell can begin. Uh, the watering measures are proposed to a, a dirt bag um, <coughs> on the beach so that we maintain clean water discharge. Um, excavation material uh, largely will be removed from the site. We don't anticipate that much of the material excavated will be usable as a structural fill required for the uh, base of the pool patio. Um, once the excavation is complete, they can form a pour the pool shell, uh, install the underground utilities, uh, install the pool decks. Meanwhile, bathhouse renovation is taking place. Um, and then we sort of start backing our way back out of the site. Be beach sand gets respread. As we sort of move out, we can start to install the above ground utilities, all the pool equipment. And then, you know, as we finish up, cleaning up the landscaping and all the finished uh, components, uh, finishing components around the pool and the bathhouse. Um, stormwater management is essentially designed to mimic the existing conditions out there. The current pool patio, sheet flows, uh, the majority of it sheet flows to the adjacent beach. There is an existing trench drain between the bathhouse and the pool. Uh, those conditions are, are essentially maintained. We're proposing uh, a Three sides of the pool will sheet flow to the beach and then trench drains uh, between the pool and the bathhouse and along the western edge will capture a portion of that pool runoff. Um, the pool runoff is relatively clean, uh, however we did feel it was appropriate to capture that and put it into an underground detention system and treat that first flush as it's consistent uh, with coastal properties. So the first one inch of runoff from those pool patterns that are captured will be sent to an underground detention system. The underground detention system is located below the boardwalk. Um, that boardwalk is in segmented pieces, so it allows for removal of sections that will give access to the manhole and, um, <coughs> and inspection ports uh, so that we can maintain that underground detention system. Um, underground detention system obviously is designed to infiltrate into the underlying soils. We've got great soils out there. We've got nice beach sand and, and, and it actually kind of moves into kind of a gravelly base uh, about two or three feet down. Um, I've had some preliminary conversations with the Department of Public Works. We, uh, I don't think they've issued a formal uh, memo yet, but uh, I do believe that we're sort of in agreement on the uh, design strategy for the stormwater. Well, we did. I have to find a set of letters. They had no comment. I don't. Oh, no comments. No comments. Oh, so you're, you're. That's even better next time. I was like, what? That's it. It's a first. That's so. great. Uh, it's all on you, man. We had a very, very good conversation there. <laughs> it's all you. You just better not blow it. Um, thank you. Um, the pool backwash system. The existing pool um, is a it uses a traditional sand filter and it backwashes to underground tanks and dry wells located between the bathhouse and the staff house. Um, the, up, the new uh, pool obviously had a significantly <coughs> upgraded backwash and, uh, and sand filter system. Um, 
the system itself, as Mel described, is actually entirely underground, uh, you know, below grade. Uh, it's submerged, so it can be, uh, you know, inundated with floodwaters. It also has uh, much more efficient re uh, reductions. We expect 50 to 70 percent reduction in the amount of, of backwash discharge. Um, so we have a pretty small detention system required for that. That's located here along the edge of the pool patio. Um, Again, that system is designed for uh, infiltration into the underlying soils. Um, the septic system exists underneath the tennis courts. Tennis courts. Uh, you may remember that was constructed in 2016. It's a, uh, it, it was a pretty advanced septic system. Um, there's no impact to that septic system. We have no new connections to that septic system. Um, and we do not anticipate any increase in flows to that septic system. So, uh, touch the bathrooms and shower. Exactly. So really there's a reconfiguration of some of the eating areas, a reconfiguration of some of the cooking areas, but really no increase to the amount of uh, design flow to that system. We have had a number of conversations with the health department. We are in the process of this season of, of increasing and improving our monitoring of, of the usage of that system. Um, it's something that we've struggled a little bit with. The system itself is working fine, but the monitoring components have been a little bit uh, buggy. So we're working through that. We do feel pretty confident based on the data to date that we should be able to obtain health sign off uh, at the end of, of, the, of the season once we are able to provide health with accurate data. Um, we're also working towards a flood preparedness plan for the construction as well. They mentioned that's something that will be forthcoming. Uh, we want to make sure that it outlines procedures for the contractors to maintain safe conditions um, in advance of a flood event. Um, so to quickly summarize, uh, we've got erosion control, dewatering measures, uh, specific sequencing that will <clears throat> be implemented to prevent impact to Long Island Sound and adjacent property owners. Uh, we're working on a flood, flood preparedness plan uh, for, during construction activities. Uh, we've significantly improved the pool backwash treatment system and we believe the stormwater management system meets the town requirements for treating uh, water quality and also uh, reducing, uh, uh, <clears throat> um, I'm sorry, and we'll also uh, prevent any impact to adjoining properties and uh, provide you know no impact to the uh, to the drainage on the site. I'll turn it over to the next one. Let's tell a couple of questions first. Sure. Hours of construction, kind of type of equipment you use to dig out this new pool. Is it coming in from the street? You know, I'm, I'm concerned about the neighbors if they have a huge construction zone with a crane that's five, you know 25 feet tall. So, um, so, you know, obviously a sheet pile uh, establishment will be, you know, larger equipment excavation of the of the pool shell will require excavators, but the, you know, the corridor here is again, it's going to be along this existing driveway, uh, staging again up here in the front. Um, you know, we can certainly discuss hours of operation, I think for sure. Um, I think that's <coughs> completely reasonable. Um, we weekends, we did the same thing with the, the last thing we let them do is paint the inside of the clubhouse on Sundays, I think. Oh, really? Okay. Uh, I think Great. that's certainly something. Because are we, are, we, are we hammering these piles, these sheet piles into the ground? Yes. So how many days of hammering of sheet piles into the ground do you have? Um, I'll defer to uh, any ideas, Andrew? <laughs> If you're going to answer the question, but I mean, you're coming back another day, so you can make a list. That these are the yeah. things that you know that it's important to us. All right, so um, you're not, you're yeah, not yeah, pounded it's certainly something we can do month. some more Until investigation we, on. In terms of that, next two weeks, we uh, we are thinking that we're going to vibrate the sheet piles down, and if we get refusal, then we're going to have to use the, the hammer. But he, he's the engineer, so. That's, that's uh, uh, it's beyond my, uh, my area of expertise. So I, I'm, I'm talking to Chris. Do you, Chris, do you want to address that? I'm going to let Asher, if that's all right. We'll let Asher deal with it. I'm next, okay. I'll address it. All right. Oh. How tall are these sheet pile things? Are they like 16 feet tall? Oh, you oh, jam them. Asher, do you want to cover that in your presentation? Yes. That's okay. fine. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kick over all, uh, all sheet pile questions to Azure D. Uh, any other questions for me before how big, I go? How big are the excavators? Excavators are going to take out the pool. Oh, they're going to be the big ones. 
Uh, I think that, you know, realistically, uh, the depth and the amount of material that needs to be moved, I think the bigger is going to move those, move that material faster and, and kind of, you know, keep that noise operation as quick as we can. That's what we're going to need to know. Okay. Hours, length, time. Okay. Thank Very good. You. Anything else for these guys? Good? Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, who did, who did the percentage thing? Is that you or somebody else? Yeah. The lot coverage, is that you were talking about where you wanted 60%, is that oh, him? Oh, no, I, that, that was, I talked about, we are, in, we increased the beach or the area by 7,200 square feet and we're taking about 4,450 square feet of increased pool patio, et cetera. So that 4,450 is 60% of the 7,200 7, square feet of beach that we created by renourishing it. So uh, I'm looking at the bottom of Jeff and Dupas. Oh, chart. we're well below coverage. It's right, the coverage is 20%. Yeah, but, but it was more. The acreage didn't change. That was in response to the DEEP comment that you're covering up the beach, and the beach is a coastal resource. And so Hazard D will talk about that, but I figure we built more than uh, an additional 40 percent so, 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 so at least get us uh, let us use right. it please i want to make sure we hear from the neighbors before we yeah. end tonight yeah. <coughs> azure d Slicher, principal of race coastal engineering a z u r e space capital d e e it's one uh one name two words last name Slicher, s as in sam l e i c h e r Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, so I am I'm the uh, the FEMA expert and coastal engineer uh, on this project. Uh, so uh, many of uh, my colleagues here has, uh, stole some of my thunder, but um, uh, as Wilder mentioned, uh, Race will be responsible for designing all of the uh, structural elements of the project that are within the flood zone and are required to meet uh, FEMA compliance for. Uh, wave loads and uh, flood pressures and depths and so forth. Uh, so that includes the pool structural shell, um, the scour uh, protection, the, the sheet pile wall uh, surrounding that that Tom mentioned, uh, all the all the patios uh, and uh, and the pergola posts and, and things uh, that are below the BFE, uh, including the um, the proposed uh, equipment uh, electric equipment vault which will be a uh, cast in place, reinforced concrete uh, bunker, essentially, uh, with, uh, uh, with all the uh, electronic equipment uh, inside. Um, and so uh, I've uh, submitted a 10-page um, um, Coastal uh, Area Management Act uh, compliance, Section 810, as well as uh, Section 825 Flood Zone Compliance Report. So I won't reiterate that. That should be in your package. Uh, a lot of the things that were uh, mentioned, again, were um, all of our work, uh, including the construction activity itself, um, will be uh, landward of the coastal jurisdiction line, and so we are, um, you know, out of uh, and and have no uh, uh, direct uh, or indirect in impacts to tidal wetlands. Um, there are some on the site uh, that will be protected. Um, the intertidal flats, uh, the other coastal resources, um, as Walter mentioned, the kind of the the biggest impact uh, as deep uh, mentioned is uh, the uh, impact to the beach um, it's not as if we have a lot of alternatives because the you know most of the site is beach uh, the existing pool has been on the beach um, you know since the 1960s and and you know we're asking for a moderate increase in, in coverage uh, for that uh, you know to meet the the current demand uh, and uh, and requirements for you know pools of this nature, um, and and again, uh, race was um, instrumental in uh, gathering uh, all the permits, obtaining all the permits for the club uh, a few years ago for this beach nourishment, and it was something that uh, was done uh, under our uh, under our watch a couple years ago. And so, as Walter mentioned, over 7,000 uh, square feet of beach added, uh, and we're asking you know for you know. Some you know, small percentage uh, of, of that, uh, you know, to continue to be used as as pool uh, area, uh, and and the club does uh, the so this uh, the state and and the Army Corps um, uh, 
provided the club a 10-year permit for continued nourishment. So that is something it wasn't, uh, we may have to renew our permits with the town, but it is something that um, the club can continue to do and, and make sure that that resource um, is maintained uh, both as, uh, you know, beach habitat and, and resource as well as, you know, providing the storm protection, which was the original intent of adding all of that sand uh, to provide a, a additional uh, wave uh, mitigation, you know, to the club's facilities. Uh, so you can actually flip through all of this. Right. And so uh, we'll talk about the, the structural design of, of the pool and the patio. Uh, so as uh, Tom mentioned, um, the um, uh, initial part of the project will be um, in installing this uh, sheet pile call for dam that will act uh, as both uh, erosion control, uh, excavation, and dewatering uh, system in, in the beginning, but then remain in place uh, for the long-term protection uh, of, the, of the pool structural shell uh, from erosion and, and flood impacts. Uh, and so you see uh, the sheet pile. Uh, oh, uh, around the perimeter on three sides, uh, essentially where you know uh, erosion is likely to take place uh, and, and the wave uh, and flood impacts. Um, the sheets, uh, so we have bedrock around 25 feet, um, plus or minus. Uh, so the sheets are going to be on that order 25 to 30 feet long in total. Uh, they will be cut off at grade, um, so so the overall length will vary. But I um, in discussions with the uh, the construction manager, he's looking at um, at 25 to 30 foot sheets as far as uh, preliminary pricing. So, so you put like a 25 sheet in the ground, you hit rock at 22 feet, you just cut off the last three feet? Exactly. And how you, you, are you hoe ramming these things down or you're digging? You know? So we have a very good layer of sand um, and then we get a um, five to eight foot layer of peat, um, which is for the most part being excavated out. Um, and, then, and then we get into a cobbly, rocky, gravelly uh, section before we hit rock. So uh, ideally they're uh, vibrated down to the extent that they can be, and then they're usually hammered at the top to really get to the final penetration depth uh, and, and, and so that we know that they're seated in the bedrock. There's uh, no clay down there at all? Uh, no. Okay. Uh, yeah, we've had uh, a number of borings around the site, so it's, it's sand, uh, old layer of peat, and uh, and then again this rocky gravel. How many sheets do you think you have? How long are the sheets? They're going to be. No, no. How wide? Are they eight foot sheets? Eight foot by eight by twenty five. Uh, they're uh, Z shaped uh, right. sheets. So so the um, I think we're right now we're looking at like 12, 12 inch wide. 12 to 18 inch wide, you know, from outer outer to inner. Because I'm just trying to measure the distance going around the whole thing and see how many sheets you're putting in, so how many things you're jamming into the ground. The width, not the depth. The overall length, uh, that, is, that is a number that we could get you for next time, as well as uh, the anticipated kind of driving time, you know, right, for, that's what I'm you know after. for all of that. If you would drive it in these sheets for two weeks, I want the neighbors to know the advantage. <clears throat> it will likely be something along those lines, you know. They might be in Florida, I don't know. <laughs> Um, and then, uh, so again, the, the sheet piles will be left in place. Concrete cap will go uh, across the top of them uh, with uh, uh, bluestone uh, cap is basically what you see, you know, from, from the top looking down. Mm -hmm. so, so you'll never see the, the sheet piles or the concrete cap. It's just the bluestone edging. Um, next slide. Uh, so again, uh, you know, race is going to be responsible for structural design. Um, so we've looked at um, wave scour, you know, from from the base flood uh, impacts, and um, and have designed uh, this appropriately for you know accounting for that scour, accounting for those wave loads, um, uh, and uh, and so you know detailed structural design uh, that will be. Uh, under our purview. Uh, the patio as well, so FEMA requires in the V-Zone that patios be either breakaway, so frangible, uh, like pavered, or designed to remain in place, um, you know, and self-supporting uh, in the event of a flood. It's, it's either one extreme or the other, nothing in between. And so, um, you know, again, a significant investment is going in, into the club, you know, for this. And so we want to do it once and we want to do it right. Um, so we are designing these, uh, the concrete uh, patio to remain uh, in place during the base flood. So we um, 
have you know detailed design. Well, right now everything's preliminary, but preliminary design, um, but it'll be detailed and, and certified at the end of the day by race, you know, to withstand uh, those uh, base flood impacts. So they're not, they're not concrete pavers, you said they're poured in place? It'll be poured in place, uh, yeah, concrete um, slab, Correct. structural slab. Mm -hmm. And I think that's it for me. Um, right, so. Um, the only, it, one, one only question I had, it might have related back to the pool, the, the, the depth of the diving well is going to be NCAA regulation. Eleven foot six for a one meter board. I'm sorry, okay. you have to come to the uh, All right. Uh, yeah, 11, Eleven feet, feet deep. Okay. Yeah. Eleven foot six. Eleven okay. foot six. <laughs> because if you don't, you can't have Yep. That's that's a big thing. I mean you know the business, but that's a big thing in the state that it's gotta be deep enough. We already have like three in town that are not deep enough. Okay. Any questions for this um, expert? You good? Good. Thank you. Thank you. Um you want um, I just want to sum up, if I can. I think um, we're all set. Um, You're going to sum up twice because I want to hear from the neighbors first. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, so I'll just sum up the, That's fine. the list of improvements that we're making. Go right. Um, I don't know if you can all read it, but uh, yep. the pool and patios will comply, including the board, boardwalk, will comply with FEMA design requirements. The existing FEMA non-compliant bathhouse will be reduced by 29%. That reduces risk and damage in a flood event. The existing FEMA non-compliant chlorine tank will be replaced with two flood-resistant tanks adequately anchored to meet FEMA. Ex existing non-compliant pool electric will be housed in a flood-resistant vault and made FEMA compliant. The pool pumps that, and filters will be buried and designed to resist flooding forces. The non-compliant propane tank will be buried and anchored to comply with FEMA. The existing non-compliant large commercial heater will be lifted to elevation 17 to comply with FEMA, or what we really would like <laughs> is to have the three um, uh, residential heaters at grade that are removable and not subject to FEMA. So why, why do we keep talking about this? If you're doing the three heaters, why do we- We want it? Because you have to bless it, <laughs> okay? You have to bless it, and I think you don't want to bless it until we give you a flood preparedness plan, okay? okay? So, and you will have that. Um, so, um, this all new snack bar equipment will be movable and removable, not subject to FEMA. The pergola will be designed to meet FEMA. The bathhouse will be ADA compliant. Our pool backwash will be reduced substantially, well over 50%. Tom said up to 70%. That's huge. And we will have a flood preparedness plan that you guys approve. So we're making a lot of really good improvements to make it environmentally safer, FEMA compliant, and um, uh, let's hear from the neighbors. Okay. You ever have any flooding over there, Jeff? Yeah. What? Any flooding over there? Nothing. No. Okay. Um, Would anybody, anybody in the audience like to speak to this application, please? Okay. Go right ahead. Uh, I'm in Montero, and I live on Eight Butler's Island Road. Sharon, my wife, is there. And we've had uh, good conversations with Chris and the manager of the club. And we've reviewed the plans as much as we can and are comfortable with the plans. But I think Wilder has already mentioned our concerns, which are privacy and noise. So I think that the landscape architect uh, has spoken to, and I guess you just got into this, to our, res our views recently. But we're very concerned to make sure that there is privacy, which we have today and that because of the movement of the pool closer to our line, that the noise is, is abated or is not dramatically enhanced. And the other concern, and so I put uh, an email today which I sent to, to the club, and I sent it to Planning, uh, planning and Zoning. So uh, okay. uh, Fred it was copied, and you have it. Okay. So um, the only other concern that I didn't put in that email, but I just want to share with you, is that when the drilling takes place, we want to make sure our house is still standing. You know, the, 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 the drilling is going to be quite significant. Uh, the noise, of course, is, there's nothing you can do about that, and I hopefully it will not take place over too long a period of time. But I'm just concerned that with this massive, massive drilling, our house is, you know, reasonably close to, to that line, that somehow you guys deal with that. 
Oh. How do we? How do I know if we do blasting? You have to get the the, the um, fire marshal. Fire marshal. I don't, I don't think you would need fire marshal. I don't think so either, because they do the seismic test for the blasting and all that, but they don't do it for the hole ramming, right? This is similar to hole ramming. Okay. We deal with this. We deal this on a regular basis. You do. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, and can you just make sure we're talking about the the privacy and blocking the views. If these bushes start out at 8 feet and they can grow to 25 feet, be cognizant of when you're going to start to lose your views and if you ever want to comment on that. Right. I, I think we'll just have to to work with that. That's I don't think we can make a determination right now. No, we, I think that meeting, I was suggesting working with the landscape architect, now that we've met you, we should talk about that more in more detail. So. Uh, I don't know if there's second floor windows on that side and you don't want the bushes blocking the second floor windows or something like that. That's just something to think about. I think that with uh, in a cooperative spirit, I think it can be worked out. That's fine. Because okay. we don't have to get into it, the better. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I would like to see Please, go right ahead. I would like to be a little more specific. <laughs> this is Mrs. Montero. Sharon Montero. And, and you're um, also eight, up, eight Butler Island. Eight Butler's Island Road. And I wanted to be a little more specific uh, about the landscaping, first of all, that they're going to take care of the fencing. It's going to have to be a movable fence at the end, apparently, because the storms come and you can't really put um, plantings down there. So they have to have sort of movable plantings as well. And then the other thing is that we are members of the club and we enjoy the club, but the club did not do exactly what it was supposed to do the last time. And that is it was supposed to have a, the drive where all the equipment is supposed to come into the property now for the pool was supposed to have a turnaround at the end. It was supposed to be expanded and have a turnaround so the trucks don't have to back in back and back out. And that never happened. Great. So I, I appreciate everything <clears throat> everybody's doing here, but I, I hope that you will protect us. Um, so is that like a delivery out. truck that drops off food down that island, down that alley? All the deliveries are made there. That's what I thought, I remember that. Okay. Thank you. Well, you always get the last call, but mm -hmm. we're, we're keeping um, this thing open, right? I, I, no, let's get it open. Um, we're happy to work with the Monteros to do what they want within reason and within the regulations. I mean, if we can't do it, we won't do it. Was, do you remember there was supposed to be a turnaround at that? I have no recollection of that. Okay. Frankly, that is not something that I remember rings in my, I, I know that we wanted to end beep beep lane by expanding it. And um, I know we talked about that, but uh, it, um, I think there were subsequent amendments that said we couldn't do it because we're thinking that we're going to mess with it. We're going to move the back wall of the bathhouse to widen it. I do recall that. And then we came back and said we can't do it. And that was at a public hearing with an amendment. So um, that was just something, the arc, it, it just, that's my okay. recollection anyway. Okay. That's fine. Yeah. I, you know, it's okay. Sharon, I'm just, uh, you know, we are doing the best we can. We've done the best we can. We have worked hand in glove. We will continue to work with you to try and address your concerns. Yeah. No okay. So Thank we you. can continue this. Uh, Wilder's asked for two weeks. It would be the continuation of this hearing would be to Tuesday, July 26th, 7.30 p.m. to Tuesday night. It'll Is be that a long agenda? Yes. <laughs> can you go? Can, can we talk to you in September? Uh, can we? Yeah, we could kick it over. Let me just check. Because, I mean, you, you want the building permit in 2023. You can't be in a rush. Right? Do you mind? September works better for us. Yeah. I mean, we are really good. I mean, if you think tonight's long. Yeah. <laughs> Stuff in there, no problem. Adam wants to be here for this one, so if we can move it, oh, no, no, no. that'll be great. Yeah. Yep. 
let's kick it over to early September. But you got to promise me you'll make a, a fast decision on it, please. Yeah, but, but you want a two-year permit anyway. I do want it. Well, th that, that's easy. That changes the date in, a, in an approval. <laughs> anyway. That's the rush. So, uh, no, let's, let's keep it. Um, let, we'll go to September early if we can. September sucks. And we'd appreciate it if sixth. we can get a quick, quick Tuesday decision. Tuesday, September 6th. Mm -hmm. Tuesday, September 6th. September 6th that, that works. That would be 7.30 p.m. in this room. Tuesday, September 6th. Yes. Okay. 9, 6, 7.30. Do you want to do it the 13th? No, no, I'm just saying I, I it's the day after a holiday and using previous history. Well, you know, all we're going to do, all we're going to do is submit a two preparedness plans in advance and then uh, try and address some of the concerns. We'll have some opportunity. Hours of operation, length of... No, I got hours of operation, length of the sheet pile, and length of the, the pile driving. Okay. Timely. Okay. Timely. Do, you, do you see us needing to be here the sixth? No. I would hope that I would hope that, that was unnecessary. Yeah. No, we, we, we know what we're dealing with. Yeah. Great. And thank you for indulging us. You're welcome. It's about eleven o'clock. Yeah. All right, what do you want to do? Um, deliberations only on the following public hearings close on July twelfth. what's the first one? We do anything with that? No, I think uh, on the okay. deliberations, I have no issue if commission members just want to call the office with about six Pratt and the scout cabin and 237 Long Neck. Give us a call in the next day or two. Okay. That would be fine. Okay. All right, then. Oh, you're just looking for input as to how to write it up. Yeah, how to write it up. Uh, what we'll try to do is write up one or two for next week. Okay, let's go to the next one. Coastal Sipe at um, Long Neck Point, that one. That was the seawall? Yes, the seawall and the dock. Anybody have any questions on that one? No. No, the seawall. We'll draft that up for next week. As an approval for the seawall. Yep. Okay, request for extension to complete land for 30 Edgerton. Which yep. one's 30 Edgerton? Is that is the regrading of the former senior center. Yeah. Uh, uh, and you said it was public works running a little behind. That's right. Um, everyone's okay with that? Yeah. One, no two, problem. three, four. Yep. Uh, great. Five to zero for the extension. The only thing I want to just, there's really no chairman's report. The only thing I want to make sure that we talk about is in. Um, the 26th is the public hearing for the affordable housing plan. Our affordable housing plan was filed in draft on June 16th. It's on the website. Um, and we talked about this once before that it was supposedly due with the state on um, June 1st. We elected to have a public hearing, which a lot of other towns did not, and our public hearings have been 26th. So that's an important one. That's going to be in the auditorium. Affordable housing plan that that is the 26th that'll be in this room. Oh, really? Next okay. week is the auditorium. Next week's the auditorium. Okay. Um, anything special on, on next week? Next week is Great Island. Uh, the re uh, permit to for the town to use the stable. And next week we're going to invite Mr. Nelson back to present day leader changes to the previously approved plan. Okay. That's fine. And next week, I'll give you a chairman's report relative to federal. There's only one kid in that, in that whole building. Sorry, kid. There's only one, right? Well, one one kid. One. <laughs> to the chairman. Um, yeah, at the leasing reports. Yeah. Yeah. You can only get one department rent? Gosh, 23 apartments <laughs> rent, and there's one new child to the school system. No capacity for one more tonight? Oh, was he, it's I'm a sorry. five minute thing. Day, day leader, 32, 32 Plymouth. Plymouth. Oh, is that on here? Yeah. yeah. No. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to skip you. I totally understand. It's getting late. Uh, I oh. think I can do it really quickly. But Amendment, I'm, so, I'm, I'm 100% sorry. sorry. Amendment to Coastal Site Pen Review Numbers 366, Flood Down Bridge Application Number 169A. Did page 2, General Meeting Time Permitting. First item under General Meeting. Okay. Oh. I'm, so, I'm sorry. Oh, I completely understand. Um, want to try to get through it or not? It's five minutes. Five minutes. Go ahead. That's fine. Go ahead. All right. Go I get, I'll do I get, we get to put some stuff together. Yeah, <laughs> See, we used to do it. 32 points. I guess we'll leave it. Wow. Yeah. Oh, he's got an envelope. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody's ringing out. <laughs> Go ahead, Tom. All right. You got Tom Nelson, professional engineer with McCord Engineering. 
the property is at 32 Plymouth Road. Uh, this is not on the coastline, but it is in the flood zone. It is an interior lot there off of Plymouth Road. Um, this was the original application that was approved back in November of last year. Uh, the components uh, are the same, the design is a little bit different. There was a pool house, there was a pool, there was a large elevated terrace. Um, there was a lot of retaining wall work associated with that design. Uh, the budget numbers came back, the prices of retaining walls are very high, so there was some reconsiderations for that original design. Um, the proposed uh, modifications um, are a slightly smaller pool house, but in the same general location, a slightly smaller pool rotated 90 degrees. Um, we converted some of the patio to a deck uh, over in this location, and in, there's still some terracing uh, uh, designed with the uh, retaining walls, uh, but the majority of it is going to be accomplished with filling around the pool. Um, is that a wooden deck? Yes, that'll be a wooden deck here, and then connecting to a, uh, a hard to you know a patio hardscape around the pool and, and the terrace around the new pool house. Um, the original drainage design was actually uh, a pretty intricate uh, rain garden that was sort of built in to the. Uh, retaining wall terraces. We've now converted this to a much more traditional underground detention system. The fill allows us to get ourselves elevated above, uh, above groundwater table and the poor soil conditions on the site. Um, the net was, you know, slightly smaller uh, amount of impervious, uh, actually fairly significant reduction in the amount of fill because we're not lifting this as high as we originally were. Um, so you're bringing in less fill? We're bringing in less fill. The original design actually had this terrace coming all the way up to um, elevation uh, 14 and a half. Yeah, I remember. Now, now we're splitting, so we're only at, you know, we're at that elevation right here outside the pool house. Being in the flood zone, that pool house, the first floor elevation is at 15.4, uh, uh, but the rest of this pool is going to be down at 11.5, so, so we've lowered that significantly, so there is less fill coming in. Um, You're allowed to build a pool in the flood zone, right? Yeah, it will be constructed, yes, for, uh, to, meet, to meet flood zone requirements. Um, it's been approved by DPW. Uh, we do believe it's been designed to meet flood zone requirements, both the building and the pool. Um, the pool equipment is actually inside the pool house. It's in this ancillary building, and it will all be on that first floor level. The entire basement level is really just flood zone. Um, the only thing they can really use that for is storage. Um, and we have been to EPC already. There's wetlands along this northern property line. EPC uh, Commission has closed their hearing and um, you know drafting their resolution. So that's the. Is that okay? EPC. Yeah, this is a much, in in my belief, much better plan. You, it, the pool house, you may recall, was rather large. It was very well big. over a thousand square feet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and it was high too. And it was high, and there were big retaining walls. So this takes kind of spreads out so there's more grading throughout the property. There's more uh, grass. It's grass now. It's lawn yeah, it'll be yeah, a much softer field. Lawn. The whole yeah. backyard is long. So EPC uh, did a thorough review of this. They're about to approve it or have approved it, I think. Yeah, I know the commission was closed the hearing, but they I don't closed think the I've hearing seen and an actual sent a memo, I believe. Yeah. So I, I have no issue if you want us to draft up something for Next week at the week. General meeting, I was just going to vote. Yeah, or you can just approve right, the modification. Yeah. Looking for a motion to approve the modifications. Jeff makes a motion. Look for a second. Adam makes a second. All in favor? Yeah. Great. Thank you very Good much. Business. Thank you. Good luck. So how the daily response? Anyone else? Anyone else? Anyone else? <laughs> Anyone else? <laughs> um, Two thirds. With that said, we had a Sure. <laughs> um, and looking for a motion to adjourn. Adam makes a motion. Look oh, for a second. second. George makes a second. All in favor? Yeah. Welcome, Amy. Uh, Breaks you, but we not. Been journalistic ethics. Thank you. Um, got a couple of uh, questions here in the room. I'm going to give uh, Dave McCollum. When I listen to uh, reports or polls of who gets their news from where, um, it seems to me that the 
under 40 crowd overwhelmingly gets their news from social media, whatever that means. And that the people in this room and on the call are, you know, maybe the last vestige of the newspaper readers. Uh, how, how, does, uh, how does a Connecticut mirror uh, deal with that? About 15% of our traffic does in fact come to us through social media. Um, when people, so when, in those polls, when they ask the question, where do you get your news from? And people respond, social media, that's not really a response that's valuable because there's still a brand that underlies what people find on social media, right? There's still a brand, there's still a content creator, there's still a news organization whose story is posted on social media. So social media is simply the distribution vehicle for the content that's created by the New York Times or um, you know the San Francisco Chronicle or ProPublica or the Connecticut Mirror. So those, those questions are worded in such a way as to kind of be not helpful in understanding what the real source of the news is. The question is really, what's your distribution vehicle? What would be a more interesting question, I think, for them to ask is, what newspaper brands or what news brands are you, content creator brands are you reading? Now, no one would really understand what that means, but that's essentially what the issue is. So in terms of us and how we deal with that, and we kind of recognize, you know, we're, we're, like, the, we're like the public broadcasting slash opera kind of businesses where people don't really tune into us, into public policy sorts of things um, until they're a certain age, you know, 40, 45, 50, whatever. Um, having said that, so I mentioned the podcast. So we're trying, a podca podcasts are ways of reaching younger people. Um, so we're, we're trying that. We just hired a young columnist, first columnist we've ever had. Um, who is 29 years old and is our attempt to reach, to, to offer a younger voice. Um, besides, so those are a couple of things we're doing besides waiting for people to turn 40 and 45 and then begin to tune, to, to tune in. We do, the other thing we are doing, and these are all small things and we're just, you know, we're very much in a, you know, try things and see what works and what doesn't work kind of mode. Um, we have partnerships now with Trinity College in Hartford, with UConn, and we're in talks with Yale and Sacred Heart about engaging students. So having students write opinion pieces as class assignments in a public policy class or government class. So in small ways, we're also trying to engage students themselves in, in, our, in our work, but that's a very labor intensive pick and shovel kind of approach, but uh, we'll see what we can learn from that. We have a question over here, John. Hi, are, are schools of journalism on the decline as well in, in colleges and universities? You know, it's, it's not that they're on the decline, but that my sense is that fewer graduates of those programs are actually going into or staying in journalism. Um, you know, the skills you learn in journalism can be applied in lots of other arenas, I think, you know, law, financial analysts, um, and, you know, a lot of different things. Many people, so the, the graduate schools have you know, they have, some of them have communications departments as well as journalism departments. And so people, and there's kind of some flux between the two. And so people will get their journalism degree, but then we'll go into marketing, packaged goods, marketing or advertising or communications, public relations. Um, so no, I think the enrollments at the journalism schools seem fairly stable, but it's a question of what happens afterwards. And journalism, let's face it, I mean, journalism is notorious as Kyle and I were talking on the way down. I mean, we have people who work crazy hours, they're passionate about what they do, and they're super smart, and they're significantly underpaid 
for the work they do relative to what they can make by applying those skills and attitudes anywhere else. I'll just add a comment uh, because I'm pretty familiar with the Northwestern and the Medill uh, uh, School of Journalism and uh, uh, also Columbia School of Journalism. If you look at the, uh, the course curriculum in the course catalogs, those have shifted. I mean, uh, uh, way back when it was just strictly traditional journalism jobs, neither broadcast or print. Now it uh, tends to lap over into uh, social media, but also uh, certain advocacy, social media, and representing uh, corporate uh, corporations in terms of uh, advocacy. So uh, it, it, it's a sign to me that the journalism schools, in order to attract students, are having to broaden their definition of what uh, journalism skills are. Uh, do we have any other questions in the room? Here's one other. Uh, thank you, Bruce. Um, my wife and I have been a longtime reader of the uh, Connecticut Bear, including this morning. And uh, just want to add that when, uh, and I like your slide about the long form journalism, Hartford does not make it easy to understand what's going on. And when you read Keith Fanoff on the budget or one of the others on a particular piece of legislation, uh, it's really insightful and that that makes an impact and maybe just comment on those those deep dive reporters and uh you know what they do all day long i'm trying to get to the bottom of that gary <laughs> um no what they do all day by the way gary's daughter and son-in-law and grandchildren live on my street in west hartford by uh by coincidence, that's right. Um, the the amount of research and reading and reviewing of documents and data and calling people to cover all sides of the story and to verify or what one person has said or get a, another opinion or perspective on, on a particular story. Um, that's what they do all day. And it's a crazy amount of time that it takes to do that well. Um, you know, for those of us who are in businesses that are more about kind of throughput and processes are well established, it's hard to, it's hard to, manage, which is why I made kind of the flip comment, I guess, at the beginning of my answer. Um, but they are, um, and it's all intellectual work. And so, and some collaboration with other, other reporters and editors. Um, but, you know, intellectual, all intellectual work is exhausting. Um, so, I, you know, they, to a person are, are just um, meticulous, have exceptionally high standards. Our editor now, so we have a new editor who uh, we brought on board shortly after I, I came on board, um, who's an excellent writer. So we used to be, you know, we were always very good at kind of ferreting out the story, like a nose for a story. But with, with one or two exceptions, our writing wasn't great. And so we brought in an editor who's a writer, who's a craftswoman in terms of writing. Um, and so now there's a fair amount of time going back and forth in terms of, in terms of improving the writing. Um, you know, I guess it's like any, any business, you don't, you kind of don't want to see how the sausage is made. Um, but in this particular case, it is kind of, it's fascinating. And we do, so kind of to your point, Kyle started a periodic newsletter called Inside the Newsroom, which is meant to shed light on exactly that question. Like when there's a really interesting story um, or an interesting story behind the story, we occasionally write about that to help people appreciate what does go into, into the reporting. But thank you for acknowledging that, Gary. And um, thank you. Thanks. Well, we're coming up to our 12 noon uh, close. Uh, I think we ought to give uh, Bruce a round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you.
And don't forget to pay your dues. <laughs> President and CEO of Connecticut Public Broadcasting in Harvard, uh, Harvard, Hartford, uh, Mark Contreras. And he's going to talk about the growing role of public media in serving local communities. Uh, Mark, uh, well, Connecticut Public Broadcasting is Connecticut's only statewide uh, public media service. It's the parent company of PBS television stations, NPR uh, radio stations, and digital platforms as well. Mark has a long, distinguished career in the media business. Uh, recently, he was the uh, dean of the School of Communications at Quinnipiac University. And before that, uh, he, he was working uh, with media properties owned by Pulitzer, Scripps, and the Calkin families. He has an uh, ABA uh, in history from the University of Chicago, an MBA from Harvard Business School, and he lives with his wife, Mary Beth, in Hartford. So please join me in giving Mark a warm welcome. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Hollister, very, very much. I wanted to thank um, Hollister and Catherine Ladnier for making um, this discussion today possible. Um, we have lots of, um, let's see if I can, is that better? We have lots of um, very devoted uh, supporters all throughout the state, and Catherine and Mickey, uh, we uh, are fortunate to call friends and very much appreciate the invite today. Um, how many of you in this room grew up uh, reading newspapers? Okay, good. I'm with, I'm with my people. I did too. And uh, the reason I asked that question is I spent the last 30 years of my life uh, working, uh, running properties for the Pulitzer family, the Scripps family, and Calkins Media, all of which got their roots in newspapers, but at the, at the underpinning of why they existed, it was to serve local communities. It was to tell local journalism stories. And I think all of you know what's happened to local journalism in the last several years. Let me... Um, let me start with this. This is a slide that almost makes me cry every time I see it. It's the number of people employed by newspaper newsrooms in the US since about 2004. And honestly, it has everything to do with the economics of the business, nothing to do with the lack of interest of their customers or on the part of the journalists who did that work. Um, Unfortunately, this tracks from 1960 uh, public trust in government. And while it's not a one-to-one -one correlation, you can see that, that it's not trending back upwards. And I, I think the previous slide is a big contributor to that. Um, what's happened in the last 10 years or so is public radio and public television, and this looks at blue is radio, yellow is television. The number of reporters in public media newsrooms over the last decade or so, and you can see that it's growing, and, um, and that includes Connecticut Public. We're the 29th biggest state, I think we're the 26th on that chart, and our plans include growing the number of local journalists uh, over time, but particularly in Fairfield County. Um, some other things have changed. How many of you in your home have an Alexa or a Google Home that you say play XYZ, right? So, and by the way, I'm, I'm glad a couple people mentioned this. If you say, uh, Alexa, play Connecticut Public, you'll go right to us. Alexa won't be confused. But, but most households now in a month or in a week listen um, 
to some form of media um, online. Um, in the United States, uh, there's about 91 million households out of 260 roughly that have one of these devices and listen to audio online. This one is probably the most um, serious of all the slides. Most of you for several decades uh, subscribe to Infinity or Spectrum or some variety of cable into your house. Um, in 2021, 44% of U.S. households did not have cable, and that disrupts the television business pretty substantially. This is just another look by age, and again, I don't think any of this will surprise any of us, but the red are, um, uh, at the very top, are the young folks. 77% of them stream their television content. At the very bottom, baby boomers 55 plus, which I am one of, 40% uh, stream. And my guess is this Christmas, as you open up your gifts, you're gonna have more and more ways to stream content as time goes on. So those are trends that um, are happening um, in, in media, but in particular, Fairfield County. So we did some research about Fairfield County and what people wanted in terms of content and what they didn't want. And so these colors on the left are those people who are our members and on the right are non-members. Non but you can see common colors. For example, science and, and the future show up in both. Arts and culture show up in both. Um, uh, local investigative reporting shows up in both, etc. Um, we also looked at how people consume our content, and this is a bit of an eye chart, but you can see most people are consuming us through a variety of electronic means that 10, 15 years ago really weren't a relevant part. But we know that um, we need to be on those platforms and we've made investments to do that. And lastly, um, we, had, uh, we have a board who is filled with very dedicated people. Um, roughly 60% from the Hartford area. And I've been at Connecticut Public for about three years, and when I first got there, I said, well, why, why aren't we covering the whole state, not just Hartford and, and New Haven? And I think the common assumption was, ah, those people just care about New York City. So what we did was research to really probe at that question. And what we found was, when we asked people, where do you consider your home to be? Number one on the list was Connecticut. Number two was your city or township. Number three was Fairfield County, New England, <clears throat> the tri-state area, and dead last was New York City. So people do, we interpreted this to mean people really do care about local and about where they live. So what are we gonna do to try to better serve the residents of Fairfield County in the next upcoming years? And I think if we can play this lens, this will tell the story pretty eloquently. Fairfield County is a place of unique natural beauty with a long history and rich cultural diversity. From Greenwich to Bridgeport and beyond, this is a nerve center of creativity, culture, commerce, and community. With a concentration of innovation and expertise that helps build our nation and reaches throughout the world, we are the gateway to New England while supplying human energy and ideas that fuel an international metropolis. Fairfield County is home to nearly one million people all with important stories that deserve to be told and fascinating voices that deserve to be amplified. But local news has been in decline and coverage of vital local issues is lacking. Together with your support, we can ensure that more is done to fill the gaps in regional journalism. Connecticut Public is establishing a local news bureau and putting reporters on the ground in Fairfield County to cover local businesses, government, educational institutions, and more. 
Strong local journalism results in a more accountable government, a healthier environment, a more fair and equitable economy, an improved quality of life for you and your neighbors. We're also expanding our radio signal in the Fairfield area, and we're evolving our digital platforms to make our content available anytime, anywhere. As Connecticut's statewide public media organization, Connecticut Public is proud to serve the residents of Fairfield County with original local productions to deliver the best of PBS and NPR journalism and storytelling and to make excellent PBS Kids educational programming available to every family in our state, on TV, over the air, online, and on mobile 24-7. When you help Connecticut Public achieve our mission, you are making a real difference. Your neighbors in Fairfield County will become better informed